This is Audible. Third Kiss, Goddess Isles, Book Three, written by Pepper Winners, narrated by Sarah Puckett and Scott Ryder. Sullivan, Prologue. My life had been a series of calculated, risk-tabulated endeavors. My brother had taught me that. From my first memory, I'd known spontaneity would get me killed. Laugh, and I might get punched. Speak, and I might get kicked. Drop my guard and forget I would almost certainly be punished. That lesson grew with me through childhood, growing from self-preservation into utmost law. It didn't just ingrain itself on my psyche. It grabbed a brand, stuck it in a fire, and seared into my every cell. I didn't do reckless. I didn't do impulsive. Every step in my life had been premeditated, planned, and controlled. Until one night, when I'd had a dream about a place called Euphoria, where a mortal man could fuck any female he wanted. Sky, sea, fiction, or fact. Any illusion, any fantasy. A place where rules bowed to your desires, gravity kneeled to your wishes, and life was no longer full of monsters, but magic. And in that dream, I shared this new Zion with a girl, a girl with long hair the color of rich coffee, a girl with leggy length, strong soul, and magnificent quicksilver eyes, a girl who begged me to touch her, lick her, worship her. And for the first time since I was born, I did something spontaneous, impetuous, and oh, so fucking dangerous. I took her. I let myself sink into the dream. I fell for a figment of my imagination and fucked a goddess I would never be able to find. When I woke up, I mourned the loss of such a dream. I spent a week wishing I could return to such a place. To find such a creature, to be happy. But such a place didn't exist. Such a girl didn't exist. And that denial of everything that I wanted became a driving force to twist the impossible. Thanks to the scientific gifts I learned through methodical education and instinctual evolution, I created an elixir. I conjured euphoria. I brought forth a new dimension, all thanks to a dream. But no matter how skilled I was at pulling myth from reality, I couldn't fabricate the dream girl who'd stolen my heart, the goddess I wanted more than anything, the girl who would forever condemn me to loneliness because no one would ever compare. Euphoria was real, but I wanted nothing to do with it because I wouldn't settle for a fucking lie. I wouldn't code a fantasy or change the face of another to indulge in because if I did. If I allowed myself the illusion that she was real, I'd turn my back on reality to stay with her. I'd turn my back on all the souls I'd helped save, all the souls that relied on me, all the souls that came before me, and my goddamn loneliness. So I allowed others to play in my elixir explicit playground. I clung to the lessons my brother taught me. I stayed iron-fisted, guarded, and restrained, until the night. I dreamed of her again, a silver-eyed enchantress who haunted me, and I typed an email sending out a half-conscious, sleep-hazed request: "Find me a girl with long dark hair, alabaster skin, and silver gaze." I forgot about such a request until I earned a reply several months later. We found her, five hundred thousand dollars, and she's yours. And I did the second most impulsive thing of my life. I bought her. I welcomed her. I wanted her. The minute she stepped foot on my paradise, I knew I'd fucked up. I hadn't believed such a creature existed. I stupidly thought no human girl could compare. But Eleanor Grace was the one who was incomparable. Instead of ethereal silver eyes, her gray ones were equally bewitching. Instead of glowing skin and a faint halo in my dream, her honesty and spirit were what drugged me. I'd gambled with fate and lost. 
I'd asked for something I could never survive, and she'd been delivered straight from my fantasies and directly into my nightmares. Thanks to her, spontaneity became a disease I couldn't escape. Rash choices, hasty conclusions, careless decisions. Each one was her fault. Each one broke me a little more. Each one destroyed my sanity. But then she went and committed the worst thing of all. She fed me elixir. She shattered my premeditation. She annihilated my careful control. She made me fucking wild. And then... She ran. A girl I'd dreamed about, thought about, kept on a pedestal inside my mind for years, drove me into the dirt where beasts belonged. And then she fucking ran. So, I gave up trying to control myself. I welcomed the pain of chaos. I chased. Eleanor. Chapter One. My bare feet sunk into soft sand as I bolted from Sully's office. My dress flared out around my legs, fawn glitter and champagne gems all winking in the sunlight. The heavy material made me trip as I careened around a corner and ran as fast as I could. Grabbing handfuls of the train, I threw myself into a gallop. Most of me didn't want to run. This wasn't my plan. I'd fed Sully his elixir, purely to force him into admitting that what we felt toward each other wasn't normal. This sparkling chemistry, this heart-haunting bond. I had to believe that it was something worth fighting for, despite our diabolical beginning. I had to trust that I hadn't lost my mind by falling for a man who traded cash for my life. There's more to him than that. I know there is. My breath came in erratic spurts. My legs slowed. I don't want to run. I'd only done so because of the way he'd begged me, at the absolute carnage on his face, the undeniable terror that he felt. But I stopped on the path, turning around to face the way I'd come. My footprints had scattered sand onto the purple orchids bordering the lane. My dress suffocated my straining ribcage with its beaded jewels and organza. If I ran, then all of this would be for nothing. Sully would ride through the elixir like I had that first day. He'd use himself until he could think straight. Or he'll use another. And then, when he was back to being more man than monster, he'd restart negotiations with Rory Slater to sell me. No. I let go of my dress. It puddled around my feet, blending into the sand so it looked as if I'd morphed from the beach itself and been given breath thanks to the thousands of jewels embedding me. I have to go back. Goosebumps ran over my spine as a snarl sounded, a snarl echoing with pure lust. I shivered. I'd been Elixir's prisoner three times now. I'd become familiar with the insidious takeover, the rush of lust followed by the stupid belief that you could control the effects, the pain when you accepted you couldn't, the need when you broke with that first release, the shame at your horny inhibitions, the sickness at your traitorous body, until finally, the perfect peace when you let go, when you said yes instead of no, when your body joined with another's and found everything that had been looking for. He's in pain. I shook my head. A frangipani flower fell from the strands and floated to the ground. He's in pain because of me. He'd done this to me. Therefore, he deserved it. He was about to sell me. Therefore, I had every right. He'd told me to run to keep me safe. Therefore, I... I have to go back. He'd told me to run for my benefit, not his. I'd offered myself. He'd refused. He'd proven something fundamental in that moment. He cares. He cared if he hurt me. He'd care if he killed me. He cared too much. That's why he was going to sell me. That thought was brighter than lightning. Was that true? Could he feel the depths that I did? Could he be battling everything I was? 
If that was true, then running would destroy our single chance at honesty. This was my only opportunity to make Sully see, to make both of us admit that we couldn't keep doing this. Whatever we were, whatever we felt, it ends today. And maybe, just maybe if we survived each other, it could be a beginning and not the ending he'd chosen. We could talk, we could just be. Bracing myself, I gathered up my dress and stepped back the way I'd come. I wouldn't back down from this. I would suffer the consequences and the climaxes. I wouldn't punish him in the way he'd punished me. I'd give him what he needed. I'll give him me. Jinx. A dark, deadly growl. A snap of a snarl. My head swooped up. My eyes caught his as he slammed to a stop, blocking the path. His suit hung in tatters. His blazer had been thrown off behind him. His shirt hung open, torn buttons hanging off broken threads. His belt hung haphazardly from belt loops. His fly unzipped, and feet bare from his normal, pristine shoes. For the first time since I'd arrived, Sully Sinclair glistened with sweat. His cold-blooded persona had succumbed to the island heat, dousing his skin in moisture. My heart threw itself into torment, racing and smoking, growing its own pair of legs and begging to run. I massaged my chest where it kicked and coughed, doing my best to stay calm. I'd done this. I'd applied makeup and dressed in a gown and stared at my reflection, knowing I was sacrificing myself to a ruthless, rabid beast. Yet committing to an idea and then coming face to face with the ramifications were very different things. Sully took a step toward me, a single step, slowly, ever so slowly, as if still fighting the vapid, manic urges. Get to your villa. Lock your fucking door. I licked my lips at the brokenness of him, the filthy greed and feverish longing. You came after me. He shook his head, squeezing his eyes closed as another wave of lust buckled his body. When he opened his gaze again, the blue glowed otherworldly, sickly, dementedly. No, I'm... He groaned. I'm trying to get to my villa before. His fists clenched. I can't be close to... He raised his gaze, snarling. Go! What the fuck are you waiting for? I told you to run, so run. I'm done running. I spread my hands. I was coming back. For you. He buckled over, wedging one hand into his belly and another on his cock. Fuck you and your broken self-preservation. With a growl, he stood up straight. His hand never left his cock, though, throttling it with white knuckles. This is my last warning. I fought as long as I can. I'm seconds away from giving in, and you're still goddamn here. He stumbled as he pumped himself, coaxing a release, knowing he couldn't stop it, so choosing to chase it instead. Run away, Eleanor. Get as far away from me as you can, because... He groaned again, low and hungry as his belly clenched. If you don't, I will tear you limb from motherfucking limb. I will crawl inside your body. I will fuck you until you scream. Elixir must live in his voice because my body liquefied instead of froze. I wore no underwear beneath my gown. I knew better than to place obstruction between us. So I felt the unquenchable desire squeezing my core, releasing a bead of need, wetness slipping down my inner thigh. I tried to speak, to tell him I was strong enough. But air had turned thin and useless. Sully took another step toward me, his face blacker than midnight. Why won't you run? Are you that stupid to think you want me? Do you think you want this? He jerked his cock, wincing in pain. You think I'll be gentle? That I won't fucking bite you, throttle you, bruise you, and then come all over your goddamn face? He tripped sideways, groaning like a dying bear. Stand there another second, Jinx, and my fingers will be so far in your cunt, you'll gag on them. You'll be on your goddamn knees while I use every hole you have. You'll beg me to stop, and I'll just keep going. His hips thrust into his hand, reaching a pinnacle. 
His jaw clenched and his skin lost its island glow, etching with sickly white. One last chance. One last fucking chance. His teeth bared with every violence he drowned under. Stay, and I won't be responsible for what I do. I gave you a warning. I told you to run. I'm crippling beneath urges to do such bad, bad things to you. His head tipped down, shadowing his eyes with brows tugged low and vicious. Please don't make me hurt you, because I will. I'll find pleasure while you'll only find pain. I promise if you don't fucking run, I'm giving up. His nostrils flared. Right here. I will fuck you right here, and I don't fucking care who sees. His lust had stripped him of humanity, revealing the true animal inside. He wasn't a gentle creature beneath those immaculate suits. He wasn't sweet and endearing like the parrot he adored. He was one word. Honest. Viciously, hellishly honest. And it made me wet, made me breathless, made me want. Sully, I... I raised my hand as to save him, to drag him from the darkness and be his savior. But my silly little ego that convinced me I could control this situation shattered the second Sully moved. Shudder slammed over his eyes. A mask slipped over his face, a disguise made up of poisonous passion. He ripped off his shirt and threw it to the sand. His belt hissed through the loops and joined it. And then Sully cricked his neck, crouched into a pounce and smiled. Fuck, I'm going to enjoy this. My heart leapt into my throat, filling with prey drive, drowning my system in vulnerability and fear. Turned out, decision and irrational choices held no sway when raw instinct kicked in. An instinct said I was in danger. Terrible, terrible danger. Sully exploded from his panther crouch, running toward me as hungrily and as mercilessly as any predator. And my body hijacked my mind. My hands snatched my dress, my body fainted to the side, and I ran. Oh my god, I ran. I didn't know I could be so swift, leaving my hair like a flag fluttering behind me. Sully laughed. He laughed. And I ran harder. Chills shot over my body, my stomach fisted with true terror. The pounding of his feet behind me made me embrace my inner gazelle, and I bolted. I couldn't look behind me, couldn't bear to see a man who'd reached the end of his limit chasing me. Not chasing me for fun or flirty play, but chasing me with only one purpose. A purpose that would ensure I would never be the same. He was a man who I drugged and deleted everything inside him apart from the need to fornicate. It wasn't Sully chasing me. It was a monster. I ran and ran, but I wasn't fast enough. The heavy thuds of his long strides grew closer, closer. The jittery panic of trying to flee but knowing I'd already lost swamped me. The sand was too thick, the air too humid, my dress too tight. No, no. Violent arms wrapped around me, jerking me to a stop. His teeth were on my throat a second later, sinking deep, his tongue licking my sweat, my horror, I wriggled and squirmed as he dragged me against his heaving body. He felt taller, stronger, bigger, a man in his sexual prime. His hands fisted my breasts, one on each swell, pinching my nipples and kneading the weight with savage fingers. His mouth never unglued from my throat, his breath scalding my skin from his nostrils, his hips rocking, always rocking, undulating us together. With a snarl, he swept one hand to my throat and the other dove between my legs. The dress refused his possessive grab, the material straining tight. Grunting something I couldn't understand, he grabbed my chin, snaking his fingers to cut my cheeks, and jerking my head to the side. The second he had me prisoner, his mouth smashed onto mine. He kissed me, all while holding me from behind. His tongue plunged into my mouth, diving deep, making my legs buckle. Stars burst behind my eyes as he sucked on my tongue. Firecrackers exploded as he forced my mouth open wider and kissed me until I drowned. I'd never been kissed like this. Kissed as if we had only one purpose on this planet. No rules, no shame, just heat. 
and the undeniable need to fuck. He held nothing back this time. He poured everything he was down my throat, making me gag on his hunger. Even when he'd yanked me from the bath and kissed me before giving me to a guest, even when he'd kissed me on Saragala, he hadn't allowed me to feel this, to feel what he did, to witness how dark his desires had burrowed. This kiss had no boundaries or confines. This kiss was just teeth and tongue and spit. I moaned as his hand on my chin kept me completely at his mercy, kissing me stupid, dragging forth a stampede of creatures. Not just butterflies, not just fireflies or moths with their papery, tickly wings. Sully made my body become an ark, a broken, shipwrecked ark, rapidly filling with teeth and fang, claw and venom, twisting and clenching with so many different beasts. My stomach was a riot with hoofed and horned prey, my heart torn to pieces by carnivores. A loud rip tore through the heavy humidity. The tightness of my dress fell away as Sully clawed at the expensive gown, inserting his hand into the split he'd made, grabbing my pussy with trembling, greedy fingers. He grunted as he found how wet I was, how my thighs were coated in lust for him, how this entire chase and hunt and conquest had made me naturally starving for him. I didn't need elixir. I didn't need safety or Scott or sanity. I needed him. His unshackled desire allowed me to be honest, too. I'd never felt this way about anyone, ever. Misplaced? Definitely. Moronic, undoubtedly utterly inescapable. Two fingers speared inside me. Oh, fuck. I cried out into his kiss, consumed by his touch around me, within me, upon me. My voice triggered something in him, and he thrust his touch deeper into me. His kiss turned feral, and he hauled me from the sand, so I hung completely at his mercy, in his control. He held my weight with one arm around my waist, while his other hand remained buried between my thighs. An orgasm bubbled in my blood, already gathering pressure to pop. He marched us forward, tripping and stumbling, his tongue lashing mine with every step, his thumb digging into my clit. Shade fell over us, the sun blocked by the palm tree he pressed me into. The rough bark scraped my chest, making the gemstones of my gown dig deeper into my flesh. He let me go, dropping me to the sand and ending our nefarious kiss. With a fist planted between my shoulder blades, he kept me prone against the palm tree. Ants crawled over the bark, investigating my sudden intrusion. The fronds above bristled and whispered in the muggy breeze. And I quaked with understanding that this was where Sully would take me for the first time. He'd reached his limit. We had no walls for privacy, no bed for protection, not even a fantasy granted by euphoria. All we had was uncontrollable desire and the open island around us. The rustle of clothing sounded as he shoved his trousers and boxer briefs off. I dared to look over my shoulder, drinking in the majestic sweeps of his chiseled chest, the flexing muscles of his arms, the impressive erection between hardened thighs. He truly was dazzling. A spectacular Viking who'd not only stolen my life, but my heart and soul, too. He noticed me staring, standing unhinged in his nakedness. Our eyes snagged, gray fire to blue fire, and his hand snaked out to grab a fistful of my hair. He shuddered as my strands cascaded over his wrist. I shivered as he pulled tight, activating another wash of instinct of predator and prey. Stepping into me, he pushed my cheek back against the tree. The fact that he didn't talk to me made everything so much more intense. I wasn't a person to him right now. I was merely a vessel to spend his need. With one hand buried in my hair, his free one fell to my pussy again, finding the hole he'd made in my gown, fingering me, spreading my desire. My hips arched, my back burned. He kept me trapped against the palm tree even as he stepped into me until his heat wedged entirely behind me. His nudity burned through the jewels on my dress. I mewled and spread my legs. With a primitive roar, he ripped at the hole he'd made, grunting in triumph as the dress tore and tore. 
It cut into me as he yanked harder, destroying the train, ruining the tightness, making the beautiful gown hang off my hips in tatters. The second he'd ripped enough to expose my naked ass, he kicked my legs further apart, fisted my hair until my eyes watered, and then he mounted. There was no foreplay, no whispered sonnets, no promises of forever, just him and me, and a brutal, primordial thrust. I screamed as his hard length pierced my body, plunging as deep as he could go. He filled me so deep, so quick. Tears spilled in ecstasy. My cheeks bruised and scraped against the palm tree as he drove into me, a single thrust that made us both grunt like animals. I had never been so full, so wanted, so consumed. He withdrew until his tip hovered at my entrance, a shuddery breath away from disengaging. He paused in torture, punishing both of us until a haggard groan spilled from his lips and he drove back inside, over and over, thrust, thrust, thrust. He fucked me against the palm tree until blood oozed on my cheek from the abrasive bark. He absolutely controlled me. I had no way of escape. My only task was to accept his brutal invasion and let him feast. And he did feast. He devoured me. His teeth found the crook of my shoulder and sank deep. His chest echoed with gruff grunts each time he rutted into me. He strained against me, clung to me, bit me, and fucked me, and somehow made me feel like the most powerful woman in the world. His thrusts grew shallow and quick. His teeth clutched harder. His fist pulled my hair. His first release stormed through him with thunderous need. I screamed as his entire body jerked with a spurt of climax. His teeth pierced my skin at the same time, giving me pleasure and pain, a blend of the worst kind of elixir. He lapped at the bloody drawn, then ripped his mouth away to dig his forehead into my nape, riding into me, his hands clamping on my hip bones to drag me back and deep. Fuck, fuck, fuck. He didn't stop thrusting, driving every inch of his cock inside me. While his orgasm tore him to shreds, I suffered my own annihilation. Sully, this, the feel of him inside me, the heat and wetness of his release, the shudder and violence of his desire, the consuming, dominating way he'd taken me. It was familiar. He's familiar. As he twitched with the final dregs of his first release, my mind rewound to the morning after my first time in euphoria, how he'd dragged me into the ocean and explained how euphoria worked, how he'd asked if it felt like I hadn't been fucked, how he'd touched me and murmured. Your mind hid the identity of the man who fucked you, but your body knows the truth. I choked as he pulled out of me, still keeping his fist in my hair. His seed trickled down my leg, a slimy white trail of truth. Sullivan Sinclair had just fucked me, and I don't think it's our first time. My mind raced as he dragged me down the path by my hair, a true caveman with his kill, hauling me back to his home, ready to feast again. Caveman. I turned stiff as he continued carting me down the pathway toward the offshoot that I hadn't explored a shadowy tunnel created by large heliconia bushes and banana plants, swallowed us whole. And still my mind ran. Your body knows the truth. Could it? Could it recognize a sexual partner even when that sexual partner had looked completely different, sounded different, smelled different? Even their eyes had been different. I stifled a cry as I studied him stalking beside me, my hair a leash between us. Naked, his hard cock glistened from being inside me. His erection wouldn't abate for hours, heavy and painful until he could come again. I knew from experience. I knew that taking me against the palm tree was just the beginning. How long before he'd take me again? A minute? Ten? Twenty? When I'd come in euphoria, I'd been primed to go again a moment later. My teeth had ached for it. My body bled for it my heart skipping and malfunctioning to mate. Almost as if I'd transmitted my own sick desire to him, Sully stumbled mid-step. His fist went to his cock as a bulldozer of lust struck him down. 
With his jaw locked, he dragged me into him, his fist still buried in my hair. I sucked in a breath just before his mouth plundered mine. A kiss where he suffocated me, confused me, and made questions shout so, so loudly in my head. Questions I'd asked him that day in the sea. Questions I'd begged answers for, all while my bruised and well-used body tried to tell me the truth. Who did I sleep with last night, Sully? He gritted his teeth. A guest. Which one? You don't need to know. I do. I do need to know. I splashed my fists into the sea. Was it you? Was it you who fucked me? He bared his teeth. You would know if I ever fucked you. I told you you'd never be the same if I did. He'd never answered the question, not with a definitive answer. He hadn't lied. He hadn't admitted. He deflected. And now... His tongue stole my thoughts under a fresh landslide of hunger. My tongue met his in an erotically sinful dance, all while he fell to his knees, dragging me down into the sand with him. We kissed and kissed as his hands landed on the front of my dress and tore. He ripped the beads and jewels until my breasts popped free, and the slash of destruction met the previous tear, a lightning bolt of violence, shredding the gown from me. With a savage snarl, he pushed it from my shoulders, leaving me as naked as him. The moment my skin was bare, he spun me around and planted me on all fours. I didn't have time to dig my fingers into the sand for purchase before he was on me, in me. I screamed as he slid all the way inside. Your body knows the truth. And mine did. The minute he entered me, I knew. Sully had been the caveman. How he'd switched with the guest and been the one to fuck me, I didn't know. But he did. I had to believe that. Had to trust that, because if it wasn't him, if it wasn't the same man who'd given me the most pleasure I'd ever had, the man I'd fallen a little in love with, then how could I feel this way? How could I feel as if I'd been made for this man? How did our bodies fit so well together? How did our pleasure creep and crest at the exact same time? How could my heart welcome him as if he was coming home? As if he belonged to me? I moaned as he gyrated his hips, dragging me back with vicious hands on my hips. I crashed into his lower belly, my ass sticking to his skin, our sweat mingling, his past climax musky and potent between my legs. His belly kissed my ass as he speared as deep as he could go. He folded over me, a heavy blanket of persecution. For a heartbeat, we remained linked like that. Two naked people, sharing breath, life, and passion. And then he began to move. Short, sharp stabs of his cock, shallow and quick, deep and powerful. A male driving into his chosen mate. I gave up trying to hold myself upright, sinking my torso into the sand. Crystal granules stung my bloody cheek. Heat from the island made my skin prickle, and the overwhelming sensitivity caused from being taken twice in as many minutes conjured a rapid orgasm to creep and slither through my blood. I bit my lip as Sully's pace increased. His breathing turned noisy, his fingernails digging into my hips. Fuck. His entire vocabulary had been reduced to that single word. I understood because I'd been there. While flying on the elixir high, I'd given up conversation for more basic forms of communication. I'd only remembered I could speak when the effects finally began to wane. His thrust scooted me through the sand, coating my hair and smearing my chest until I wore a new type of dress. A dress made up of the very thing his empire was founded on. My release changed from teasing to tormenting, and my hands slipped between my legs. I moaned loudly as I rubbed my clit in time to Sully's thrust. But he roared and snatched my hand away, replacing my small fingers with his strong ones. You wanna come? Fuck, I'll make you come. His hips pistoned deeper and faster, his fingers rubbing me with violence. No finesse, no gentleness, just crude possession of my most sensitive parts. 
The uncivilized way he spread and smeared me made my release curl into a thorny, horny bomb, its fuse hissing with fire, growing shorter and shorter the longer he fucked and grinded. Claiming all of me, touching me, fucking me set off his second release. His entire body jerked as his head fell backward and he howled. The ripple of his orgasm splashed inside and that was the final strike I needed. I exploded outward, fragmentizing until I was diamonds falling on the sand. He spasmed as his climax wrung him dry, his body tumbling forward until his chest pressed against my back. His lips kissed between my shoulder blades, his breath panted on my spine. He grew heavy, his cock remained hard inside me, while aftershocks of my bliss milked him. We stayed like that for a minute doing our best to calm tattered heartbeats and remember how to be human. I waited for him to withdraw, to climb to his feet and continue carting me to wherever he needed to go. But his cock continued to throb inside me and his hips pressed forward, inserting every remaining inch he could. He took me for the third time in the exact same position without ever slipping free, his arms slid around me until his right hand fondled my breasts, one at a time, pinching my nipples, squeezing, laying claim to both of them. I whimpered and writhed beneath him as he kept me bound in such a prone position. I couldn't get up. I couldn't stop him. His entire body plastered over mine as his hips rocked with long, dominating strokes filling me, sliding deeper than anyone thanks to his multiple releases and my shameless drenching of lust. The noise of our coupling ought to be embarrassing, the joint wetness, the shared fluids, the most intimate of connections. But I only felt pride. Pride that I was strong enough for this man to fuck. Pride that I'd willingly drugged him to find out the truth. And instead of just finding out one truth— I found two. One, he did care for me. Two, we'd been together before, under the guise of a fantasy bought by another guest. But Marcus paid you with a diamond. I turned icy as Sully continued to thrust into me, hammering deeper and deeper the more my mind tried to pluck holes in my confidence. If I hadn't slept with Marcus, then why had he given me a diamond? And if Sully had kept me for himself in the caveman illusion, how could he then give me to Roy Slater in his daughter-in-law daydream? Frustrated tears glossed my eyes as Sully groaned and came again, pumping yet more of his essence within me. How stupid that I blistered with pain, worrying that Sully hadn't been the one to take me after all, when he was the one who derailed my life. How utterly wrong that I was filled with jealousy at the thought of him being with anyone else, even while he was still inside me. My temper sprang into existence, shoving aside my need and granting strength. Digging my nails into the sand, I pushed up with power. I caught Sully by surprise, knocking him backward as I scrambled forward, crawling like a helpless animal. I wanted some distance between us distance to think about this, to analyze my hope that it was him in the cave and not some idealistic fantasy. My belly clenched with misery as I shoved to my feet and ran. Sully's growl chased me. He was in the midst of elixir now, his sanity well and truly buried beneath brutality. I'd made yet another stupid mistake. Running when he was this primed and highly sexed? What he'd done to me already would seem so tame to what he'd. Arms viced around me. His inertia sent me plummeting to the sand. We fall together, tangled in legs and arms, the impact of our fall jangling my bones. Sand coated us, sticking to our sweat, our desire. It dusted my lips, entering my mouth as he shoved me onto my back and kissed me. He kissed me breathlessly, maliciously, he kissed me until my lips swelled and stung from his sandpaper five o'clock shadow. He kissed me even as his fingers noosed around my throat and he squeezed with terrifying power. My eyes shot wide, staring into his drowning blue as he positioned himself between my legs and drove his cock inside me. 
He fucked me in timeless missionary, but he choked me with endless violence. The two combined to create a terrifying recipe of ultimate control. I'd never been manhandled so roughly, never been so utterly possessed. I waited for panic. I drowned beneath pleasure. My mouth fell wide as his cock hit the perfect button inside me, and his thumbs trapped my pulse. I came in a blistering supernova of surprise. His lips twisted as he watched me shatter beneath him. His fingers tightened around my neck, his eyes flaring with shock, as if he had no control over his own strength, afraid of his own savagery. His hips plunged into mine, over and over, creating a niche in the sand where we lay, digging a bed for ourselves for him to take and fuck and claim. And when he came, he broke apart, sweat gleaming over every inch of him. A droplet ran down his throat, continuing between the ridges of his pecs. I wanted to lick it, to taste him. I needed everything he could give me. Lightheadedness dragged me back from sensation and sex, bringing bruises and pain, revealing the dangerous tightrope we walked of erotic play and true suffocation. I can't breathe. My fingers scratched at his knuckles, self-preservation finally making an appearance, trying to get free. He didn't notice, consumed by the body-racking orgasm he rode, grinding into me, running as deep as he could, jerking with every clench of desire. Only once his face went lax and the madness receded from his eyes did he look down and freeze. Sullivan, Chapter 2 The fog of elixir lifted for a few horrifying seconds. Eleanor gasped below me, her lips a tinge of terrifying blue her face white with blood streaking her cheek. Fuck. Fuck. I ripped my hands from her neck. What the fuck are they doing around her neck? Wincing, I withdrew and crawled away from her as fast as I could. The world swam, the corners all black, the world nothing but a sexual mist. I'd done that to her. I'd hurt her. I'd been inside her, taking everything, and I'd been too consumed with my own needs to notice. She coughed and rubbed her throat, swallowing a few times as she slowly stood up. God damn it, her entire body looked as if it had been mauled by a monster. Scratches on her chest, a bite mark on her shoulder, red finger impressions around her throat. I shoved myself to my feet, desperate to get to my villa and lock myself inside. This was why I told her to keep her goddamn distance. This was why I told her to run. Raking my hands through my hair, I yanked at the strands, trying to get control of myself, very aware that sand covered every inch of us. We glittered with the fucking stuff. It stuck to my cock, the moisture glittering between her legs, to our very lips. The minute my gaze found her mouth, my vision crept dark with crimson need. A fugue blew in like rain clouds, consuming rational thoughts, descending me into hell. The fire in my balls returned, the excruciating drive to grab her, impale her, and fuck her until I came again and again and again. Christ! Bending over, I clutched my thighs, trying to breathe and return to humanity, to shed the filth inside me, to forget about the salacious, suggestive seduction to just use her. Use her and discard her. Fuck her. Kill her. Do whatever I goddamn wanted. No matter how deep I breathed, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't stop the obscene scream for sex. I was way too fucking aroused. Way too fucking hard. Way too lost to stop. Sully, it's okay. Eleanor held up her hand. She stepped toward me her lithe body swollen and ready for mine. It would be so easy to grab her and slip inside her again, to claim the final holes I hadn't taken, to make her mine forever. But if I let myself fall again, I might not wake up in time. I might remain in the elixir's claws all while I suffocated her. Stay back! My voice echoed with my past self, but hissed with dangerous bloodshed. Go away. 
Get as far away from me as you can. Before she could argue, I broke into a run. My villa wasn't far. If she wouldn't run, I would. I could get there before I drowned again. Please. Grabbing my cock so the fucking thing didn't hurt any more than it already did, I threw myself into the fastest sprint I could. Sully, wait! Eleanor's surprised shout followed me into the shadows, chasing me around corners as I bolted toward my sanctuary. Each stride, I did my best to stay sane. Each pump of my overworked heart, I willed my body to beat the treacherous elixir. But my willpower was not enough. I was a weak fucking idiot who thought he could play God with a person's nervous system and not pay the price. The price for me was hurting the one woman I cared for. And I'd done it while getting off on the best fucking sex I'd ever had. Sex. Christ, yes. I needed it. Craved it. My run turned to a crippling trip, and I fell to my knees in the sand. My hand went from holding my cock in protection to jerking it with nasty assault. The sand and my sensitive skin only added another element of pain to my pleasure, and the ever-ready orgasm shot up my legs into my balls and jettisoned out my tip. I groaned and tipped forward, digging my free hand into the sand to stay upright, while my other continued to pump. The sensation of coming stole air from my lungs and vision from my eyes, but only a single drop of semen shot out. One drop. My fourth orgasm and already my balls were dry. The moment my teeth-clenching release let me go, I looked over my shoulder with manic hope that Eleanor had followed me, that she'd appear from the shadows and fall before me in servitude. I'd grab her hair, I'd hold her down, I'd shove my cock down her throat. Shit. Lurching to my feet, I started running again. Hopefully toward my villa, but I honestly didn't know. I didn't trust that I had control. Didn't believe I had anything good left inside me. I got further than my first attempt before the next release punished me. I exploded from the undergrowth, finding the natural oasis formed by Nirvana. The waterfall splashed with heavy droplets and a hundred sparkling rainbows. The sun beamed down, heating the small utopia to unbearable levels. Jasmine vines hung in the boughs of frangipani trees. Butterflies fluttered in the light. Green moss softened sharp rocks with a gentle carpet. It was paradise. And I was the devil in its midst. My naked skin burned up. My hair dripped wet with sweat. And once again, I crumpled to my knees as another crippling command to come made me masturbate in agony. My balls had almost crawled inside me, their tightness throbbing with misery. The delicate skin on my cock was covered in abrasions thanks to sand and repetitive sex. But I didn't care about any of that. All I cared about, all I could think about, was chasing that shimmering, shattering climax. I grunted with each pull on my cock. My hips worked into my hand. I lost all resemblance of a man as I gasped and cursed, bowing over as I came for the fifth time. Not even a droplet this time. Just dry pleasure and a cock that no longer had any purpose than to torture me. As the final wave receded, my strength gave out. I collapsed onto my side, allowing the sun to burn me. Thirst made my throat sore and voice hoarse. Too much coming had drained my body of all its reserves. But as much as I wanted to rest, I hadn't earned that yet. I couldn't close my eyes without seeing an X-rated pornography. I couldn't settle my breathing without growling for Eleanor to put me out of my misery. And my heart, as it drummed and defibrillated itself with ill-advised, sickening electricity, my pulse became a crazed enemy in my veins, granting utmost punishment. My villa had become the antidote I needed. My thoughts latched onto it for deliverance from this evil and redemption for what I'd done to Eleanor. I had to get there. Now. My arms shook as I pushed off from the ground and tripped to my feet. I looked at my villa in the distance, cocooned by jungle, its door hidden by foliage. I jogged toward it, but then... I stopped. Nirvana. 
the cool, refreshing waterfall. Perhaps that could wash away this nightmare and christen me back into lucidity. Changing direction, I stumbled toward the crystal blue pool. I climbed over the boulders on the shore and sighed in relief as the first cool touch of fresh water lapped my ankles. The temperature of Nirvana was cooler than the sea, the freshness of the water so cleansing compared to the salt I regularly swam in. Yes, this was my cure. This would keep Eleanor safe from me. Diving into the depths, grateful for the shelf where the shore dropped away, I gave myself to death, sinking to the bottom, happily trading cold extermination over berserk stimulation. I welcomed the rocks below to cradle me. I removed all power from my muscles. I closed my eyes and... Tongues, teeth, breasts, nipples. Eleanor writhing on her back as I filled her. My hand sliced through the deep and found my cock. I opened my mouth and howled underwater as I worked myself into yet another frenzied, demented, maniacal release. Water rushed down my throat and splashed into my lungs. I choked as my entire body clutched with pleasure. I rippled with bliss while drowning. The two experiences linked hands and made me crave annihilation. I tried to breathe as the final crest broke. I clawed at my chest as a debilitating ache spread. I released my cock as bodily control over skeleton and sinew faltered. The surface glittered above. Air beckoned just beyond the water's kingdom, but my legs didn't kick when I ordered them to. My arms didn't respond when I tried to swim. My system shut down, broken from too much pleasure and drained by too much sexual stress. Fuck, I'm going to die. Instinct made me inhale again, sucking back more water. My ribcage threatened to snap one rib at a time, my lungs rejecting liquid and demanding oxygen instead. My vision went hazy, my mind blank. The only thing that still had providence was sex. Sex. Fucking sex. If I found a mermaid down here, I'd try to fuck it all while I drowned. I would go to hell because all I could think about was lust instead of life. A splash broke the glittering surface above me. The mermaid I'd lusted for appeared from nowhere. Long seaweed hair, flashing silver eyes and pearly, perfect body. But she didn't have a tail. No scales. No fins. Just gorgeous long legs. Long, strong legs that split apart to gain access to the one thing I needed more than anything. Her fingers wrapped around my wrist. I tried to pull her close, to pin her beneath me, to mount her. But my body no longer operated. I jerked in the throes of a death dance as the tailless mermaid pulled me closer and closer to the surface. Pinpricks of pain from her nails punctured my rapidly fading consciousness. My eyesight traded clarity for ghostly mirages. Down and down, deeper and deeper. Quietness. Peace. No more need for sex. No more need for oxygen. Thankfully. Heavenly. Saintly, I let go, grateful to finally be free. Something sharp shredded my hard-won serenity, a lash of pain across my cheek, and another, followed by lips on mine, air forced down my throat and painful compressions on my chest. Pressure repeated over my heart, determined and ruthless, reversing my slip into silence, dragging me back into mania and pain. The explosion from dying to alive sent daggers of misery through my entire nervous system. My eyes flared wide. My mouth opened to breathe. A gush of water spewed out. There you go. That's it. Come on. Breathe, Sully. For God's sake, breathe. I choked and wheezed as the lightness of air replaced the heaviness of liquid, my lungs faltering over the new concoction. The mermaid helped me roll to my side, slapping my back with agonizing strength. Stop, I croaked. She didn't. Stop. I tried to crawl away, only to find water keeping me buoyant and rocks behind me. I blinked, 
waiting for the mirages in my eyes to fade back into precision. As Nirvana came into view above, and the paradisiac garden appeared around me, my brain kicked back into gear. Along with thoughts came the nasty, insidious hunger, licking around my mind, sending blood back into my cock. You're not done, not yet. My heart pounded the message, electrifying my heavily depilated system. Fuck, please, not again. Sully, are you okay? Soft hands cupped my cheek, guiding my face to hers. Eleanor. Jinx. The worst goddamn curse of my life. A dream turned nightmare. A goddess who should never have existed. A purchase I should never have made. Her. Take her. Fill her. Fuck her. My hand had a different master, obeying the elixir's fierce control rather than my weak pleas to stop. It shot upward, grabbed her around the nape, and dragged her down to my mouth. I kissed her. I traded drowning in water for drowning in her. I rolled us over until she laid on the rocks beneath me. Water had rinsed us clean. No more sand, no more dirt, no more blood. I chose the illusion that I hadn't hurt this incredible creature, that I'd only ever been gentle and worshipping and so fucking grateful for her creation. She was mine. Not because I traded cash for her life, but because she'd been born for me. The universe birthed me first, listened to what my heart ordered, the complex desires I had, the unique wishes I held, and created her just for me to find. That was why I'd dreamed about her, why I'd asked traffickers to find her, why I couldn't stop myself as I kicked to propel us higher under the shallows and swam on top of her, why I groaned as my cock found her entrance. Why motherfucking tears came to my eyes as her heat and slippery wetness welcomed me to slip home. Home. Fuck, she was my home. Not this island. Not this planet. Her. This curse. This gift. This priceless, irreplaceable goddess. She squirmed beneath me, her gray gaze flaring with matching passion and terrible concern. Sully, stop. You need a rest. You almost drowned. She pushed at my chest, trying to pry us apart. Stop. She could never pry us apart, as we were two pieces of the same whole. I belonged to her as much as she belonged to me. I'd told her that. When she'd asked me my name on our first time together, I'd told her, I'm yours. It didn't matter I wore a different face from my own that I went to her as a guest and hid behind a lie. My thoughts scattered as I claimed her mouth again. She tasted like crisp waterfall and warm sunshine. She tasted like redemption. Her tongue fought me back. She tried shifting her head to dislodge our kiss, but I didn't let her go. I threaded both hands through the hair that I found such a fucking turn on and held her still. The water kept us weightless while I thrust into her. Our bodies floated but locked together, straining hard and needy. Leaving my left hand tangled in her hair, I slipped my right one down her chest, squeezing her perfect breast, and kept going, stroking her curves, finding her center, rubbing against the clit so she felt a fraction of the pleasure that I did. Her body bowed in mine, her lips parting, allowing me to kiss her deep. Her fingernails dug into my lower back, pulling me into her so my cock filled her until there was no space between us, no way to pull us apart. I'd fucked this girl. I'd mauled this girl. But there, in my private waterfall, I made love to this girl. Time lost all meaning as we rocked and grinded, her legs wrapped around mine, her hips answering mine in an ancient language we'd both begun to understand. A language that belonged entirely to us, deciphered only when our hearts accepted what this disaster of a bond meant. I was falling for her. Fuck. I kissed her harder. I bit her. I crawled deeper into her. And she responded to my violence with her own. Her teeth punctured my bottom lip, her hips arching into mine. 
and the elixir allowed me to savor this moment, to live on that precipice of plummeting and pausing, surrounded by shards of pleasure, fully aware of how excruciatingly brutal the release would be. We kissed. We fucked. And when I fell off that precipice, we fell together, groaning, moaning, clawing, biting, doing our best to break each other apart. Eleanor, Chapter 3 Sully jerked in my arms, groaning with agony as his orgasm bled him dry. The waterfall splashed and sparkled, pounding into the deep blue pool. Heavy trees full of vines and flowers, misty rainbows, jeweled butterflies, tree frogs on leaves and insects flittering in spheres of golden sunlight. I could be forgiven for thinking this was heaven. It was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. Yet it had almost become my graveyard. My heart lurched with remaining panic. If I hadn't sprinted after Sully, if I didn't arrive just in time to see him collapse into the water and vanish beneath the surface, he'd be dead right now. He would be dead because of me. Because I drugged him, broke him, reduced him to a single vocation. I clutched him to me, shivering as his head fell heavily on my chest, the crisp water kept us floating even in the shallows, my hair tickling my skin, the sensation of being sand-free a huge relief. Sully's mania quietened for a moment, and his body buckled beneath the insane urges of procreation. His lips glided to my nipple, kissing my breast, ducking his mouth and nose underwater to lavish me with sweet affection. Don't. I kept his chin and pulled him back into air, how did he still have energy to fuck me? He'd almost drowned. His gaze couldn't focus entirely on me, hazy than clear, smoky than lucid. I didn't know if he saw me or a fantasy, but terrifying things glowed behind his exhaustion. Emotions that chiseled open my chest and stuck a dagger deep inside my heart. Love, awe, possession. The world fell away as our eyes locked, muting the waterfall removing the pool, placing us in pure nothingness while we stared. No words were needed. No sentences were powerful enough. Our silence shouted the truth. Somehow, this violence between us had brought about something as rare and as mythical as Sully's euphoria. We'd fallen. We'd crashed. We lay at the bottom of a cliff, bruised and battered, broken and bloody, but instead of licking our wounds in private, Instead of hiding the depth of what happened, we lay in that broken jumble together. His cock still filled me, a dark spear of lust and need, but his arms slowly embraced me with utmost tenderness. His head lowered, his eyes blazed, and when he kissed me, the gates of a new future smashed wide. Love. It had a flavor, a texture, a smell. Love tasted metallic and fragrant sweet and sour, spicy and forbidden, but it smelled of fresh rain and new beginnings, of shared lust and musk, of hard-earned truth. I didn't know how long we kissed. Serenity didn't exist with the shameless way Sully pinned my head to the stony shore and took everything he wanted from my mouth and body. But there was innocence. There was faith. There was softness. His hips began to rock again, filling me, conquering me, begging me. My pussy grew wet with an entirely different version of need. This didn't come from instinct or raw basic desire. This came directly from my heart. But I was also sore. Internal bruises and swollen extremities made me tighter than normal, driving solely from sweetness into savagery. Water lapped and splashed as our gentle rock turned quick and questing. His teeth found my throat again, sinking sharp incisors into my flesh with no apology. He bit harder as his hips pistoned, but it was his endless groan that made me die. I died in his arms as he thrust into me and came. I didn't know how many releases he'd had or how many he had to go before he passed out. But the ripple of his back and clench of his muscles seemed to drain him of everything he had left. He died in my arms, and I died in his. 
I just had to hope we'd both be reborn wiser when this was over. His heart pounded against mine as he slowly withdrew and stood. Bending down, he offered me his hand, pulling me with impressive strength from the pool. Without a word, we walked hand in hand, naked and soaking, down the pebbled pathway into the dense forest around his villa. So this was where he lived. Not on the beach with access to the sea he loved so much, but hidden in shadow like the monster he thought he was. He kept himself away from his goddesses, from crystal horizons, from humanity, making a home within the animal kingdom he chose over his own species. A monkey crashed from a tree and onto the thatched roof as we followed the path to a heavy front door. An iridescent blue kingfisher darted by as Sully pushed open the entrance and pulled me inside. Two geckos shot up the wall where a massive piece of art hung, a mirroring masterpiece of the waterfall outside. A scaled and frightening-looking lizard left its sun-baking spot on the black tiles and slithered to the deck outside. A pair of toucans that snoozed on the railing surrounding Sully's home lifted their massive beaks to determine if we were friend or foe. And a flock of tiny sparrows fed on pineapple speared to a table outside a huge window. So many animals. So many content and trusting souls. None of them left as Sully carted me deeper into his personal sanctuary. A kitchen rested along the darkest wall, glittering with polished bamboo cabinets and white quartz. A long rattan chaise invited a book lover to curl up by the open sliding doors, leading to a huge balcony, cantilevered over the very same pool where he'd almost drowned. The constant splash of the waterfall filled the high ceilings and exposed rafters with serenade, while his bedroom beckoned to the left. That was the direction he took me. Our feet left puddles behind as we bypassed his living room and entered the one place I never thought I'd be invited into. His bed was big, but stark. No headboard, no expensive linen or cushions. Just a single pillow and plain white sheets. A mosquito net hung from the rafters, haphazardly drawn and tucked into the mattress to create a small entrance. Driftwood side table, calico lampshade and a sea grass woven mat on the floor. His villa wasn't big, but it was airy and light and wasn't just home to him, but to countless creatures he loved. Nervousness filled me, fear that this was all too good to be true, that he'd shown me his world and soon he'd kick me out of it. Sitting backward on the bed, he manhandled me until I stood between his thighs. His cock stayed upright and thick with need, but the satiny skin held marks from our constant pleasure. We'd hurt each other with lust. It was time to stop, time to rest. But he pulled me into him, curling his spine to press his mouth against my pussy. Oh, God. My fingers dug into his hair as his tongue teased my clit and lapped at my sore parts. The dexterity of his attention and unforgiving exploration of every piece of me made me sway and stumble. He held me up, digging his tongue past my folds and inside me. I winced, I moaned, I squirmed to be free. Instead of letting me go, he reclined onto the bed, dragging me with him so I had no choice but to crawl on all fours over him, my pussy still controlled by his mouth, his head between my legs as I sat over his face. The bed shook as his hips arched into the air, seeking the very same thing he suckled on. My eyes snapped closed as he shoved the entire length of his tongue inside me, the intimacy of being taken like that, and the knowledge that he'd been inside me in so many ways, brought another reluctant release to the surface. My hips began to rock. I clutched the sheet, allowing indecent moans and groans to spill from my lips and scatter around his head. Each whimper and mule I made, his speed and desire increased. His fingers needed my ass, slipping between my crack to press against the hole he hadn't tried to invade yet. I jerked. I tried to get away. He snarled and spread three fingers inside my pussy while his other hand continued seeking a way into my back door. I fought him. He just held me harder, his mouth latching onto the sensitive flesh of my inner thigh, his teeth sinking deep. 
The fear of him taking me in a way I hadn't been violated before, coupled with the tingling high of him eating me and the ferocity of his fingers fucking me. I couldn't stop it. My elbows buckled and I collapsed face first onto the bed as I came. Over and over, bliss and brutality, I surrendered to the painful squeezing of my inner muscles, milking the final shreds of my endurance. The moment I'd finished coming, Soleil shoved me off his mouth, pressed me onto my stomach, then thrust inside me. He fucked me ruthlessly hard. The mosquito net shivered with every rut, the bed frame squeaked, his grunts blended with the waterfall. I cried out as pain overtook pleasure, and still he fucked me. I twisted to look over my shoulder, imprinting him to memory, determined to remember his undoing, to remind myself he was only human, even if he treated me like a beast. His eyes were demonic, his drugged desire riding him ragged. He strained and fornicated, driving me deep into his bed, trying to crawl inside me, doing his best to murder me with sex. My breasts bruised into the mattress. My lips burned as he bent and kissed me. Our tongues slipped sliding, our finesse totally obliterated until we licked and nipped like animals. I lost all other sensation apart from being used by Sully Sinclair, and when he finally reached that brick wall, when he ran headfirst into blistering fatigue, his entire body bowed into mine. His jaw locked, his eyes snapped closed, his frame jerked and jolted as every cell, every blood, every breath was consumed by his orgasm. It didn't look pleasurable. It didn't grant relief. It looked as if I'd tortured him worse than anyone. His mouth opened wide with a silent roar as he crested the final clutch of his climax. Then his eyes rolled back, his body went slack, and he tumbled into unconsciousness beside me. Sullivan, Chapter 4 I'd fallen. I'd broken. I slept. But restful slumber didn't find me. Nightmares did. Nightmares of family betrayal, vicious lies, and why I'd forgotten how to trust. I sank into horrors and reminders. My sins crept from the darkness to maraud and mock, revealing how far I'd gone to wage war on those who'd deceived me. I had blood upon my hands, revenge upon my soul. And now Eleanor was unlucky enough to have trapped my heart. This won't end well. Eleanor, Chapter 5 Morning light gradually switched to late afternoon. I hadn't moved. I didn't know what to do, where to go. I had no clothes, no painkillers, no food or water. I only had a man who'd purchased me from traffickers, used me more thoroughly than anyone, and then passed out beside me. A man I couldn't stop looking at because I couldn't come to terms with the carnage inside my heart. I should loathe him. I should stalk to his kitchen and grab the biggest knife I could find. I should sink it into his chest and let him bleed until dead. I should end him now while he lay so trustingly next to me and save countless other girls who would one day become his goddesses. He might have black and white rules on the trading of services, likening it to the industries that humans had turned into torture devices. But it didn't make it right or wrong. He respected all life, any life. He stood up for those who didn't have a voice and in turn reversed the rules onto his own kind. He was complicated. He was simple. He was ruthless and unreadable, and as much as I'd like to think things would be different now we'd slept together, that something special bound us, it didn't mean he wasn't the same arrogant asshole who'd stolen my future and farmed me out to his high-paying guests. And yet, I sighed. I sighed and studied the way his black hair cascaded over his forehead, clinging to his damp skin with its bronze-bleached tips. The way his lips stayed parted, his jaw relaxed and eyes closed. He ought to look tranquil and free. However, stress lines never left his tanned skin. 
Sully ought to be in a healing sleep, but occasionally he'd twitch as if he fought dragons in his dreams, as if he'd traded one hell for another. Had I looked that tormented after euphoria? Did I look so scrambled and uneasy when staff had removed the sensors and carried me back to my villa? I'd tried to wake him. I'd curled up beside him and brushed aside his hair to kiss his feverish cheek. But he remained unconscious. His lungs rattled a little from inhaling so much water, his breathing labored and loud. I should be glad of his struggles. He'd caused more than enough to others. So why did my heart revolt and beg to find a doctor, to help Sully even though he refused to help other two-legged beings? As time ticked onward and I stayed vigil by his side, I allowed my mind to run riot. My common sense was disgusted at me. Its scalding and snappish remarks, its condemning disappointment made me blush and cringe. You fucked a man who trades in women. You fell for a man who doesn't hesitate to use others for his own gain. You stopped trying to escape because you stupidly believed he might be the one. You've forgotten all about Scott because he's not Sully. You've cheated on your boyfriend. I bit my lip at that one. Before, in euphoria and all the other sexual experiences Sully had put me through, I could semi-justify my involvement and participation. This time? Nothing could spare me from the truth. I'd drugged Sully knowing this would happen, hoping this would happen. I'd gambled with my own body and heart in order to win his in return. I hadn't thought about what Scott would say as I let another man fuck me, in fact, just thinking of Scott seemed so distant now. A different time, place, a faraway galaxy. I'd been a kid then, an adolescent girl with a puppy affection for a mediocre traveler. I didn't feel like a child now. I felt every one of my 22 years. I felt worldly and guilty and fully aware of the mess that today would have caused but I was also grateful to finally know what sex with Sully Sinclair would be like. I'd no longer have to wonder, even if he went through with his plan and sold me, even if the awe, possession, and love in his gaze turned out to be elixir falseness. I'd taken something from him, just like he'd taken something from me. We were even, marked and mutilated by mutual desire. This was justified. My hands bawled as a stupid wash of tears raced up my spine. I didn't know where such weakness came from, but I refused to shed them. I would not pity myself. I would not pity him. There was nothing to pity because magic had existed between us and it'd been worth being reckless for. Wiping at a single droplet as it dribbled disapprovingly down my cheek, a noise ripped my head up. The slam of the front door, the heavy thud of shoes. I scrambled to grab the rumpled sheet, struggling to pull it out from under Sully's prone, naked body. He lay on his stomach with one arm limp beside his chest and the other thrown over his head. His thighs were spread, revealing to this unwanted intruder the abrasions from too much sex between his legs. Cal appeared, slamming to a stop on the threshold of Sully's bedroom. He held a black bag in his fist, his chest rising with harsh breath as he drank in the sight of us. Well, you're alive at least. He wrinkled his nose, stepping toward the bed, deliberately keeping his stare off Sully's naked ass. I flinched, pulling the sheet closer. Most of the cotton remained trapped under Sully's unconscious bulk, leaving my top half exposed. I cupped my breasts, keeping my spine rigid. Go away. Cal's green gaze turned mocking. No need to cover up, Goddess Jinx. I've seen you naked many times before. I glowered. You're not needed here. I say otherwise. His handsome face softened just a tiny bit, his attention falling to the scrape on my cheek, the bite marks on my skin, the shadows of strangulation around my throat. He really did a number on you, didn't he? I shivered. I caused this. Yes. Yes, you did. His forehead furrowed. What the fuck were you thinking, giving him a dose? I'm honestly surprised you're still breathing. 
I looked down at Sully, wondering if our voices slipped into his slumber, but his face remained lax, his tension still strained while comatose. I did it because I wanted to know. To know what fucking him would be like? He snorted. Shit, you've become like the rest of those poor brain-dead creatures he calls goddesses. I bared my teeth. I might share similarities with them, but I have one thing they don't have. Cal smirked. Throwing my words back in my face, huh? You told me that first morning when you took me to him that I'd made the biggest mistake by making him pay attention to me. I spread my hands, not caring my breasts were on display, complete with chaffed nipples and bruises from Sully's fingers. But it wasn't me who made him pay attention. It was both of us. My voice lowered with strength. I refused to let him sell me before he admitted that to himself. Admitted what? I sighed. Admitted that something happened between us, whether we wanted it or not. He scowled. You're just like Calico and the other girls who've tried to crawl into his bed. You want this island. You want his money. You think by screwing his brains out that you'll have access to paradise forever. Unlike them, you were smart. You gave him no choice. You fucking raped the bastard by giving him elixir. I shot to my knees, uncaring that the sheet fluttered off my body. How dare you? How dare you stand there and say I raped him when he's been feeding that vile stuff to women for who knows how long? He drugs them, shoves them into a computer program, and then leaves them at the mercy of a man. There's a fucking difference. His voice slithered with ice. The men don't get elixir for a reason, Jinx. They go into euphoria only getting what the women want to give them. They try to keep up. They might even pop a Viagra beforehand if they're old, but they don't have the power. You do. You're the ones who gag for it. The ones who drip to be filled. How is that any different? A woman is given a drug to turn her into a mindless whore, and a man turns into a humping monster. It's the same. It's not the goddamn same. Cal swooped closer, towering over me. It's not the same, because Sully has paid the price for his control. He isn't the cunt you think he is, and you've just done yet another worst possible thing. Because, sure, you might have fucked until you're both under some delusion it could mean more, but he will never allow it to become more, because you went behind his back. You broke his precious trust. You proved that no one can be trusted. Especially you. Our fight hung in the air with lashing tails, animosity rife between us. I didn't like Cal, and he didn't like me. A competition had sprung between us. He saw me as a threat to his position as main confidant in Sully's life, and I saw him as the blockade between me and Sully's potential truce. Either way, nasty fear hissed through my blood. Could he be right? Could whatever closeness Sully and I had felt be a fleeting, fragile thing because of what I'd done? But if I hadn't done it, I'd be on a plane right now flying to become Rory Slater's wife. I had no choice. You did have a choice. You could have realized that your heart is a liar and an ignoramus. You should have known that you'd be scrambled from being kidnapped, trapped, and used. What if the emotions I felt towards Sully were terribly fake? What if I'd fallen into the same pitfalls any other girl who'd been imprisoned by a mercurial man went through? I fell for the monster, believing I could see the good inside him, when really, it could all be a lie. My voice mimicked a whisper as I said, I'm not like that. I am trustworthy if he deserves it. Cal snorted. Yeah, unbelievably trustworthy. First, you run away the moment his back is turned, and then you drug him without his consent. He rolled his eyes. Way to prove your integrity. Integrity? I hissed. How about we talk about his integrity, your integrity? You two live on this island and play puppet master with real people. People who had a life before Sully stole... Stop. Cal's hand shot up. I'm done arguing with you.
Goosebumps shot over my flesh as he raked a hand through his hair and visibly shut his anger. He sighed heavily. Look, I didn't come to harass you. I actually came to save you. He half smirked, and our fight faded, leaving just icy worry behind. If you must know, I came to stop him. I figured if he hadn't finished with you by now, then you'd probably be almost dead. He shrugged, depositing the bag on the bed by my feet. Turned out I'm too late to be of any use. He looked down at his liege and master, keeping his gaze on his face and not his ass. What I don't understand is why he's out cold already. He's fit. He's been suffering a severe case of blue balls. I think... I hugged myself, accepting his armistice. I think almost drowning interrupted the elixir's potency. The what now? He flashed me a look. He fucking drowned? Marching around the bed, he fought the mosquito net until the gauzy material fluttered out of the way. Reaching for Sully, he checked his pulse. Concern coated his face. Why didn't you call me? His breathing sounds weird. I refused to be the bad guy for not calling for help. Yes, Sully most likely needed a doctor, but I wasn't about to go traipsing around for one, especially with my own wounds and soreness. And if I was honest... I'd been afraid that the moment reality intruded on our private paradise, that everything we'd done would be over, that it wouldn't exist anymore. My shoulders slouched as I sat back on my heels and dragged the sheet over my lap. That one thought revealed just how feeble this plan had been. I'd been terrified of it being over because I already knew what would happen. Cal is right. Sully would never permit me to stay after what I'd done. I just signed my own bill of sale by going behind his back and forcing a connection when he didn't want one. But he was familiar. You recognized his body. It was him in euphoria. It had to be. I shook my head as Cal grabbed his cell phone and called for a doctor. My thoughts were in shreds, blended together with doubt and confusion. I don't know what to think anymore. Exhaustion suddenly crushed me begging me to rest, to close my eyes and forget about this whole sordid day. I needed to sleep, but I didn't feel safe dropping my guard that much around Sully, even if he was unconscious. Sleep was a precious thing, the most vulnerable a person could be. Sully slept beside me under false pretenses. He'd never have been able to rest around me without elixir draining him of everything. Unlike him, I'd kept my faculties while sleeping with him, and now, I'm ready to go. To lick my wounds in private and pretend the illusion of a door between us could keep me safe from whatever future he paved for me. Cal muttered something and ended his phone conversation. He caught my gaze, arching his chin at the bag he deposited by my feet. Painkillers, healing creams, and vitamins. Take what you need. His green eyes trailed over my injuries once again. I suggest you have a bath and put arnica on your bruises. They're gonna look worse in the morning. When I didn't climb off the bed, he muttered. Use his bathroom. Heal whatever you can. I'll take care of him. I didn't want to move while Cal watched my every twitch, but the sound of washing away my sins and popping a few anti-inflammatories overrode the stiffness and soreness, slipping me slowly out of bed. Refusing to make eye contact with him, I padded across Sully's bedroom in my birthday suit. A sugar glider had made its home in the rafters, waking up too early for its nocturnal lifestyle. It watched me all the way to the bathroom with its moon-sized, gorgeous eyes. Crossing the threshold into Sully's personal bathroom, I paused for a moment to soak it in. Just like the other bathrooms on this island, part of it was open air. Unlike the other bathrooms, this didn't pretend to use any rocks or plants for privacy. A black vanity took up the only real estate against a wall with a simple mirror above it. A toilet hid behind a glass, smoky door, and the rest of the space welcomed the waterfall and its pool to be the main form of cleanliness. The bathtub rested right on the edge of the space, seemingly hung in place above the crystal blue pool, and the shower angled to spray the overflow directly onto the pebbled, tiled floor draining and cascading through a little river carved into the floor. 
A staghorn beetle sipped on the last few droplets still resting in there. This truly was utopia. A utopia with a demon in its mist. Twisting to look behind me, I drank in the sight of Cal as he strode to answer the door to the doctor, marched back to Sully, and crossed his arms while Dr. Campbell treated his boss instead of his goddesses. Cal looked up, our eyes locked. Without a word, I turned and closed the door. Night had fallen by the time I opened the door and stepped back into Sully's bedroom. I'd taken my time. I'd drawn a warm bath, added generous splashes of some sort of fragrance that made my heart skip in remembrance of Sully, and sank to the depths of the humongous tub. Resting my chin on the lip of the bath, I'd allowed my mind to drift while staring at the magnificent waterfall. Rainbow droplets fell in perpetuity, tumbling from its tower of rocks and cartwheeling into brilliant blue below. With my stillness and silence, Creatures appeared from everywhere, going about their business in the undergrowth, the treetops, and in the liquid below. Fish, herons, mice, a couple of monkeys, flocks of bright birds, and even a Komodo dragon slithered from the dense jungle and slipped, without a ripple, into the pool. I didn't know how many were native to Indonesia and how many Sully had brought with him, but all of them seemed perfectly at home and content. He had a way with animals. Pity he didn't have the same intuition when it came to people. To me. If he did, perhaps things would be easy between us from now on. Instead of the minefield, I was terrified to face. Sleepiness grew harder to ignore the more the sun set and darkness descended. Male voices had ceased a while ago. The doctor had most likely left after treating Sully. Had Cal left too? Was Sully still catatonic? Either way, I couldn't stay here any longer, wallowing in Sully's bathtub, falling in love with Sully's home, being lulled by Sully's animals. I'd survived the risky endeavor of plying him with elixir. I had no clue if it had saved my future or condemned it. But my time had ended on this chapter. Whatever came next, I would keep my spine straight, my heart brave, and survive. After I'd hauled myself from the bath, I'd applied arnica to the marks and shadows on my skin. Cal was right. Already the blue bruises had turned mottled with purple and black. Almost every inch of my body had some sort of brand from Sully's ravishing. Places I hadn't known were injured now held their own version of the story. If anyone saw me, they'd think I'd been horrifically abused. Sand had chafed my knees, elbows, and belly. My cheek held four deep scratches from the palm tree. My lips were swollen and slightly cracked from so much kissing. My hip bones held fingerprint shadows. My throat glowed with strangulation reminders. My nipples still peaked and slightly scraped. And three bite marks finished the masterpiece. Two on my neck, one on my inner thigh. My hair had suffered, too, tangled and knotted from his fists, still untamed thanks to not finding a hairbrush in Sully's bathroom. Hopefully, with a few painkillers and some sleep, I'd rejuvenate enough that I wouldn't have a constant reminder of what Sully and I had done every time I looked in the mirror. Especially if that mirror was somewhere else, somewhere in Rory Slater's house. I winced, sucking in a worried breath, I wanted to shake Sully awake and demand to know his intentions. Had I proved a point today? Had I made him sit up and listen to whatever existed between us? Or had I only made him more intent on getting rid of me? Holding my breath, I left the relative safety of his bathroom and padded into the dark bedroom. Sully lay on his side with the sheet pulled over him, leaving only his torso and muscle-corded arms bare. Still asleep, his vulnerability drew me to him in morbid fascination. He looked younger and older, innocent and more depraved. His lips were pressed together, his forehead still furrowed, his entire body stiff and uncomfortable. My heart squeezed as I moved closer still, unable to tear my eyes off the contours of his tanned chest, the sprigs of hair between his pecs the way his arms flexed and threatened power even in his sleep. 
He hadn't escaped his own injuries from our time together. His bicep had chafing, his lips swore like mine, and his hands held a cut or two over his knuckles. His pulse pounded in his throat, keeping time to his slumbering heartbeat, and moonshine snuck in from the deck, illuminating a puncture mark on his arm. An injection site. Whatever Dr. Campbell had given him, I hoped it would prevent any complications from inhaling water and almost trading this life for a new one. My stomach ached all over again at the thought that he could have died today, that this male with all his destructive malice and damaged misery might no longer exist. That would be a tragedy. That would be karma. Karma for his ownership over those who should never be bought. Karma for his heartlessness toward those who shared the same genetic makeup. Go, Ellie. Go before it's too late. This was wrong. A voyeur in the dark. A girl who ought to hate this man, but was not hating him at all. Biting my bottom lip, I sent motion to my legs to leave. Instead, they disobeyed me, closing the final distance between me and his bed. I bent without thinking, running my fingertips over his cheek. He flinched. He moaned. His eyes fluttered but stayed closed, his face twisted up in pain. Pain. Why pain? Why did closeness bring such agony to him? Pull away! Get back! My thoughts had loudened to shouting, but my fingers switched from feathering to cupping his cheek, feeling his warmth, his realness, his existence. Go! Run! Don't do this to yourself! You're smarter than this, damn it. You're being an idiot. I held my breath as I ran my thumb over his bottom lip. His entire body jolted. His eyes flashed open, wide but not awake. The sea blue of his pupils had turned cobalt with misty memories. I gasped as he lashed out, snatching my wrist. You. His voice sounded like crushed up nightmares. Gulping, I tried to pull away. He just jerked me close until I tripped onto the bed, onto him. Come to haunt my dreams for the third time? He nuzzled into me, sucking my earlobe, biting me in punishment. Well, this time I won't let you go. His leg kicked off the sheet until he was free, manhandling me until I lay on my side with my back to his front. He pulled me into him so every inch of our bodies kissed skin to skin, soul to soul. He groaned as he spooned me, not gently but furiously, as if angry at me, livid with me, but not with me because he didn't see me. He only saw a figment of his dreams. Who is she? And why did green, vicious jealousy fill me? Why, oh, why can't you be real? He buried his face into my hair. He shuddered. His arms went lax around me as he tripped back into sleep. And I lay there, trapped by him, surrounded by him, cursing him. I couldn't stay in his arms. I couldn't pretend that it was me he'd seen standing by his bed. Whatever woman he dreamed of had already captured his heart. Therefore, my stupid attempts at taking ownership of it were futile. Tears welled and spilled. I'd lost... It's over. I would be sold for the second time, and all of this would fade into a strange, sickening hallucination. I tried to extract myself, but even in his sleep, he kept me prisoner. The moon skated higher in the sky. The world spun slowly toward a new day. And I remained his. Captured and afraid, I could no longer fight my failed escape shipwreck and euphoria-induced heartwreck. Sully had flown me back to his island, thrown me in a cage, rented me to a guest, and then smashed apart every remaining barricade I'd had around my heart. I was exhausted. Emotionally, mentally, physically. Sleep was precious. Sleep was vulnerable. But in his arms, I slipped into darkness and dreams whisked me far away. Sullivan, Chapter 6 I woke to pain, 
My entire body felt as if it had been tied to the skids of my helicopter and dragged through the ocean backward, colliding off reefs and atolls, smashing into palm trees and rocks. My lungs burned, my cock throbbed, even my goddamn wrists and ankles hurt. As wakefulness scattered the remaining fugue of fatigue, I struggled to sit up. My muscles laughed in my fucking face, weak and wrung out. Groaning, I swallowed down the soreness in my throat and assessed why the fuck I was so battered. Elixir. Jinx. Copious amounts of copulation. Inhaling hard, I struggled upright, groaning at the fresh misery of movement. I froze. My bed held company. Her. God damn it. Her. The silver-eyed, coffee-haired priestess from my dreams. I vaguely remembered grabbing her in my sleep, of keeping her with me instead of allowing her to vanish, but she wasn't real. This girl wasn't her. This girl was an imposter, a liar, someone who could never be trusted because she'd forced me to do so many things against my will. Things like touch her, want her, fall for her. She lay on her side, curled tight into a little ball as if trying to avoid my very presence. Her eyes remained closed, her body lax with unconsciousness. What the fuck was she still doing here? She needed to leave, immediately. All the emotions from yesterday, all the blistering connection that had grown unavoidable thanks to sex, it all hummed louder and louder the longer I stared. Groaning under my breath, I scooted to the edge of the bed and swung my legs to the floor. The room swam, and black spots took their goddamn time playing with my vision. Gritting my teeth, I pushed upward and fought the urge to trip to the side with vertigo. I needed hydration. I needed sustenance. I needed to get the hell away from her before she... Sully? I spun around, cursing as I stumbled forward and grabbed a mosquito net for support. It ripped a little, creaking from its hook on the ceiling. Eleanor sat up in bed, her eyes sniper sharp while mine still struggled to focus. My heart was no longer operational. Somewhere along the line of yesterday's chaos, it had torn itself into pieces and scattered like strips of bloody paper. But those tiny pieces still did their best to beat erratically, wanting to claim her, all while wanting to kill her for what she'd made me become. She sat up on her knees, the sheet falling away from her nakedness. Are you okay? How are your lungs? Do you remember yesterday? You almost drowned and... Do I remember? I held up a hand, shutting her up. Yes, I fucking remember. I remember everything. How amazing you felt. How well we fit together. How it felt like home when I was inside you. Then... Are you okay? Can you breathe all right? My eyes locked onto her body. Onto the handprints, the fingerprints, the cuts, the bruises, the bite marks. Fuck. Fuck. Rage blended with disgust, and I laid every ferocity at her feet. You dare ask how I am. I stalked around the bed until I reached her side, towering over her. You dare sit there and be concerned when you're the one in fucking ruin? Look at what you made me do to you. I warned you. I told you to fucking run, Eleanor. She glanced down at her chest, at the modeling of her skin, at the crimes I'd smeared her with, and all she did, this infuriating, dangerous goddess who had never learned her place, all she did was shrug. I'm not nearly as sore as I usually am after euphoria. I've had worse. She jumped as a feral snarl crawled up my throat. You've had worse. Bending over her, I plated both fists into the bed. I used the stability of the mattress to keep me standing, but also as a reminder that violence on top of violence did not equal peace. You've had worse. Please remind me when such disaster occurred before I paid money for your life. The tinder spark of temper filled her gaze, switching gray for glowing ember. You want to go there? 
fine. Inhaling hard, she muttered. I've had worse, Sully Sinclair, when I was beaten and stolen from a backpacker's kitchen. I've had worse when I was knocked out and transported to some hovel where other women huddled in the dark. I've had worse when men stripped me, touched me, tattooed me, and then sent me to you. You're forgetting all of that was because of me, her teeth bared. I agree, you bought me. But you weren't responsible for me being chosen. They picked me because I was naive and stupid. They saw an opportunity and... Fuck! I reared back, digging my hands into my hair. Seemed honesty burned a hole in my tongue because I snarled. It wasn't opportunistic. It was predetermined. Her temper flickered a little. What? What do you mean? I mean, I asked for them to find you. I gave them your description months ago. I've bought other girls since then. I forgot that I'd asked. I forced myself to forget that I sent traffickers an intimate description of someone who isn't real. But then they found you. You were real. You were real enough for them to deliver you to me. And I fucking bought you, even knowing it was the biggest mistake of my fucking life. But... She shook her head. How? How could you ask for me when we hadn't even met? I ignored her question, continuing on my rampage. And then you arrived, and the moment your feet touched my shores, I knew this would fucking happen. I sliced my hand through the air, pointing at her wounds. Wounds I'd caused. Wounds that made my throbbing cock twitch to cause more. My teeth had punched her throat. My cock had been balls deep inside her. My so-called love had tainted her with blood instead of beauty. She didn't deserve that pain because it didn't come close to the depth of mine. You and that haughty elegance. You and that impenetrable grace. My voice turned into a blade dripping with poison. I wanted her to hate me as much as I hated her. I wanted this to be an end between us. Over. Done. I fucking refused to allow the emotions in my shredded heart to manifest any more than they already had. Because I did not do well with love. I did not trust it. I didn't trust anything, and I didn't trust her most of all. But I did right by you. I kept myself leashed. I didn't take you the moment I saw you. I didn't fuck you on the beach the second you arrived. I didn't confuse a fantasy with reality because you might look like her, but you aren't her. You can never be her. Not who? I even went out of my goddamn way to protect you from me. Roy Slater offered the best deal any guest has for a goddess. And what did you do? My nostrils flared as yet more fury exploded through my blood. You gave me elixir. You stood there taunting me instead of running. You let me put my hands on you, my cock in you, and my heart... I clamped a hand over my mouth, shutting up my spew of honesty. Breathing hard, I scratched my thickening beard and growled. What were you hoping to achieve, huh? You just wanted to fuck? Euphoria turn you from frigid to constantly horny? I laughed icily. Well, I hope I delivered, because I won't apologize for the marks I've left on you. I won't apologize for any other pain I caused. You caused this, not me. I'm sorry. So, so fucking sorry. Grief had turned my anger into a toxic thing. I hadn't woken up with the intention of yelling at her. If anything, I'd planned to be cordial, to ensure I hadn't hurt her too much, that she was mentally sound after a day of being used by me while at the height of my lust, and then place her on the helicopter with Roy Slater. We'd had our time. We had each other. We didn't need to part with a fight. I was giving her her freedom, for fuck's sake, and instead, she stared at me as if I was betraying her in every possible way. Slowly, she balled her hands and cocked her head. Delicate tangles of hair dribbled over her shoulders, caressing her finger-bruised breasts, bracketing her strangled throat. I almost buckled to my fucking knees for what I'd done. She'd not only given me her body yesterday, she'd brought me back to life in so many brutal ways. She'd hauled me from the waterfall, 
She'd pounded my heart until it beat again, and then successfully yanked the bloody, broken thing from my chest and taken it as a memento of our time together. She didn't steal it, you coward. You'd already given it to her, remember? The second she appeared in that gown, the moment you decided to keep her. Fuck, my thoughts were scrambled. Lethargy filled with lechery, a concoction that didn't allow sanity to be present. I suggest you sit down before you pass out. Her voice remained smooth as perfect glass. I suggest you get the hell out of my villa. Oh, don't worry. I will. She moved with sinuous grace, slipping one leg to the floor and standing upright. But not before I say something. Naked. Both of us. Bruised and branded. Equal monsters in this war. Both too stubborn, both too stupid to admit how easy it would be between us. How good, how real, how much it would destroy us when it went bad. She licked her lips, pinning me to the spot. The room swam, my stomach growled for food, and my shattered self-control howled to snatch her, to hug her, to just breathe her in and believe in a simpler world. But then she opened her mouth and smashed apart the very concept of simple. You say this was my fault. I don't agree. I flinched as if she'd slapped me. I tried to laugh, but it came out more like a choke. You're blaming this on me? I am. She nodded regally. You admitted it to yourself. You asked them to find me. You brought me here because you believed I could be the woman you dreamed about. I tripped backward the room spinning faster, my lungs forgetting how to breathe. You fight against what exists between us because, for some reason, you've given up hope on your own happiness. She strode toward me. And I have to accept that, because who am I to be the one to make you happy? Her lips sneered condescendingly. I'm just a goddess to serve your guests, a whore to make you money. Her hand landed on my chest. Five fingers of pure venom. I fought the urge to cough, the dregs of drowning yesterday finally hurting my ability to breathe. Lust sprang through my blood, deformed and delusional. But here's the thing, Sully. She stood on her tiptoes, bringing her lips to my ear. I think we're both to blame. Because I might have used elixir for us to sleep together yesterday, but... Her voice cracked with worry, as if not entirely sure of the repercussions of what she was about to say. But that wasn't our first time, was it? In a single heartbeat, I captured her wrists in my hands, squeezing tight. What did you say? She shivered with panic, but forced herself to go on. You were familiar. My body recognized yours. Her eyelashes fluttered as she rushed. You told me Euphoria hides who we truly sleep with. It could be our greatest enemy or our biggest love. Our minds are deceived, but our bodies know the truth. I stopped breathing altogether. You were the caveman that first time I was in Euphoria weren't you? I shoved her away from me, shaking out my hands and the constant chemistry from touching her. Fuck. God damn it. Leave, Goddess Jinx. You've had all you'll ever have from me. You traded places with the guest, didn't you? You fucked me in that cave. You were the one who- Enough. I forced a callous sneer on my face. You're accusing me of having such shitty self-control that I ignored a fully paid contract between my guest and my business just because I had a hard-on for a new, untrained goddess? I'm saying you felt something, even then. Felt what? Love? She gasped. Was it? I laughed as low and as cruel as I could. I'm sorry to pop your incorrect conclusions of me, but I don't believe in love at first sight. Well, it was something at first sight. Something? I rolled my eyes, cursing when the room leapt and faded. You're basing this whole theory that you felt something? We felt something. 
I stalked into her, cupping the bruises I'd already decorated her neck with. I squeezed maliciously, making her swallow hard against my thumbs. You want me to admit I felt something for you? I want you to admit that I'm something to you. Anything. Admit that you're as lost as I am. Violence tried to escalate into arousal. I wanted to fuck this girl. I wanted to punish her for ever having the courage to force me to admit things I would never admit. Even to myself. But my body was past useful. My cock held marks from too many orgasms yesterday. My lips cracked from too many kisses. And her? She held so many contusions from my so-called love. This was over. The only thing I felt was pain. Pain because you are noticeable. Pain because you are something. Pain because you can never be more than whatever fucked up mess this has become. Her pulse throbbed beneath my thumbs as I did my best to systematically destroy the stars in her eyes and the wishing in her heart. You, Eleanor Grace, are something. You have the power to be everything. And that is why you'll forever remain nothing. Tears cascaded from her gorgeous gray eyes, trickling down her cheeks and over my fingers. How can you turn your back on this? You felt it too, I know you did. That moment we first met, that punch to the guts, that squeeze around the heart. Don't project how you felt onto me. She stomped her foot, frustration bleeding into her voice. Don't deny me the truth, Sully, please. Tell me, was it you? Was it you in euphoria? You need to go. Releasing her throat, I backed away struggling to stay lucid, cursing how my body shook. My system had depleted itself to zero from yesterday's carnage. Now it ran headfirst toward a grave. I needed to rest. I needed to collapse. I needed her to leave me the hell alone so I could pretend I hadn't royally fucked up my life. I'd been caught. She knew. But I'd be damned if I confessed. Because her questions were the exact same ones I'd asked myself. Why? had I entered Euphoria for the first time that night? Why had I gone to her in the skin of a caveman and enjoyed the best sex of my life? Until yesterday. Why had the very idea of giving her to Marcus Grammer made me become a psychotic murderer? I'd done him a favor by not giving him jinx. If I had, he'd be bones on the ocean floor and his flesh in the bellies of reef sharks by now. Turned out, instead of ruining his life, I'd ruined mine, and I honestly didn't know how to fucking fix it. Eleanor, Chapter 7 It was him. It has to be. I sat dazed on the beach, looking out to sea, clutching a diamond that had been gifted for the use of my body. A diamond that Sully had bought me. Or a guest... Was this a secret admittance to how he felt, or a stone weeping in lust from another? Unlike blindfolds and other methods to hide true identity, Sully's euphoria successfully hid everything. Eye color, voice, height, scent, and features. All I had were instincts and guesses, and those faltered in the face of Sully's protestation. Why did I think I knew better than a well-rehearsed, perfectly delivered hallucination? How did I think I would recognize Sully behind the smoke and mirrors and scientific tricks he used? I wanted to remain confident in my accusation, to cling to the hope that he hadn't been able to rent me. Because that meant his lies would eventually lose. But I honestly didn't know anymore. The diamond rested heavily in my hand as I stared at a perfect vista, watching as the sun set on another painful day glowing with so many things I never thought I would do. I now paid the price for those decisions. Everything I'd done, every action I'd taken, every mistake I'd chased and hoped I'd embraced, I did because of one thing. Him. I'd cheated on Scott. I'd turned my back on my old existence for the mere whisper of a new one. I'd stolen a drug and used it against the very man who created it. I willingly, happily, 
gave my body to be used by him. I screwed up everything. But I would do it all over again because Sully had admitted something, something that confused the hell out of me as well as corrupted me. I asked for them to find you. I sent an intimate description of someone who isn't real. But then they found you. You were real. You were real enough for them to deliver you to me. And I fucking bought you, even knowing it was the biggest mistake of my fucking life. What did he mean by that? That any girl who looked like me would have made him feel this way? That what we felt wasn't special? Just misplaced by him lusting after a figment of his imagination? I didn't know if I found that stupidly romantic or hopelessly sad. Why was he so determined to lie to himself? I wasn't crazy. When I dragged him from the bottom of the waterfall and he'd slipped inside me in the shallows, there had been love in his eyes. I know there was. Love and awe and the total disbelief that we'd found each other. But if he could feel that, if he could admit in that moment that this, us, was unique, then why did he shout and kick me from his room? Why did he throw a shirt in my direction, march me out his door, and leave me to find my way back through the meandering pathways to my villa? Why hadn't he visited? I sighed, pulling my knees up and resting my chin on them. It'd been twelve hours since I'd woken to Sully's fury. In the beginning, I thought he raged at himself. The way he looked at the wounds he'd given me spoke of crippling self-loathing. But then that temper had switched. He'd swallowed back the softness that bloomed between us and denied everything. Every look, every touch, every connection. Including the fact that it was him in euphoria that first time. Is he a liar? Or am I the most stupid, starry-eyed girl in history? The quick quiver of wings announced Skittles' arrival just before she came to a graceful perch on my toes. Instantly, my stomach stopped churning in worry. Her presence acted as a sedative to the calamity in my head and heart. Hey, little bird, where have you been? I reached out to tickle under her chin. Did you see us yesterday? See our unhinged display on the path? She squeaked and fluffed her wings. I take that as a no, I smiled. Hopefully. Had anyone seen? Was it luck that we'd been alone, or had Cal managed to do what Sully asked and shepherd everyone to their villas? I was glad we hadn't been watched. Not that it would have mattered with the state Sully was in. The state I put him in. Skittles chirped and angled her head for me to scratch deeper. Her black eyes closed in pure bliss. I sighed again, allowing a simpler connection between bird and human to take precedent over the complicated one I shared with a monster. But then Cal's snippy comments returned. You broke his precious trust. You proved that no one can be trusted, especially you. I groaned under my breath as another lance pierced my heart. What Cal had told me last night had haunted my sleep. He spoke of trust as if it was the most fundamental rule to life. He acted as if Sully had lost the ability to feel such faith. And if that was true, then no matter how much daydreaming I did, no matter how much plotting to make him admit, no matter how primitive and explosive our sex had been, it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference. Sully would continue to deny he felt anything, and he'd most likely still get rid of me for his sanity. I probably made things worse, not better. Skittles sensed my crushing sadness, flying from my toes to my knees. I reclined a little, giving her space to nuzzle at my fingers, straining to chatter and chirp against my lips. I kissed her back, closing my eyes at the gentle nipples and oddness of being kissed by a bird. Her tiny head bumped against my chin, bringing another unwanted wash of tears up my spine. Ugh! I swiped at the moisture with my knuckles, the diamond icy and sharp in my fist. You know... Before this whole mess, I never used to cry. Skittles cocked her head, listening attentively. It's true. Before Sully, I'd never fainted. Before being kidnapped, I only cried out of frustration rather than grief. I stroked her silky plumage. Maybe it's my parents' fault that I'm fawning over a man who's cold-hearted and cruel. 
Skittles bounced on my knee at Sully's name, but remained a rapt listener. Mom and Dad weren't exactly good role models of how a relationship should be. They bickered all the time, and the tension when they were together was awful. I was glad, not sad, when they divorced. Yet another layer of pain found my heart. A strange kind of tower filled with recent pain, past pain, and overwhelming future pain. Maybe there's no such thing as the one or soulmates, or happily ever after. Maybe for girls like me, there's possession and trade and new masters when the old ones get bored. Skittles twittered and rubbed her beak on my knee in sympathy. Her little personality had blossomed since she'd claimed me as her own. I was wrong when I thought she wasn't as cute as Pika. She was adorable. Adorable and sweet and kind and... Ugh, stop it! I swiped at another stupid tear. Just stop it. You tried. You failed. Tonight is probably your last night here, so go for a swim. Soak in the island and then never ever think about that man again. A squawk shredded the soft hish-hish of the ocean just as Pika dive-bombed from above, tucking in his wings, hurtling down like a green torpedo. I ripped around just as the pipsqueak parrot landed on the sand, fanning his wings and stomping his scaled feet in vibrant display. My heart lurched. Sully. Pika normally appeared just before Sully did, flying ahead to torment me before his master could. But no man appeared from inside my villa. No visitor with an apology or explanation. I slouched, twisting to face the sea again. Pika nibbled my toes, his black eyes so much more mischievous than his sister's. Skittles chirped indignantly, puffing up as if she didn't appreciate the rude interruption. Hey, Pika, where did you come from? I held up my hand, letting him flutter up and perch on my finger. He squeaked, chattering on about life and nonsense. Seems they love you, Jinx. They don't hang out with any other goddess, that's for sure. I spun around so fast, Pika took wing off my finger with a snippy squawk. My heart wanted it to be Sully. Disappointment flowed thick when I found a female instead. Jealousy. She laughed under her breath. Don't sound so overjoyed to see me or anything. Sorry. I am just... I'm contemplating life and not liking my options. I scooted to face her, waiting until she stepped off the deck to join me in the sand. In her hands rested a familiar garment, one that'd been torn into pieces and ripped off my body yesterday, a bejeweled dress that probably cost an absolute fortune and had been left in ruin on the path. She laughed again as I blushed. Recognize something? Where did you get that from? Cal asked me to walk the pathways after he very unceremoniously commanded all of us to return to our villas until further notice. He came to get me a few hours later to clean up the mess. His words, not mine. She giggled. I found the pieces on the fork to Nirvana. I groaned under my breath as she dropped the glittery dress into the sand and sat elegantly beside me. Nirvana? Happens to be where Sully lives. She nudged my shoulder with hers. So, are you going to tell me what happened, or do I have to guess? Her eyebrows waggled. Because I've been guessing all day, and I really want to know if my imagination lives up to the reality. Pika and Skittles suddenly took off, abandoning us in a flurry of feathers. Had they been summoned by Sully? Could he hear us? Did he expect me to stay mute? on what occurred, or could I share with jealousy? He said she'd be your only confidant. So, confide. Inhaling, I admitted in one long rush. Sully was about to sell me, so I dressed up as much as I could, stole a vial of elixir, spiked his drink, waited instead of running like he told me, let him use me however he wanted, saved him when he almost drowned in Nirvana, fell stupidly in love with him somewhere along the line, and then woke up to his furious tirade and a pretty strong message that he hates me when he threw me out. I shrugged, 
slaying my hands and wincing as the diamond caught the final spiels of light from the sunset. The faceted stone burned orange and gold. I gambled on the fact that he felt something for me, and I'm pretty sure I lost, so we might as well say goodbye because I doubt he'll let me stay much. Jealousy snatched the diamond from my palm, cradling it close and shutting me up. Her eyes narrowed as she tumbled the priceless rock from hand to hand. I felt no ownership over it, so didn't care if she claimed it. It would mean something to me if I knew who'd given it to me, but currently it made me feel like a bottom-paid-for whore. I'm impressed you spiked him with a lick, sir. She kept her gaze on the diamond, juggling it, letting the final sun sliver catch and sparkle. I'm impressed you survived him, using you while out of his mind. I'm also impressed that you fought for your future, rather than letting him dictate it. Fisting the diamond, she caught my stare with hers. But I'm disappointed that you think he'll sell you. He's never onsold a goddess, not once, and I know he's had two offers on me alone. He has? She nodded. A man named Boris and another who I can't remember. They cornered me, professed their love for me. The usual drama after they fall for us in euphoria. That's what happened to me. Rory Slater approached me and asked to buy me. He wanted to marry me. I swallowed hard. Sully agreed. He might have agreed, but he'd never have gone through with it. He looked pretty set when he told Cal to draw up the contract. Jealousy leaned closer, her hazel gaze diving deep into mine, once again shoving aside my worries, my sins, and fishing for my truth until she grabbed it with both hands and yanked it to the surface. I give you my word. There is no way in hell he would have put you on that helicopter with another man. Goosebumps scattered down my arms, completely ignoring the muggy humidity and pretending I sat in snow instead. How can you be so sure? She grinned, revealing perfect teeth. Because you're his. We all are. He bought each and every one of us. Don't be obtuse, Jinx. You know exactly what I mean when I say you're his. You're the one. You're his forever. A sick chuckle spilled from my mouth. Look, I appreciate the pep talk and your attempt at making me feel better, but you don't know what you're... Who do you think gave you this diamond? She held it up, spinning it in her fingers. If you slept with Sully as much as I think you did yesterday, your answer should be fairly clear by now. I went deathly still. Wait. The night Sully came to lock me in the cage, after I'd run away, you said I needed to know something about... The diamond, yes. She nodded brusquely. Yes, I did. But I'm guessing you already know what I was going to say. I shivered. You expect me to believe Sully was the one who gave me that? Wasn't he? I mean, physically, yes. You were there. He shooed away all the other goddesses and then gave me the box. She lowered her voice, cocooning us in our secrets. What did he whisper to you? I scampered the moment he looked at you as if he'd throw you on the table and eat you for breakfast. He... I licked my lips, wishing I didn't remember an exquisite detail, but unable to deny it, his voice vibrated in my skull. Another man told me that you're the best he's ever had. That he'll never fucking forget you. That he gave you a piece of his heart. I got... jealous. He said it was from a man who fell in love with me. If it was him, why was he jealous? Jealous because he hid behind a ruse? That man, being him, jealousy murmured. My heart literally hiccuped with agony. Anger hung on the coattails of my agony, and I scooted away a little, needing space, needing her to stop this nasty game. I asked him point blank if he felt anything for me, and he... You, Eleanor Grace, are something. You have the power to be everything. And that is why you'll forever remain nothing. He denied feeling what I did. Jealousy huffed impatiently. That's not what I think he said at all. She tossed me that diamond, 
I didn't catch it in time, and it plopped onto the sand, sinking until the shiny jewel became just another pebble on the beach. Why is this so important to you, huh? I asked. Are you trying to deliberately hurt me? Don't you think I've overanalyzed everything he said to me, trying to read between the lines to see a message he might be giving me? Oh, I know you'll be doing that. And I know you see the message he's been giving, but you're too weak to admit it. Weak? I bared my teeth. You're calling me weak now? Afraid so. She crossed her arms. Afraid of admitting that you're both in deeper shit than you realize. That you're both too damn stubborn to actually tell the truth. To let the truth have a chance. I'm not the stubborn one. He is. Then stop him being so stubborn. How? By doing exactly what you've been doing. It's not enough. My temper shot free. I've tried. I've lectured myself that what exists between us isn't normal, that it's worth fighting for. But how can I trust something so new and strange when the circumstances between us are so fucked up? How can I trust myself? Jealousy stood, swiping the sand from her apricot sundress. Plucking the diamond from the beach, she dropped it into my palm. The bigger question is, how can he trust you? What do you know that you're not telling me, Jess? I chose to use her real name to imprint the seriousness of my question. She responded in kind, her pretty face stern with honesty. Sullivan Sinclair is a man with severe trust issues, very little faith in humanity, and from what I can piece together, he's done monstrous things to those he's loved in the past— he will lie to your face if you ever ask him if he loves you. He will lie to himself until he almost believes he feels nothing. He will never admit that you've wormed your way past his defenses, because that would force him to confront his very existence as a man. His whole operation, his view on the world, his empathy toward his creatures, his utter disdain for his own kind. By admitting he's fallen for you, he's effectively signing his own death sentence because— there is no easy path from there, no easy way of admitting that his prior convictions might be wrong, that he might one day severely hurt or kill you because his trust is non-existent. Coming close, she ducked in front of me and balanced with her hands on my thighs, just like when she'd come to claim me for euphoria the first time, just like when she'd asked if I was more afraid of evolving than the actual pleasure euphoria would give me. Look, I told you before, Sully is reaching burnout. He knows it himself. He knows something has to give. He knows something bad will have to happen before he can finally admit to himself that he isn't the cold-hearted bastard he believes. And he hates you because you're forcing him to admit it far sooner than he wants. Her fingers clutched my thighs. He was the one who gave you that diamond. He was the one who fucked you in euphoria. He was the one who told you he was in love with you because he could use the disguise to hide the truth from you as well as him. I guarantee if you get him to where he thinks he can hide behind a mask, he will be far more lenient with the truth. He'll admit what's in his heart because he knows he can take it all away again, and it won't mean a thing because it wasn't him admitting them. I sucked in a breath, shaking and shocked. Why are you telling me this? How do you know all this? She kept my cheeks, pressing sand granules into my skin. I know because I watch and listen. I know because the night Sully hooked you up to Euphoria. He tripped out of that bathroom and looked as if he'd seen everything he ever wanted and knew he could never have it. He made you believe he sent you to fuck Marcus Grammar, but the moment he pressed that button... She stopped herself, sighing heavily. The moment he pressed the button, what? What happened? She smiled sadly. Cal went to get Marcus. The men are brought in once the goddess is already loaded into the program. I'd stayed lurking close by. I was the only one who saw what Soli felt after whatever happened with you guys in the bathroom. He noticed me, and it only took a second for him to snap his fingers and take me into the second VR room. I didn't need to ask. I helped him put the sensors on me. I willingly drank the elixir, all while he copied Marcus Grammer's fantasy and put me in your place. What? 
My heart dropped to my toes. He made me look like you. He intercepted Cal and loaded Marcus into the hallucination. And then he went back to you. She grinned coyly. I know that diamond is from Sully because Marcus gave me one too. He gave me a diamond that was meant for you and Sully gave it to me the night before he found you at breakfast. The only difference was the diamond from Marcus was two carats. The one from Sully is at least four. My teeth chattered as my gaze fell on the heavy, expensive gem in my hands. Could it be real? I wasn't crazy to think it was Sully who took me as that brutish, delicious caveman? Trepidation skated down my spine, colliding with each rib in a clanging symphony. I looked up and met Jealousy's gaze. If that's true, why bother telling me? Why do you care? What do you get in return? She tucked hair from behind my ears before standing in the final ruby dregs of sunset. I care because he cares. And if he learns to care for someone, perhaps he'll care for all of us. She shrugged, looking much younger than her previous conversation suggested. If you can give Sully his freedom, then maybe we can have ours in return. Blowing me a kiss, she smiled at the tatters of my dress left forgotten on the beach, and then strode up the steps and into my villa. The front door closed a second later. I collapsed on my back, exhausted as if I'd run a hundred miles, shaking as if I'd seen a thousand ghosts blinking with a million hopes at the stars. Sullivan, Chapter 8 Work was my salvation. This time yesterday, I'd been balls deep in Eleanor. Now, I sat at my desk with a cock that still smarted from overuse, a bruised heart, sore lungs, and muscles that had filled with lactic acid and refused to abate. Dr. Campbell was right. Elixir reaped havoc on a person's neurological system. My body felt like a stranger, and my mind a traitor. My rational thought and habits all scrambled. Thanks to Eleanor, I'd been left with explicit dreams, dregs of pleasure I had no choice but to succumb to, and the highly intense and painful erotic memories of what I'd done to her. I couldn't get her out of my goddamn mind. I couldn't eradicate her scent from my nose, her taste from my tongue, her heat from my cock. She was everywhere. She was inside me. And being so weak to her power pissed me the fuck off. Yes, I was in love with the damn girl. Yes, I'd slipped and might have told her that at some point yesterday. In some version. And yes, I'd definitely let down my barriers when I'd taken her in euphoria. I'd been honest for the first time in decades. I told her I was hers, that I didn't want her to wake up because I didn't want to return to this fucking world. I wanted to remain in that cave where it was just the two of us. No lies, no struggles, no opportunities for her to betray me. But that cave wasn't real, and our wild sex yesterday also wasn't real. Both were byproducts of scientific formulas designed to trick the mind, confuse the heart, and remove the many obstacles and common sense that stopped a human from falling in love in mere seconds. In that, there was no gimmick or distortion. Men fell for their goddesses thanks to rioting body chemistry and overwhelming amount of dopamine, adrenaline, and neorepinephrine, which made falling head over fucking heels an addictive rush. I groaned digging my hands into my hair. That's all that happened to me, too. A blend of body programming and misfiring synapses. That's it. Then how do you explain that punch to your gut when she stepped off your goddamn helicopter? Stop. I gritted my teeth and howled at Pika as he sat minding his own business, shredding a pink post-it note. He cocked his head, bristling green feathers. He chirped as if growling back, then returned to his shredding with ferocity. I'm done with this nonsense. She is human. She isn't trustworthy. Look at her current track record. She'd run away. She'd stolen Skittles. She'd drugged me. If I was stupid enough to want her after she'd shown her true colors, then I deserved the fate I'd been given. Nodding with determination, I snatched the phone and called Roy Slater's villa. It was time he got off my fucking island. 
Alone. Eleanor would not be sold. Not because of her little stunt yesterday, but because we had a contract, signed by both of us. A commitment of four years and then freedom. I would find a way to endure those four years. I would revoke this madness inside me. I would return to who I was, and she would begin her proper employment with weekly servicing for the men I let onto my shores. Eventually, this scramble of elixir and euphoria would get the fuck out of my bloodstream, and I'd be sane again. Slater answered on the second ring. Hello? Pack your bag, your ride home leaves in thirty minutes. He coughed. Orders now? After I was treated like a criminal and locked inside my villa all day yesterday? What the hell, Sinclair? I paid to come here. I paid for pleasure. Not so your goon could throw me into a cell. That was for your own protection. So you didn't see what I did to the goddess you've claimed. Something fishy is going on. Just honor our deal and I'll leave. We'll both be glad to say goodbye. There is no deal. Not anymore. What? But you agreed. We shook hands. We... I don't sell my property, Mr. Slater. My temper spiked with a snarl. I had a momentary lapse. I pinched the bridge of my nose, wrangling the fury in my voice back into its cage and forcing genteel pleasantries instead. I apologize for the inconvenience, and of course, your extra night on Goddess Isles is complimentary. But your stay has come to an end. He blustered and fought for words, finally settling on a pathetic, but. I love her. I want her as my wife. You can trust me to care for her as my family, Sinclair. I would never harm her. Trust. The most idiotic, dangerous emotion of all. There is no such thing. My hand tightened around the phone. Pika sensed my rising rage, fluttering to land on my head and hang upside down so we were eye to eye. He granted me enough rationality to exhale heavily and keep my voice from launching down the bone and stabbing the bastard in the ear. I apologize for your conviction. You might think you love her, but I promise you it will pass. You've been deceived by a delusion. The affection you feel has been triggered by an experience that cannot be compared. When you return home, the intensity will fade. I didn't know if I lectured him or myself. Either way, this conversation was over. Be at the helipad in twenty minutes. I will personally escort you from my shores. I hung up. Before thoughts of Eleanor could wriggle their way like a parasite into my brain, I picked up the phone again. This time, I called the recruitment office I used in the States. I delivered on a promise I should have done days ago, and ordered a highly qualified vet to support the growing number of creatures on Saragala. And because guilt sat heavily for my allowing my own shit to come before the animals who'd endured so much, I requested not one but two practitioners. One small animal, one large livestock. Soon, we'd have a shipment of horses and a couple of donkeys arriving. They hadn't been tortured in a lab, forced to be unwilling guinea pigs. Their experiences came from a more sinister nature. A facility that catered to psychopaths who liked to rape animals. A few sheep and a couple of cows were also expected. Poor beasts could be physically rehabilitated, but would never trust a human again. Like me. Normally I didn't take on other abusive cases that didn't originate from chemical testing, but I couldn't say no when the request for help appeared in my inbox. Soon I might have to expand to another island to cope with the ever-growing population. Good job I own forty-four of the fucking things. When I put the phone down for the second time, Pika flew off my head to help himself to the bird table outside, shoving aside a sparrow and nipping at the legs of a macaw as he eyed a juicy grape. He was a tenacious little spitfire, unlike Skittles, who was so sensitive and sweet. My hands bawled, thinking about the shy Kaik and the fact that she was most likely hanging out with Eleanor. God damn it. Try as I might, my thoughts always returned to her to wonderings of what she was doing, of memories of what she'd felt like in my arms. Fuck. Rubbing my mouth, I shook my head and stood. Work wasn't the all-consuming salvation I'd hoped it would be. I needed the sea. I needed to swim to the horizon and get as far away from this goddess-filled hellhole as I could. Pika, let's go.
I snapped my fingers. But Pika continued to attack the mushed grape, and my phone rang shrilly in the serenity. I deliberated not answering, but with a heavy sigh, I snatched it up and barked, What? Do you always answer your phone so rudely? Every pain, every weakness, every hint of what I'd been through yesterday faded under a tsunami of black hatred, thick as oil, toxic as a corpse-rotting crypt. What the fuck are you doing calling me? Drake snickered, his voice so similar to mine. We didn't share much in the sibling gene, but our voices were almost identical. The only way to tell us apart was his more American drawl from still living on our motherland shores, while I'd lost my accent a little thanks to my adoptive home. Also, the threat of evil he cultivated was obvious whenever he spoke, making him sound like a vile bastard who deserved excruciating extermination. I figured I owed you a thank you for setting your fucking lapdog on me. That lapdog delivered what you were owed for thinking you could tamper in my company. Our company? Mine, I snarled. Or are you forgetting you got the mansions and the holiday homes and all the goddamn cash while I got the very thing that destroyed? Sinclair and Sinclair Group is worth more than any of that other shit combined. I bared my teeth. Pika and the rest of the birds took wing at the rage flowing off me. Only because I made it so. It wasn't worth nearly as much when they had it. They? Drake sneered. You mean our parents, Sully? The very same parents you fucking murdered? I went ice fucking cold. What did you say? You heard me. I heard you accuse me of murder. He laughed icily. Cold-blooded murder, actually. My heart hurtled itself into a sick gallop toward a cliff. I did my best to rein in the hate between us, to stay calm, collected, and to handle this unfortunate situation. But Drake lowered his voice to a guttural whisper. I've known all along, you little cocksucker. I knew when I showed you what our mother did to those stupid animals you rescued that you'd snap eventually. A nasty coating of sweat broke out over my back. I don't know what the... Yes, you do. Do you honestly think I'm that fucking stupid? I cricked my neck, still trying to divert this disgusting chat to more domestic topics. I never thought you were stupid, Drake. Just a fucking ignoramus with the instincts of a dung beetle. Actually, wait, I take that back. To liken you to any animal is an insult to the animal. You're just... human. I said the last word with every disgust and hostility imaginable. Drake just laughed. I'm not the killer in the family, Sully. You are. I think you forgot to take your meds. You're delusional. My nostrils flared as my phone glued itself to my ear. I pressed it into my skull until a headache formed, trying to stop his accusations from spilling free and infecting these pristine shores I'd found sanctuary in. I'd run from society because I couldn't stomach the level of detestation and malevolence that swamped me when talking to people I couldn't stand, people I didn't respect or like. I had no control over the way my body primed for a fight, a sick and dirty fight, where I forgot the part of me that was still human and became a filthy, ferocious animal instead. I would tear his motherfucking throat out if we ever came face to face again. I'm not the one who needs drugging, asshole. He paused before adding, This stroll down memory lane is good and all, but I'm sure you're aware I have a reason for calling you. Extortion by the sounds of it. Call it what you want. You owe me, and I owe you for my broken hand and ribs. What do you want? I chuckled frostily. A get well card? A get the fuck out of my business, Hallmark greeting? I want your shares in the company. I want the billions of dollars that you're sitting on and wasting on those pet projects of yours. I looked at the ceiling, trying to regulate my breathing. You want to talk about pet projects? Fine, let's talk about pets, shall we, Drake? The pets you killed? Pongo still rankled me. Still hurt. Watching something being murdered before your very eyes changed your psyche. It carved away the pieces that cringed at gore and mutilation. 
It hacked away at the fundamental commandments a kid is born with. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not carry out revenge. I'd done both those things. And I'd do it all over again. Gladly. Still hung up about that stupid mutt? Well, I'm hung up on the fact that you flew after our parents when they hired that yacht, that you stowed on board with whatever sicko plan you had, that you made them sink, that you were the only survivor, that you so quickly accepted the position of power at Sinclair and Sinclair. Their bodies weren't even cold when you smashed apart the labs and thought you were some sort of liberator, releasing animals that already had their life's purpose. His voice rose, becoming sloppy with loathing. You chose them over our goddamn parents. You killed them, you cocksucker, and you didn't even pretend to care. The cloak of black oil dripped off me, smearing on the floor, vanishing into the cracks of my basalt tiles. With each rivulet that fell, I grabbed hold of restraint. I didn't know how Drake had pieced together such a tale. I had no idea what he planned to do with such a flimsy hypothesis. But this call could be recorded, and I would not allow him to entrap me. They died in a freak accident. The police reports still don't know what caused them to sink. I understand you want justice for their passing. But blame Mother Nature or the malicious moods of fate. They died, but not because of me, Drake. Bullshit! I sighed heavily making sure the puff of frustration found its way down the phone line. I'm very busy and don't have time for this shit. Stay away from my company. Step foot in my building again and you won't have a visit from a lapdog anymore. You'll have one from me. You're saying you'll kill me? Like you killed our parents? I'm saying we'll have a brotherly chat and discuss important boundaries that should never be crossed. From one sane brother to a psychotic pet killer, we'll discuss your tendencies toward violence when you don't get your way. My voice traded decorum for snow and daggers. Or are you forgetting all those broken bones you gave me? All those smashed toys? All those painful accidents I put up with? The hospital has enough records of my abuse that they called CPS, thinking it was our father maiming me. He protected you then. Or at least until you went to that psychologist. Those files of your predilections are still there, if anyone killed our parents. It's you, you fucking waste of life. Drake breathed hard, his anger pouring through the phone. You'll get what's coming to you, baby brother. I'll make sure of it. I'm no longer interested in indulging your sadistic nature. You can't touch me anymore. So stay the fuck away from me and mine. I doubted this was how he expected this call to go. Accuse me of murder, blackmail for money, have me bow to him like I did when I was a kid. Only problem was, I wasn't a kid. And he wasn't the worst brother anymore. I am. You're not untouchable on your island, Sullivan. You'll see. Thanks for the call, bro. See you around. I hung up before Drake could explode with more threats. He couldn't do shit to me out here. He'd be dead the moment he appeared on the horizon. I dropped the phone as a rush of shaky adrenaline filled me. Part jittery from history and the agony he'd inflicted. And partly volatile from not being able to plow my fists into his motherfucking jaw. The urge to strike something, to destroy something, fired through my blood. I needed violence. I needed war. So, that was fun. My head wrenched up, finding Cal lounging against the driftwood sliders, hidden in the breeze dancing curtains. How long have you been standing there? He crossed his arms, his gaze serious and shrewd. Long enough. I rolled out the tension in my shoulders needing to shed my suit, to wash away the disgusting sweat beneath. It's been handled. What does he want? The usual? Money? Power? Me kneeling at his feet? He can't do shit to you, I know. But he figured it out? After all these years? Cal stalked toward me, narrowing his eyes. Does he have proof? I bristled. Proof about what? that you killed dear old mom and dad. My temper turned stealthy and silent, switching my voice into a snake. No. But could he? One second. 
One moment to lie, or confess. My hands bawled and I hissed. Only you know how I did it. How I used the same drugs they tested on my strays. How I fed a sedative into their drinks when they dined on food bought with wealth paid for by animal suffering. How I watched them drown in the very same ocean I now rule. I closed the distance between us, begging him to pick a fight. Wanting bloodshed, needing it. But Cal just smiled. Good job I'm not one for telling secrets, sir. Then he knows nothing, and can prove nothing. But he can follow through on his threat. I ripped off my blazer and yanked at my tie. He can try. Clawing at my cufflinks, I pulled up the sleeves of my shirt until muggy air caressed my forearms. But I'll be waiting for him, and the Java Sea can have another Sinclair to feast on. Eleanor, Chapter 9 Perhaps I deserved my recent capture, trafficking, and messy existence. Maybe I was naive and stupid after all. How else could I explain why I attracted pain these days? How did I not see the repercussions for sleeping with Sully that came in the form of disgruntled goddesses and curse-dripping envy? After jealousy left me last night, I spent a sleepless evening going over every conversation Sully and I had shared. I permitted myself to be brave enough to admit that some confessions had seemed heartfelt and real, despite his almost immediate denial of such a thing. But one question didn't add up. If Sully was the caveman and it was his diamond resting in my bedside table, then who was Roy Slater? Had it truly been him I slept with or was that Sully too? And if it wasn't him, that was even worse than him not being the caveman because how could he experience that with me and then pass me over to someone else? Those questions ensured I had no appetite when breakfast arrived and added to the uncomfortable obsession to confront him by afternoon. I was a shaky, jumpy mess, but I didn't want to live in my nonsensical thoughts anymore. This second guesser wasn't me. This pining, whiny girl would not be tolerated anymore. So that was how I found myself prowling the orchid-lined pathways, squinting in hot sunlight, wearing a white dress with silver pinstripes glittering in the material. I didn't bother with shoes, and the sand did its best to burn my soles, even with hopscotching on the shadows. I'd planned on heading to Sully's office to confront him, to demand to know if he was going to sell me or keep me. Either way, I needed to know so I could somehow find a way to accept my future. But as I'd neared the fork leading to his workspace, he suddenly appeared, stalking with bald hands and rumbled shirt in the opposite direction. His hair was wild, his eyes blue fury, his blazer missing to reveal a white shirt slightly translucent with sweat. Apart from yesterday with elixir running in his veins, I'd never seen him so unkempt, so volatile. Pika shot after him a second later, a little tornado on grass-colored wings. Something commanded, I stay silent and not call out. Instead, I followed him quietly, chasing his quick storm, hearing the faint rumble of his anger in the cloudless sky, until we reached the main beach. Skittles appeared from wherever she'd been, flitting beside me like a moth searching for moonlight. I smiled at her, hanging back and choosing to voyeur from my protective bush as Sully continued his stalk to the podium overlooking the helipad, the same throne where he'd stood and welcomed me that first day. Shoving his hands into his navy slack pockets, he kept his eyes trained on the helicopter, his brow furrowed, his jaw set tight. A few moments later, Roy Slater appeared from the laneway leading to guest accommodations, his shoulders slouched and a pissed-off expression on his handsome, older face. The second he appeared, Sully jolted as if he physically held himself back from launching from his royal ledge and smiting the poor guest into dust. Roy looked around, flinching as Cal appeared and pointed cordially at the helicopter. As the two men headed down the jetty, Cal glanced up at Sully, who vibrated above like a demon that clawed his way through the tapestry of earth and mythology. Darkness surrounded him, lust for death evident in the way the sun almost refused to touch him. 
Sully's entire attention locked on Roy as he and Cal shared a few words, before he climbed reluctantly into the helicopter. My heart leapt. He's leaving. Alone. My joy didn't have time to unfurl and figure out what this all meant, before a merciless hand grabbed my long hair and dragged me backward. Skittles squawked and shot into the sky. I went to scream, but a dainty hand clamped over my mouth. What the? I fought as the fight and flight instinct drowned my system, but Calico and Neptune were stronger. As one, they trapped me and hustled me away from the sun-drenched beach, pulling me deeper into the shady lane and into the lush jungle hiding us from view, away from Sully's dominion, away from his protection. I tripped as they shoved me against a palm tree. The rigid bark bit into my spine, snagging on my hair. A flash of being pressed up against a similar tree yesterday came and went. Yesterday, all I'd felt was pleasure as Sully filled me, even as lacerations coaxed blood from my cheek. Today, all I felt was fear and a quickly burning hate. Jupiter appeared from behind the palm tree, waiting for Neptune to feed my wrists to her, effectively becoming human handcuffs so I couldn't wriggle free. The moment I was prone, the goddesses grinned with victory. Calico ran a hand through her sleek black hair, her lips twisting in spite. Her dress of sultry burgundy once again set off her ebony skin, making her glow with otherworldly beauty. Well, well. If it isn't the plain Jane who fucked the Emperor of Sin. I shivered as Jupiter's nails dug into my wrists. She hissed into my ear. Little slut. Neptune kept her hand planted over my mouth so I couldn't call for help, all while Calico ran her finger along my scratched cheek, a lover's caress filled with the threat of destruction. I saw you, you know. I watched him shove you against a tree and fuck you as if he'd rather die than not have you. Her touch slipped to my throat, tracing the bruised fingerprints of Sully's consuming lust. I heard you, both, grunting like animals. She traced the bite marks imprinted in my skin. I watched him throttle you, all while he drove that long, thick dick inside you. Her hand suddenly lost its lazy petting and shot between my legs. That dick doesn't belong to you, bitch. I winced and moaned behind Neptune's hand as Calico cupped my sore and swollen sex. How many times did he use this, huh? Are you so greedy to drain him dry for the rest of us? I tried to shake my head as she deliberately hurt me, a vicious grip that bruised already bruised flesh. Neptune grabbed my throat while Calico continued to cut me indecently. The skirts of my dress offered no protection, loose and floaty with summer joy. I gulped as female fingers tried to follow the shadows of where a male touch had been. Do you like it, plain jinx? Did you like it when he pile drove you into the sand? I moaned as she pressed hard on my larynx. How did you get him to be so unhinged, huh? What makes you so damn special? Calico shoved Neptune aside as she grabbed my cheeks with both her hands. Her dark eyes searched mine, rifling with pickaxes and machetes. It physically hurt having her stare at me. It hurt because I saw past her envy and witnessed the panic within her, the need to be acknowledged, to be known. She was just a plaything here, nothing to the man she'd stupidly fallen for. I pitied her because I saw a lot of myself mirroring back, but despite our similarities, I would never go to the lengths she had. I would never hurt another just because they'd been chosen and not me. I bared my teeth, biting at Neptune's hand. She gasped, letting me go with a squeal. Inhaling and doing my best not to hyperventilate, I snarled. Let me go, Calico. She snickered. I don't think you're in the position to give orders, do you? And you're not in your right mind if you think hurting me will make him want you. Her gaze turned sniper sharp. He does want me. I know he does. She glanced at her fellow conspirators. He wants all of us. He needs to keep us. To love us, all we need to do is get rid of you so he remembers that. I turned cold. 
Get rid of me? Jupiter's fingers tightened on my wrists. You didn't think we could let you stay, did you? Not after you fucked him. You've had your turn. It's ours now. Calico pressed her fingers into my cheeks until they turned hollow and dug painfully into my teeth. How did it feel to have him inside you? Her question was borderline manic. A girl who'd been traded and used for almost four years. An addict, force-fed elixir and lust. A woman broken by Sully's so promised paradise. I allowed my fight and retaliation to bleed from my pores, to speak from the heart. Ripping my face from her painful grip, I murmured, I'm sorry if I hurt you. I'm sorry that you've been trapped here and no longer remember the outside world. I'm sorry. Her strike shut me up. Blood bloomed in my mouth from where she'd hit me. My temple pounded and a headache brewed instantly. Don't you dare feel sorry for me, bitch. Feel sorry for yourself because you might have been the first to have him, but you won't be the last. Unlike you, you greedy slut, we'll share. We're sisters. We know what it's like to be a family, and Sully is our family. You are the outsider who doesn't belong. I glanced up through a black spotted haze just as Calico nodded at Jupiter behind me. My hands were released, my imprisonment replaced by something silky and strong slipping around my throat. A sinister garrote ready to strangle me like Sully had. Only difference was, his strangulation had been potent with desire and orgasms. This was buried in decay and tombstones. I choked as Neptune disappeared behind me, adding more weight to the scarf or sash around my neck. My nails clawed at the entrapment, scratching my own skin in desperation for purchase. My nape dug into the tree, the beads of my spine crying out in agony. My hair clung to my sweaty shoulder blades as panic roared to life. I kicked and wriggled. I squirmed and clawed, doing my best to get free. I croaked a scream. I cried hot horror. And Calico watched it all. Her face smoothed out the more mine twisted with terror for error. She lost her mania, switching into a sympathetic witch. It's okay, Jinx. You'll go to sleep soon and you'll be free of this place. We're doing you a favor, don't you see? You'll be free while the rest of us will still be here, fucking men we don't want, begging for sex we don't need. She had the audacity to lean in and kiss my cheek, her breath skating over my skin as my energy quickly depleted, and my lips gasped for air. We'll take care of Sully. Don't worry. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. My knees buckled as my body boycotted the impossible, tasting death and howling for it to wait, to not take me, to choose a different victim. But slowly, systematically, it slipped around me. It muted the outside world, amplified by chugging, failing heartbeats. Blindness feathered around my vision. The last thing I saw was a falsehood granted by my dying subconscious, a final farewell to a future I'd tried so hard to claim. Sully stood in a gap of the jungle, two parrots winging crazily around his head, forearms bare, shoulders braced, legs spread in savagery. And then I saw no more. Sullivan, Chapter 10 Skittles attacked me on Sarah Gala because she believed I hurt Eleanor when we'd been so, so close to having sex. She did the same thing as I stood on my ledge, keeping myself in place with sheer willpower as the helicopter blade slowly gathered speed and yanked Roy Slater from my island. The tiny parrot, who was normally so passive, arrived with a cyclone of feathers, bites, and claws. Hey! I threw up my arm as she tore at my ear, shooing away in the direction of the path before repeating her dive-bomb attack. Pika tried to intercept her carnage, only for her to turn vicious on his playful antics. Either Skittles had suffered an aneurysm and had a total personality switch, or... Eleanor. I bolted in the direction Skittles seemed desperate for me to go. She squeaked and cawed, soaring ahead of me now I'd gotten the message. I could barely keep up, sand flying from my shoes, Pika joining us in our hurry. I would have missed them if it hadn't been for Skittles, if the tiny, 
Loyal, beautiful bird didn't zip into the undergrowth where a few purple orchids had been crushed by women's feet. Thanks to her, I stumbled on a murder in progress, and the rage I'd done my best to eradicate thanks to talking to my brother sprang into an uncontainable miasma. I saw red. I tasted blood. I shut down. Skittles didn't wait for me to kill the goddesses. She took it upon herself to shoot forward, pecking at the eyes of the two girls trying to strangle Eleanor with a goddamn scarf. Neptune winced and ducked her head, keeping her focus on pulling with all her weight on the scarf. Skittles kept them distracted while I followed with measured footsteps. My fists curled until my knuckles popped, my heart beating both wildly and not at all. I was fire and ice. I was monster and man. I was afraid of what I'd do because all I wanted was their chests ripped open, their entrails on the dirt, and their mouths open in pitiful screams. A twig broke under my shoe as I closed the distance between us. Jupiter looked around the tree, her gaze snagging with mine. Instantly her complexion turned snow white, all pigment in her flesh retreating inside, as if fortifying the organs I was about to massacre. Skittles flew into the branches above, sitting next to Pika, ready for me to deliver messy consequences. Neptune was next, releasing her hold on the scarf around Jinx's throat, removing the barrier that kept her upright. Eleanor tumbled to the ground. Weightless, elegant, a folding waterfall of legs, torso, and arms until she laid sprawled and eyes closed in the bracken. Seeing her like that? Seeing the redness around her throat and the paleness of her lips, it smashed through yet another wall around my heart. It destroyed my lies that whatever I felt for her would fade. It obliterated my assurances that I would get over her. It forced me to admit that I would do anything for her, be anything for her. I would fucking slaughter every fucking buddy for her. Starting now. Up till that moment, everything had seemed in slow motion. The world had been replaced with molasses and mud. But with that arrow of self-truth, it turned into quicksand. Cascading through an hourglass, tick-tocking the wasted time that I needed to save her. I didn't remember much after that. Skittle screeched as I snatched Calico's hair and ripped her backward. She yelped in surprise as I spun her around, wrapped both hands around her throat and squeezed with no fucking mercy. She hung in my hold, her sharp fingernails leaving crimson furrows on my knuckles. Her eyes begged. The gristle in her neck gave way under my strength. Her body went from fierce to floppy in a heartbeat. Breathing through flared nostrils, I let her go the second she turned lifeless in my grip. She flopped to the ground, matching Marionette to Eleanor's unconscious form. Unlike Eleanor, who stayed in the front of my mind— a glowing sacrifice I had to get to, had to save. I forgot about Calico the moment I stepped over her and prepared to punish the other two. Jupiter burst into tears as I closed the distance between us. Neptune fell to her knees, her hands in prayer, her lips white. Sullivan, please, please don't hurt us. We are— I backhanded her. Hard. So fucking hard. Her head whipped to the other side, and her body flayed in rhythm, crashing her to the ground. Jupiter stayed standing, swaying with terror, her tears raining. My blood raged spluttered a little, allowing mercy to filter through the murderous haze. I snarled through gritting teeth. Why? She blinked, sending another gush of tears to stain her cheeks. Because... Because you never looked at us like you look at her. Neptune slowly pushed herself from the dirt, cupping her swollen cheek and daring to look up at me while weaving on her knees. We love you, Sullivan, please. I laughed mercilessly. Love? You think this is love? We do anything for you. We obey every command. We're yours through and through. Eleanor moaned. Oxygen filtering back into her body, keeping her alive. Love. I'd refused it my entire life. I'd ignored its insidious pull toward Jinx. But she was right. It might not have been instant love when we'd met, 
but it had been instant something. And for the first time, I wanted to fight for that instead of killing it. My hand lashed out, pushing on Jupiter's slim shoulder until she kneeled beside Neptune. Both goddesses trembled, but they never looked away from me. Good. I had their full attention. With explicit lewdness, I grabbed between my legs. I fisted the bulge that I'd caught them staring at. I activated pain from sleeping with Eleanor. I waited for their eyes to skate down to my grip before inching nervously back to my gaze. With their full concentration burning holes in my flesh, I growled, This is what you want? This cock that you think has the power to grant your happiness? Their shoulders rolled, and shame dotted their cheeks. We just want you to love us. There's that nasty word again. My arm shook as I squeezed myself harder. My gaze fell to Eleanor, and a supercharged, thousand-wattage electrical bolt stopped my heart when her gray eyes opened. Her eyebrows furrowed as she slowly returned from death, blinking away lethargy and strangled smog. While she still danced on the border of awake and dormancy, I locked eyes with the two murdering goddesses. I jerked my arm, my cock still throbbing in my grip. This belongs to her. It was always hers. You didn't stand a goddamn chance before she arrived, and now that I've found her, you've lost forever. Neptune bowed her head. Jupiter stopped crying, her despair quaking until her teeth rattled. Letting my cock go, I fisted the shirt over my heart and confessed to them, even if I would never have the balls to confess to Eleanor. And this... This also belongs to her. No one else, do you understand? It happened against my will. It happened despite your tricks. It's done. And no matter your schemes, it can't be undone. Which means you've just signed your death warrants. Because how can I let you live after you tried to kill the owner of my goddamn heart? It was Neptune's turn to cry. Big droplets spilled from her eyes, dripping into the curve of her mouth. We're sorry, Sullivan. We made a mistake. You did. A huge fucking mistake. I nodded and dropped to my knees in front of them. Calico remained in the dirt that had become her coffin, but there were two other goddesses to end. Don't. We promise we... I cut off Jupiter's plea with a hand around her throat. Two hands curled around two necks. If I had another weapon... I would have used a different method of extermination. I was tired of such gentle homicide. A blade would be sharp and deliver a quick message. A gun would be brutal, sending them to the afterlife with a squeeze of a trigger. Strangulation was personal. Far too intimate with the way my skin glued to theirs, their pulse hammering against my fingers, their feeble attempts at freedom leaving marks upon my body. They both thrashed, both scratched, both tried to run, but my arms were strong from scaling waterfalls and miles of swimming, my fingers ruthless in power. I kept squeezing until their attempts at breathing grew weaker. Footsteps crashed through the jungle, trading the pristine path for unkempt growth. Sir, stop. Sir, Cal's insider joke. He liked to call me sir when he believed I needed reminding of my place as ruler, either as a mockery because of how high and mighty I'd acted, or a slap to make me human after slipping into hell. I'd never liked him calling me sir. It unbalanced our friendship. But in that moment it did exactly what he'd intended. It woke me back up. It brought me back. I ripped my hands from the two girls just as they toppled into silence. Ah, oh, shit. He jogged to my side as I stood up, rubbing sweaty palms on my trousers. The heat of their terror still soaked into my palms, twisting my guts. I'd killed women before. But only those who'd proved too far gone to be redeemed. Jupiter and Neptune, they weren't evil. Just two girls who had the unfortunate fate of being sold to me. Cal slammed to his knees laying both on their backs and performing CPR, going between the two. 
I grabbed my phone and called Dr. Campbell. He answered on the first ring, as if he'd sensed I'd done something monstrous. Bring four stretchers and staff. You have a few patients to attend to. We're off the path by the main beach. I hung up before he could ask questions. He'd give me grief about this. He might even quit. But as my eyes once again landed on Eleanor, I didn't give a fuck. They deserved their lesson even if I wasn't owed their life. I honored the value of Goddess Jinx, the girl who could never know the power she held over me. Going to her side, I helped her into a sitting position. You okay? She groaned and rubbed her throat, swallowing a few times before croaking. Yes, I think so. Looking past me, she blanched. Oh, God. Sully, what did you do? I didn't look over my shoulder at the three bodies. They hurt you. They were punished. Cold. Factual. The truth. Eleanor. Chapter 11. Dr. Campbell kept me for observation for three hours. He flatly refused Cal and Sully to enter his surgery after he witnessed the four of us, all with fingerprints around our throats, all strangled to unconsciousness, all at the mercy of a monster. Only difference was Sully had touched me with aggression in the height of lust. Our pain was mutual, our pleasure shared. Unlike the three goddesses who he'd almost killed, they'd had no mutual lust. They'd felt nothing but fear. I knew I should feel vindicated. I should be honored by what he'd done to extract vengeance in my honor. Instead, I just felt terribly sad. Sad for them. Sad for him. Sad for this whole messed up island. Are they okay, doctor? I asked quietly as Dr. Campbell returned from the closed door leading to where Jupiter, Neptune, and Calico had been taken. I didn't remember anything after I'd passed out. The next recollection I had was waking up here with a splitting headache and very sore neck. He smiled gently, his weathered face crinkling behind his half-moon glasses. How are you? That's the answer I'm more interested in. He came over to me, ignoring my inquiry. Taking my wrist, he counted my pulse before smiling gently. Your vitals are good, and your tests came back clear. I'm confident you'll be no worse for wear. And them? Will they be all right? His gaze shadowed. Maybe it's time to send you back to your villa. You can continue recuperating in a nicer environment than a boring doctor's surgery. My temper grew a little. Will you tell me how they are? He patted my knee. In a little while. Patient confidentiality and all. His refusals made my thoughts go wild. Had Sully killed them? Had Cal failed with the CPR? Oh, God. I agreed they deserved to have consequences. After all, they tried to kill me. But murder? It sat like a slime-covered boulder in my belly, seeping noxious worry into my blood. Was Sully that literal? That black and white? A life for a life. The awful part was I already knew he was capable of such a thing. I'd sensed it the moment we met. He lived his life firmly between those two colors. There were no shades of gray to him, no leniency or second chances. My stomach clenched. I'm going to be sick. My body wanted to expunge the slime inside because how could I be in love with a man who could be so vicious? A man who could kill so easily that it didn't steal a large chunk of his soul? I didn't find that romantic. I found it barbaric and, frankly, fucking terrifying. If he could eradicate three women who'd lived with him for years, what would he do to me if I did something he didn't approve of? Was that why he was so adamant against feeling something for me? Because he knew what he was capable of? That the first sign of an argument or disagreement could result in my heart being stopped by his ruthless hand? I trembled in silence as Dr. Campbell picked up the phone by his desk and called someone to escort me to my villa. For the first time, I wanted that someone to be anyone but Sully. I'd be fine with Arby, the over-diligent third-in-command. 
I'd be fine with Cal and his cool mocking stare. I'd even settle for one of the many inconspicuous guards who patrolled the shores, keeping us safe, but also preventing us from swimming away. But of course, my wishes went unanswered. Ten minutes later, the door opened and Sully appeared. My breath caught as the full power of his presence struck me dumb. Even with my fear of his behavior and the residual panic of being attacked by his goddesses, I couldn't ignore the chemistry between us. The undeniable, unsurpassable, blistering connection. I've been sullied by Sully in every possible way. Mentally, physically, emotionally. I'd permitted him to break me apart and make me forget who I'd been. I'd turned my back on what was right and wrong. I'd willingly relinquished my chance at escape. I sat on a gurney where I'd been treated for almost death, and I still couldn't control my stupid skipping heart. What's wrong with me? He stalked toward me, amplifying my shakes. His dark hair with its island bronze tips was raked back and damp, either from a swim or a shower, and his skin glowed with a handsome tan. His jaw clenched as he came closer, his blue eyes turning unreadable. He no longer wore a suit, but chose casual faded jeans and a black t-shirt, almost as if he no longer wanted to be the godlike creature he became when he wore a suit. He looked normal. He looked contrite, but also fully justified. His hand reached to touch my cheek. I flinched back. We both froze, our eyes dancing over each other's, shouting messages, understanding painful ramifications. His arm dropped and he sighed heavily, pinching the bridge of his nose he didn't speak for a moment before nodding once and striding past me to the room where three other goddesses lay. Was it a recovery ward or a mortuary back there? Were the girls recuperating or spread out in their corpse shrouds? I waited five minutes for his return. When he didn't, my curiosity overrode my concern, launching me off the gurney. My dress fluttered around my legs as I lost vision for a moment from standing too quickly. Apart from a bruised throat and slightly croaky voice, I suffered no long-term effects. I'd lived through worse in Mexico, and I had full intention to follow Sully through the door, to stare at the girls who'd attacked me and reap my own retribution. I'd use words as my weapon. I'd listen to their grievances. I'd do my best to prove I wasn't a threat, even if they perceived me as one. I couldn't help the bond between Sully and me, just like he couldn't help it. But just like he fought it, I intended to do the same thing. Starting now, I would do my best to ignore the tingling awareness and heat whenever he was close, because I had no intention of ending up a silly statistic. Not anymore. He hadn't sold me to Roy Slater, so that meant he'd chosen to keep me. From now on, I would focus on serving out my four years, inching closer to my freedom, keeping my heart far from his control, so I could return to reality and forget this twilight zone of callousness and crazy. My bare feet padded across the sterile floor, past numerous shelving and medical equipment. My hand outstretched to press the door handle, only for it to swing open, returning Sully to my side. I tripped backward, trying to see around him to the girls beyond. He closed the door too quickly, preventing me from knowing. Are they okay? I demanded, balling my hands by my sides. He cleared his throat. I need to get off this fucking island. Holding out his hand, he softened his voice. Come with me. I shook my head. I want to know if they're okay. Why? They tried to kill you. And you tried to kill them. I cursed the jitters in my voice. If that's all that happened, it's even. No debt, no payback. So, are they still alive? He groaned under his breath, then glared at the ceiling. Why are you so fucking perfect? Perfect? I bared my teeth. I'm not perfect. I want them to pay for what they did, Sully, but I don't want them to die. All lives matter, animal and human. He swooped toward me, cupping my cheeks, his entire body trembling. He backed me into a wall, our inertia vibrating a row of shelving, making vials spill and bounce on the floor. I stiffened and liquefied. I hated and lusted. 
His fingers were pure fire, his body unequaled power. I meant, why are you so perfect for me? He bent his head, his lips grazing mine with a kiss throbbing with apology. It started innocent, sweet, gentle. It ended wet, deep, and sinful as his tongue slipped into my mouth, tasting me, almost as if convincing himself that I was still alive, still real. I kissed him back. I hated that I kissed him back. But it was an impossibility to ignore him, to bite him, to deny this unconquerable need. With another swipe of his tongue, he groaned and pulled away. Dropping his touch, he left me glued to the floor with quaking knees and scrambled thoughts. My core clenched for him. My belly fluttered for him. And my stupid, stupid, stupid heart forgave him, thanked him, wanted, wanted, wanted him. In the wreckage of our kiss, he slowly raised his hand again. His brows shadowed his complicated stare, his lips moving just enough to whisper. Come with me, please. I swallowed hard, unable to transform air into proper volume. Where? I murmured. To Leba. What's Leba? I hesitantly put my hand in his. His fingers curled tight, possessive but also kind. His thumb stroked my knuckles as he tugged me to the exit. You'll see. My steps faltered as Sully guided me down a different path and out to a small bamboo pier. Tied at the end was a sleek black and chrome speedboat with a silver lion cresting from a curling wave, and the name Singulat stenciled beneath. I'd expected him to take me to the helipad. I didn't know he had other methods of transportation. Singulat? I asked as Sully kept his possessive grip on my hand, tugging me toward the end of the pier. My bare feet burned a little on the hot bamboo. He wore thin black flip-flops that slapped quietly with each step. He glanced down, slipping a pair of mirror-lensed aviators on his nose. It's Indo for sea lion. I squinted in the late afternoon sun, breathing an embarrassing sigh of relief as Sully lifted me silently into the luxury craft and immediately opened a small cupboard, gifting me a pair of sunglasses and baseball hat, with a matching silver sea lion embroidered on the visor. I took them without speaking, gathering up my hair to poke it through the band at the back of the hat. He watched me the entire time, his attention locked on my hair as it disobeyed me, refusing to fit through the small gap. Here, let me. Slipping behind me, his fingers gathered up the length with a softness he'd never shown before, quietly and meticulously securing each strand. I couldn't breathe. I suffocated as surely as if his fingers were locked around my throat. Each sweep of his touch, each tiny caress on my nape made me wet, made me lightheaded and poured almost travesty on my short-lived convictions of before. I was meant to guard myself against this man, yet here I was fighting every instinct not to swoon in his arms and let him do whatever the hell he wanted. He strangled three girls. He might have killed them. Chemistry or not, I could not forget or forgive. With a thumping heart, I stepped forward, breaking the strings of sizzling contact and gulping down a salt-laced breath. He grunted painfully, then moved stiffly toward the helm. Instruments and fancy monitors hinted at the exorbitant value of this boat, but Sully turned the key and fiddled with dials and buttons effortlessly, signaling he used the expensive vessel often. Where the hell is he taking me? The gentle rumble of the engine was barely noticeable as he cast off an added speed with a throttle, easing out of the small bay. I didn't speak as he captained us through shallow water. I leaned over the side, marveling at the clarity of the sea, revealing colorful coral, sparkling fish, and an inquisitive yellow and black banded sea snake coasting in our ripples. I coughed a little still sore from what happened. Sully's head whipped to face me. I waited for some aggression, some question on my health and vindication of what he'd done. Instead, he forced his shoulders to relax, deleting his tension and returning his attention to the horizon. Seemed talking wasn't the purpose of this trip. Grateful for the quietness between us and the seemingly fragile truce, 
I followed the beautiful sea until it lapped at the shores of the island I now called home. I'd seen it from the sky, walked its paths, swam in its coves, but I hadn't seen it from a distance, hadn't been privy to the true wonder of its existence. Palm trees soared in every direction, some with vines hanging from their sun-straining fronds, others heavy with coconuts. Bushes and smaller trees filled in the gaps below, a spray of yellow, white, purple, and pink flowers, all enticing bees and birds to slurp up nectar and scatter pollen. The sand was crystal white from here, licked with glass-perfect water, while the sun dappled everything in splendor. The backdrop of the turquoise cloudless sky made it seem far too perfect to be real. If it wasn't a prison, it would be a place I would never want to leave, a paradise that could never be lived upon full time, but a dream where you might be lucky enough to visit in your sleep. Two feathered flyers shot from the undergrowth, zooming after the boat as it picked up speed. Pika and Skittles pulled up beside us, their little bodies sleek for air travel, their eyes bright and playful. They kept pace, swift and darting like little dragonflies over the tide. They didn't try to land on my offered hand or return to shore, almost as if they had fun playing chase and loving the novelty of spreading their wings and flying, instead of flitting from tree to tree. I was jealous of their freedom, but also mindful of their limitations. I didn't want them to get tired, and I had no idea how far Sully intended to go. Moving toward him, balancing with the rocking of the boat, I said, Pika and Skittles are chasing us. Do we need to turn back? He turned to watch the two parrots, his lips twisting into a reserved grin. Even with a smile half-committed and extremely rare, it made him nowhere near as malicious. I could be forgiven in thinking he wasn't a killer of women, after all. They can come. Pika often comes with me to labor. It's not far. They can land in the boat if they get tired. I forced myself to relax, choosing a waterproof flocked bench to sit on. So, Le ba is another island? He nodded. Named in Indonesia for which creature? His grin widened. You catch on quick. B. B? Without them, the food I grow would have to be bought from genetically modified seeds that don't allow repeat cultivation. I sourced unaltered crops and keep them going with natural pollination. You're taking me to your garden? I'm taking us for some peace and quiet. Aren't there staff there, too? He clutched the steering wheel as if the thought of dealing with more people pushed him to his limit. They are, but they've been told to make themselves scarce. They'll stay away. Why? Why? He raised an eyebrow, studying me behind his sunglasses. Why don't I want staff eavesdropping and watching us? Why do you need peace and quiet? He chuckled, low and dark. Why do you think? Because you just killed three of your goddesses? His entire body stiffened. Is that why you're watching me? As if I repulse you? Because you think I killed them? Didn't you? I was going to. He licked his bottom lip, tasting different replies. But I stopped in time. My heart jerked with hope. Is that the truth? He turned a little to face me, keeping one hand on the steering wheel and another balled by his side. You want the truth? How about the version where Skittles saved your goddamn life? How about the fact that if she hadn't flown to get me, you'd be dead right now instead of on this goddamn boat? His face blackened, his voice thick with rage. You want me to believe you're so selfless that you already forgive them for almost stealing your life? He laughed icily. That leads me to believe two things, Eleanor. One, you were grateful to them. Because if you're dead, you are free of me. And two, that you didn't fight back because you decided, after I fucked you, that you've had enough of whatever the fuck is going on with us, and you'd rather take the weak way out, the only way I can't fight to bring you back. His words were so sharp, so real, they punctured holes in the boat, threatening to sink us. They had sunk us, not in the literal sense, but in every other sense imaginable. Was Sully finally going to talk to me? Was jealousy wrong when she said I had to give him the guise of a mask for him to be truthful?
give him some option to take it all back if he changed his mind. There was no going back from this. No pretending either of us doesn't feel something. Something that was everything. You're wrong. Oh, yeah? He sneered, his temper turning him cruel. What part? I did fight back. Not that it did any good. I will admit I was weak because I couldn't get free, but there was no way I wanted to die. I leaned forward, gaping my dress, sending a breeze down my cleavage while clutching the bench on either side of my thighs. Why would I give up on us after what we did? Because I proved I'm the one who can't be fucking trusted. He cut the engine with a slash of control, left the steering to the whimsy of the currents, and stormed the small distance between us. Dropping to his haunches, his hands landed over mine, digging them into the bench, blanketing them with power and heat. That damn electricity sparked from the tiniest of tender, arching and crackling, making him hard and me wet, liberating our systems from mind ruled to body consumed. I moaned a little as he dug his touch deeper into mine, activating pain and its duplicitous cousin pleasure. He licked his lips, his teeth flashing as he snarled. Look at yourself, woman. You have perfect indentations of my teeth in your neck. My fingerprints line your throat with such precision they could be used in crime detection. I dread to think of what other wounds I left you with. How sore you are, how swollen. I lost myself in you, Eleanor, and in the process, I lost any sense of worthiness I had left. His hand caught my hair as the sea breeze blew it over my shoulder. His fingers curled deep within the brown tresses, bringing the mess to his nose. He inhaled hard, his chest straining against his t-shirt, his muscles tight and restrained. I hurt you. I hurt those I care about. It's an inevitability. The awful fucking truth. I kill those I love. And if you keep pushing me down this path, if you keep making me care, I'll make you curse the very thought of me. I will destroy whatever faith you have in me. I will snuff out the very heart you're trying to give me. I will do all that because love equals betrayal, and betrayal requires no mercy. Bringing me forward with the rope he'd formed with my hair, he murmured, You'd be better off dead, Goddess Jinx. You'd be free right now if Skittles wasn't so fucking in love with you. We might have been saved from the carnage in our future. He was fierce and frightening, and utterly fearless in his belief. What had he done to be so sure of his actions? Who had he killed in the past? Sully, I... A flurry of green feathers shot past my chin and vanished down the front of my dress. I yelped and fell backward, squirming as Pika wriggled against my cleavage. His talons caught delicate flesh, his wings tickled highly sensitive areas, and the utter stupidity of a parrot popping up from my neckline shattered everything. He shattered the anxiety that crept down my spine. He shattered the agony on Sully's face. He shattered any response to my untimely death and tentative unfurls of new love. Sully rocked back on his heels, his hands cupping my knees for purchase. His touch on my legs and his parrot on my breasts and the weirdness of it all. It mixed with the stress of the past few weeks, the tumbling emotions, the loneliness, the hope, the highs, the lows, the connection. It all went up in a geyser of hilarity. A laugh spilled from my lips. Pika squeaked, preening himself while perching very happily in my boobs. I clamped a hand over my mouth as another peel fell free, afraid I'd offend Sully's seriousness and make him curse me even more. But slowly, he took off his sunglasses. His gaze locked on Pika commandeering my chest. And the strangest thing happened. A moment I never would have hoped for. Sully smirked, then smiled. Then he laughed. He laughed as if he hadn't laughed in decades. Loud and unhindered, masculine and pure. It shoved aside his past sins and removed any doubt of his integrity, of who he was inside. It made my heart burst wide open, straight down the middle, a crack of blood and destiny, drowning in raw, terrified love, leaving me in ruins at his feet. Who would have thought it? 
A laugh was what made me fall head over heels for Sullivan Sinclair. A laugh that jealousy told me was impossible. A laugh that spread out over the ocean. Clear and wonderful. And all mine. Sullivan. Chapter 12. Amongst the mangoes, pineapples, and every other tropical fruit ever harnessed by mankind, I finally found the ability to breathe again. Eleanor strolled ahead of me in the huge greenhouse, transfixed by the simple, wholesome world I'd introduced her to. Heat and humidity hugged both of us, turning the tropics into a damn oven. Her awe when she'd stepped off the boat said she hadn't expected an operation of this size. Yes, this was an island, and yes, its only purpose was to grow vegetables, fruits, and nuts, but it wasn't a tiny paddock in the middle of nowhere. I'd hired the best garden architects from Singapore, men and women who'd started the revolution of growing enough food hydroponically in skyscrapers in the middle of the city to feed the entire globe. They eradicated the need for soil and pesticides. They controlled their environment with certain bugs that starved off leaf disease and minerals in the water to promote full potential of each and every seed. As land was scarce in Singapore, they'd gone vertical. Meanwhile, I had the luxury of space, and housed a nursery where all seedlings were grown hydroponically before some were transplanted into different areas on the island. So far, I'd escorted Eleanor around the Vine Square, where over a hectare of peas in every form shot skyward with their creeper vines. Lavender and honeysuckle dotted between the plants, encouraging insects to visit and pollinate. We'd traveled the huge greenhouses with berries of every description, through the circular terrace where rice and potatoes grew side by side, and past the herb patch where many microgreens grew in conjunction with sage, mint, and coriander. Massive pots held overflowing crops of mescaline, baby lettuce, and bok choy, while a roofed patio protected delicate watercress and bean sprouts. The orchards were next, the manicured rows of almond, hazelnut, and walnut all interlinked and producing bushels of nuts per year. The mandarins, apples, and stone fruits bordered that field, also decorated with pansies, wild flowers, and favorite weeds of bees. I glanced down at my hands as I followed Eleanor. The wounds from the scratches Calico had given me had scabbed, leaving condemning trails in my flesh that cracked when I flexed my fingers. It was only fitting that she'd marked me after what I'd done to her. Neptune and Jupiter were fine. They'd come out of their strangle-induced siesta and were no worse for wear. Like Eleanor, they'd been given a scan to ensure their lack of oxygen hadn't caused brain damage or unseen complications, and comprehensive tests to make sure none would suffer from my rage. However, unlike Eleanor, who'd I'd given my fucking soul to the minute Pika shut down her dress, just daring me to remove him from her perfect breasts, those two had been given different accommodations for the night. The cage Eleanor had become acquainted with now had two new inhabitants. The quarters were tight enough for one. Two would be... uncomfortable. They didn't deserve to die, but they hadn't served enough punishment, not yet. My fingers curled, activating fresh beads of blood to flow from my wounds. They hadn't served nearly enough. They'd hurt her. They tried to murder her. They would no longer be given free reign on my island or treated like goddesses. Their immortality had been revoked. I had plans for them tomorrow, just like Calico. I gritted my teeth. Calico. Unfortunately, I'd hurt her the most. Unwittingly or premeditated, I would never answer that question. But she was alive, and that was all that mattered. I hadn't taken her life but I had taken her voice. According to Dr. Campbell, I'd caused fractures to the cartilage in her larynx, damaging her vocal cords. It didn't impede her ability to breathe, but after an extensive examination, he wasn't sure she'd ever regain the full range of pitch. Guilt had started the moment I'd visited the three goddesses, after he'd called me to take Jinx to her villa. 
Self-loathing had followed swift on its heels when he'd jerked me to the side and given me an ultimatum. Stop who I was. Stop doing what I did. Or he'd quit and wouldn't be quiet about who he talked to. He willingly put himself in my line of fire, knowing I would have to remove his ability to destroy my enterprise, but also hesitant to harm someone who proved as trustworthy as any human could. He at least gave me a heads up about his betrayal, giving me time to fix what I'd broken before I had to deal with him. Eleanor stopped up ahead. Her white and silver dress swung around her hips as she coughed gently and turned back to face me. Her voice held a huskier depth than before, the discoloration around her neck bringing mixed results of shame and desire. I froze as she padded back toward me, her bare feet and slim ankles a fucking aphrodisiac, even though my body hadn't fully recovered from elixir. She licked her lips, smoothing her dress and smiling softly as Pika and Skittles shot past, flying from fruit to fruit, destroying and indulging on whatever they wanted. I waited until she stood in front of me, her gray eyes still molten from our moment in the boat. When I'd laughed, I'd shocked both of us. I'd forgotten I was capable of such a thing. It had felt foreign, wrong, but also familiar. Right. The way she stared at me had ensured, whatever language we'd traded in, steadily learning more phrases, the deeper we fell had switched from unknown into fully understandable. A look wasn't just a look now. A touch wasn't just a touch. I heard what her look said. I knew what her touch promised. And the way she'd watched me as I'd stopped mid-laugh, confused and conflicted, swallowing back the outlandish sensation, had grabbed a bullhorn and told me everything I needed to know. She loved me. Despite what I'd done, because of what I'd done, regardless of who I was and what I did, she loved me. I knew it in my fucking bones, but it didn't mean I trusted it. Not at all. Why should I trust something that was a simple cocktail of chemicals and body chemistry? She thought she cared, but she'd conveniently ignored the circumstances of our meeting and the complications of our future. My own parents loved me, and look at the level of treason they were capable of. She might love me, but it meant absolutely nothing. Changed. Nothing. It can't. Sully. She licked her lips again, swallowing past her pain. I'm honored that you've shown me this place, that I've had the experience of eating strawberries still warm on their stem and cracked nuts still hanging off their branch, but I need to ask something, otherwise I'm going to go crazy. My heart picked up its pace in warning, and I carefully placed my hands into my jeans' pockets. Whatever she asked, I would not lash out. I would not touch her, scare her, hurt her. What do you need to know? Her chest rose as she inhaled a fortifying breath. Please tell me what you're going to do with Jupiter, Neptune, and Calico. I know you think it's weak that I don't want them to suffer, but honestly, it wasn't their fault. My voice slipped into darkness. If it wasn't their fault, then the blame lies with me. Her eyes flared. You say that like you already know it does. I shrugged. I've always been accountable for my goddess's insubordination. If they run, it's because I've trapped them. If they fight... It's because I've placed them in servitude. If they give up, it's because I've taken them away from everything they know and turned their very minds against them. She spread her hands as if lost for words. Then, if you agree, their attack on me ultimately lays blame at your feet, don't you think— She cut herself off, running shaky fingers through her hair that was a damn drug to me. Don't you think they've suffered enough? They've suffered me, you mean. Her back straightened, willingly going to battle for women who'd not only tried to kill her, but had let envy scramble up their own morals. 
Out of everyone I knew, she was the kindest. Skittles saw it. Pika knew it. She had that special gift of empathy that I used to have. Empathy that would get her killed unless she learned to turn it off and protect herself. She fought the urge to fidget, keeping her stare tangled with mine. Living on your island is wonderful. There is no denying that. It's like a permanent vacation where all your wishes are fulfilled, but... They miss their families, their partners, their lives before I stole it from them. I strolled around her, keeping my voice level and cool. They are still prisoners, forced to fuck strangers, given a drug that makes their lust work against them, all while I bleed them of everything they are. She shivered as I ran my fingers through her hair, catching on delicate tangles caused by the boat ride. All while I bleed you dry. She gasped as I kissed behind her ear. The thing is, Eleanor, I don't care. I don't care about them. I don't care that others feel their captivity is cruel and unjustified. I told you when you first arrived that humans are not special. We cannot have two sets of rules, one for animals who we cage and slaughter, and one for us. We cannot bemoan the state of imprisonment and the act of making others do something against their will. Not when we've been forcing creatures into enslavement for millennia. She tried to spin to face me, but I grabbed her nape, holding her trapped before me. I didn't squeeze hard, extremely aware of what her throat had endured, but I didn't let her look at me. This I had to say without forgiveness already shining in her silver-colored eyes. Their actions are entirely my fault. I'm the reason why they felt threatened by you. I'm the reason why they pinned romantic ideals and stupid hope on the possibility of my saving them. I was the one who took their happiness away. Therefore they despised me. But I was also the one who could set them free. Therefore they worshipped me. That constant mix of want and hate turned normal women into scrambled, vindictive shrews who convinced themselves that you were the enemy, not me. You were the reason for all of it, because only you caught my attention, and only you were special. I ran my nose along her shoulder, inhaling the rich scent of orchid, sunshine, and salt. My very island had claimed her as its own, tainting her skin with every scent I adored. And that's the crux of the problem, Jinx. You are special. I have no way of denying that. I can lie and say you aren't, but ultimately we both know you're special. To me. Which means all my laws on equality and humanitarian requirements are total shit, because how can I put you first over them? She trembled again as I let her nape go, permitting her to turn to face me. Thoughts shadowed her features like dismembered ghosts, half-formed and discarded before she finally whispered, you don't have to see such things in black and white, Sully. I raised an eyebrow. No? How would you see it? She shrugged. Biology. Simple biology. When I didn't respond, she added. Just like I get wet and you get hard from a physical or mental stimulation, the heart suffers the same downfalls. You're saying what I feel for you is purely reactionary? Her eyelashes fluttered. What do you feel for me? I asked you on Saragala, and I'm asking you now. I snorted and leaned into her, mixing our body heat and suffering the hiss and spark of awareness. An epidemic over everything that I am. That is what I feel for you. A sickness I can't find a cure for. Maybe the cure is easier than you think. You think we can reverse this? Disease? Now that we've accepted the diagnosis? I think lying about it won't stop the truth. I stiffened. You're calling me a liar? She nodded. Utterly pathological when it comes to avoiding things you don't want to confess. A groan slipped from my lips, fertilizing the ground with all the bullshit I'd been trying to shove into my heart and believe. Stop, just... 
stop. Stop forcing you to admit that common sense says we're absolutely stupid, but we're past listening to that nonsense? Stop being everything I fucking want, without even knowing it. I raked a hand through my hair, my temper spiking. Stop making this impossible for me. I thought this infatuation would cease as abruptly as it had began. I figured the more I got to know her, the more I would be turned off. I'd convinced myself that whatever bond we shared would diminish because there was no other way forward for me. I wasn't planning on discovering that with each conversation, with each new touch, kiss, and whisper that I'd struggle all the more. My infatuation had swiftly become fascination and could quickly mutate into obsession if I wasn't careful. I meant what I said in Dr. Campbell's surgery. Why are you so perfect for me? How could a girl, who'd been born to different parents, raised in a different household, and experienced different things, somehow end up the perfect shape and size to fit into my jagged, haggard edges? My dream fantasy couldn't even compare to her anymore. That hallucination had been based purely on looks I found madly attractive. Now, Eleanor was the very utopia I'd tried to create on my cursed islands. She was bottled elixir and the magic of euphoria, a fantasy manifested into reality. She was inherently, dangerously risky, because unlike euphoria, this had no end. There was no waking up from this. Only death could stop it. Hers or mine. Or both. I'm not trying to make this impossible, Sully. She sighed softly. I'm trying to... Ugh, I don't know. Prove that you don't have to push me away. Prove to myself that I'm not crazy for wanting the very man who bought me. Prove that we're both... not at fault. You're saying there's something else to blame for this? I'm just saying it's nature's way of ensuring survival of each species. She paced a little, needing to move while solving her strange interpretation. Why can't we look at it that way? Her eyes lit up. You've segmented animals from mankind because you see us as the problem. And you're right, we are. Humans are a plague upon resources, environments, and everything else we come into contact with. You're right to despise us as a collective, but you're forgetting one thing. And what's that? I crossed my arms, not liking where she was going, afraid that this would make way too much sense to me, and I'd have no more arguments to brick up my walls. We are still just animals at the end of the day. Nature ensures most creatures pair up for life. They enter into a covenant the moment they meet. They raise a family, they protect each other, they survive because of each other. It's not us, it's nature. Our need for each other is just that, biology. Our affection is biology. This whole damn confusing connection is... I snatched her. I kissed her. I shoved her against the raised garden boxes where seedlings had never seen anything so explicit in their existence and stuck my tongue down her throat. She moaned and kissed me back. Violence with violence. Lust for lust. I kissed her because I couldn't allow her to spill another word. She made it seem so easy, yet it was the hardest thing in the fucking world. Our tongues clashed. My cock thickened. I arched my hips into her belly, blatantly showing her what sort of voodoo she'd cast over me. How much I wanted her, even still sore from elixir. She gasped as I captured her bottom lip with my teeth, biting down, ceasing our kiss with a threat of pain. Her breath skated over my mouth, sweet from raspberries and kiwi fruit. Our eyes opened, so close, too close. Everything was hazy with need, and the gray smokiness of her eyes made me come face to face with the ashes of whatever I had left. Just dust and ashes and the lies I kept telling myself. If I let go entirely, what would that mean? Where would we go from here? What the fuck sort of future would we have? 
I already had complete ownership over her in the form of a trafficker's contract and hefty funds exchanged. I didn't need to marry her to get her to obey me. I didn't need to put a goddamn ring on her finger to keep her forever. I'd skipped past all those silly human rituals and used commerce to secure her instead. While my mind ran headfirst into walls I didn't know how to erase, she pulled her lip from my teeth. Wincing a little, she completely annihilated me by not stepping out of my hold as I expected, but by wrapping her arms around my waist and snuggling her entire face into my chest. Ah, oh, Christ. Her kiss was one thing. Her hug? It fucking demolished me. Towers, barricades, gates, and all, leaving my chest an empty wasteland where my heart lay totally exposed, begging her to save it. I shook as she pressed a kiss into my T-shirt. She murmured something I couldn't hear. My ears throbbed to know to have her be the first to admit that we were well and truly fucked by finding each other. But when I slid my touch under her chin and angled her face to look up, I wish I'd kept her request silent. What did you say? I asked what Calico, Jupiter, and Neptune's real names are. I froze, but answered her question. After all, I'd just familiarized myself with their files since this nasty catastrophe. Calico is Sonia Teo, Jupiter is Lucy Hall, and Nap is Ali Bishop. And what do you have planned for them? I bared my teeth. You won't let that go, will you? No, I need to know. My nostrils flared. I plan on reminding them of their place. I'll ensure they'll never even look at you again. That reminder will keep you safe. She flinched. I know what will keep me safe. Stranding them on an island with bare necessities? Selling them to a guest? Locking them in wire-bottom cages for the rest of their contract? Eleanor sucked in a breath, searching for courage as she whispered. Send them home. It's homesickness that's upset them. They're confused and lost, and seeing us, seeing what we found, it's pushed them too far. She kissed my chest again shivering. They deserve to go home, Sully. Please, let them go. Eleanor, Chapter 13 The atmosphere between us went from tentative truce to dark and ominous. My stupid request to give the girls their freedom smashed apart the strangely sweet aloneness on La Ba ensuring Sully withdrew into himself. He made an excuse of returning home to welcome a new guest, and the rest of our journey was strained and silent. The only sound was the boat, slicing through the sea, so much faster than I'd rowed in my stolen kayak. The sky above had lost its cerulean glow, becoming ebony velvet instead. The moon was absent, but stars made up for its no-show with a spritz and bright scattering of silver lights. Pika and Skittles had snagged a perch on the throttle where Sully commandeered us home, both of them drowsy with their little heads sagging and eyes drooping for rest. I sympathized with their tiredness. I'd been gliding on a false high ever since Sully hinted how he felt about me, but that well and truly popped thanks to my stupid request. He doesn't understand, though. I didn't ask him to give up part of his business— even though a person's life should never be someone's property. I asked him to return what he'd stolen. I also asked out of my own peace of mind and self-preservation. I doubted I'd ever be safe unless they got what they wanted. And they wanted Sully. It was either share himself around, or return them to families who miss them, send them back to reality and not this fake paradise that had the tendency of scrambling thoughts and twisting desires. I dabbled with another request, too. If you won't let them go, let me go. But as the words formed, they burned a hole right through my tongue and into my heart. If I was free, I wouldn't have to watch my back from murdering goddesses. But if I was no longer his, that meant I'd have to walk away from this. 
I'd have to admit that my stay here wasn't just about captivity anymore. It was about fighting for something that could transcend all of that, if we were brave enough to let it. Asking to leave was no longer just about reclaiming what had been taken from me. And staying wasn't about being weak. I was confused. I was awakening. I'd willingly turned my back on my old life and my parents. Oh, God. My stomach ached at the thought of my parents. What were they doing right now? Were they happy? Were they worried? Had they given up or doing everything they could to find me? The sea rocked us, a comforting soothe that reminded me no matter where they were or I was, no matter whatever life experiences my loved ones enjoyed without me, we were never truly apart. The ocean was one large link from their continent to mine. Nowhere was foreign or scary when viewed in that way because everyone on earth was joined in some way or another. Just follow the sea, and even Sully's islands can be found in the vastness of the globe. Glowing lights of villas, restaurants, and night activities for guests twinkled on the horizon, some blotted out by trees, others flickering with fire and welcome. Pika and Skittles took wing when Sully gently plucked them off the throttle and placed them into my lap. With a big yawn and a cute chirp, they left our company and vanished into the jungle of Sully's empire. Odd that I knew the names of his other islands, but not this one. Did it have an endo animal name, or was it just named after his goddesses? The sea lapped at the hull as he positioned us alongside the jetty, shutting off the engine and wrapping a huge rope around the post. After locking up and stowing the key, he strode toward me and silently took my hand. I stood and followed him to the edge of the sleek speedboat, gasping as he positioned me in front of him and lifted me to the jetty. The tingle of his fingers on my waist the effortless strength of his lift. My mouth went dry as he leapt the small distance and gave me a look beneath his brows. I honestly didn't know what that look meant. Mysterious and melancholy, mingled with opinions and feelings that I doubted he'd ever tell me. It had grown late, but I wasn't hungry. After nibbling on fresh produce straight from the source, I felt as if I'd had the healthiest dinner in history succulent and delicious from Sully's attentive gardeners. Then again, with the way Sully watched me, I wasn't hungry for food, but something else only he could give me. Clearing his throat, he strode ahead, expecting me to keep up. He'd taken off his flip-flops and abandoned them in the boat, leaving our bare feet to travel whisper soft in the sand. Stars were eaten up by the canopy of treetops, and cicadas serenaded us with frog ribbits. The shadows of bats started left and right, scooping up tiny insects drawn to their death by lanterns. No kaique parrots to spy on us, no guests or goddesses to break us apart. Just us. Two people. A man and a woman walking in the moonlight on a tropical island. No outside world with its rules and expectations. No reminders that we weren't really a man or a woman but a slave and an owner, Sully and Eleanor. As we rounded the bend that led to the main arteries of pathways, forking to different villas and communal areas, Sully snatched my wrist and stopped me. Looking around, ensuring our aloneness, he backed me slowly, gently against a palm tree. Unlike the first, where he'd grated my cheek into the bark while he sank his hard length inside me, this time he cradled me until the tree took my weight, and he pressed his body against mine. His erection wedged into my belly, his eyes flashed navy in the darkness, and I went wet instantly. We both sucked in a breath as he positioned one hand by my head, looping his fingers through the scattered strands of my hair, and the other caressed my body from my breast to my waist to the junction of my thighs. I bit my lip as he kept me, claiming me like Calico had. Unlike her touch, full of contempt and envy, his radiated with lust and possessiveness. I waited for him to speak or kiss me, but he used silence as foreplay, allowing the muggy air to send shivers down my spine, 
the fine hairs on my arms to stand up and the fireflies that lived permanently in my belly to wake up and start to glow. Not looking away from me, he ducked his knees and shoved his hand under my dress, trailing his strong fingers up the inside of my thigh. My mind went totally blank. No instincts or alarm bells, just black, sinful desire. I was thankful for the tree holding me up, because my legs buckled as his touch crept higher and higher, tracing the dampness of my underwear before inching my lingerie to the side and fingering me. He groaned when he found how slick I was. I thought you'd be turned off by me, after what I said. My mouth only had one purpose, to kiss. Forming words seemed like trying to knot cherry stems with my tongue. I already know what you are. I've already accepted that you're not the savior in this story. He inserted one finger deep inside me, his shoulder arching up, his chest pressing against mine. His mouth hovered ever so close to kissing me as I parted my lips in a wide, soundless cry. You're saying I'm the villain? I shook my head, my hair catching in his hand in the bark. I wanted to reply to somehow soothe the surprising vulnerability he'd shown, but his one finger became two, jolting me with both pleasure and pain. My inner muscles and delicate parts hadn't fully recovered from what he'd done to me while high on elixir. Bruises screamed at their protest. A few cuts stung, but my body produced more lubrication, doing its best to welcome his intrusion rather than fight it. He feathered his touch, massaging some button inside that switched pain into fireworking bliss. You're wet, without me having to slip elixir down your throat. His nose ran along my neck, his teeth grazing sensitive skin. I don't know if I should take that as a compliment or a sign that we're both completely fucked. I moaned as he continued to thrust into me. His forehead landed on my collarbone as his spine bowed. Why did you let me hurt you? Why push yourself at my mercy? His body curled close as if he struggled to stand. My breath caught as he thrust deeper. My moan turned into a groan of discomfort. Because I wanted you to. His head shot up, his brows tugging low. Why? Why? I curled my nose. He wanted to know why when his hand was between my legs. Didn't he know any answer I gave him would be scrambled? I might lie and say I drugged him so he wouldn't sell me, or... I might tell the truth and say I wanted him, regardless of our situation. I might even profess insanity and spout nonsense about feeling something unexplainable, something I didn't feel with Scott or the other partners of my past. I might even ask that same question, fishing for his feelings, intent on dragging them from the sea of his eyes and stranding them on the shore so I knew, knew that I wasn't the only one struggling. Why are you special? His voice resembled crushed up diamonds, a priceless dust that scratched and scared. Who are you, Eleanor Grace? He nuzzled me, his fingers stroking me, claiming. Why are you different to all the fucking rest? I cried out as his touch grew aggressive, halting his sudden desperation for answers I couldn't give him, filling his eyes with self-loathing. My insides smarted, wanting him to keep pleasuring me, but also needing reprieve from being used. He noticed, his fingers freezing inside me. You're still sore? Not a question. An observation of what he'd done to me. There wasn't any pride on his face. No smugness that my body still wore the marks of his takeover. Instead, there was regret and a healthy dose of sincerity that I didn't expect. His fingers withdrew, slowly, reluctantly. Placing my underwear back into place, he removed his hand, letting my skirts fall around my thighs. Rubbing my moisture into the soft material, he murmured. If you weren't in pain and I'd fully recovered, I'd be inside you right now. I honestly don't know how I'm not. His stare locked on my mouth. But I've already caused you enough misery. I won't expect you to fuck me again so soon. 
Part of me wanted to nod in gratefulness. The other growled with frustration and stomped her foot. He was being a gentleman now, after all the other explicit, exquisite moments between us. Dropping his hand from my hair, he wiped his mouth and shook his head. Removing his hips from mine, he backed up until we stood on almost opposite sides of the orchid-lined path. His chest rose and fell as shadows cast over his gaze. Finally, he nodded as if he'd come to terms with something he'd been deliberating. You win, Jinx. I blinked, unable to move just yet. When? What did I win? He shrugged. I'll do what you ask. My forehead furrowed, rushing over my past requests. The girls, their freedom. I froze. You're letting them go? Shoving his hands into his pockets, he turned, ready to leave. Tomorrow, I'll send them home. I'll nullify our contract. I'll accept a loss on my investments. I'll do what you ask, all because the alternative is letting you go. And we both know I can't do that. Sullivan, Chapter 14 Out of three options, I chose the one I least wanted to do. Option one, take Eleanor back to my villa, have a swim in Nirvana, fuck her until we both fell asleep. Option two, Go to Eleanor's villa, have a swim in the sea, fuck her until we both fell asleep. Option three, keep my promise to a goddess who had me by the goddamn balls, and announce the retirement of three immortals. Striding through the darkness, I noticed Nathan Fisher lurking by a tiki torch, smoking a cigar and sipping a tumbler of liquor. He nodded politely. Mr. Sinclair, honored to see you again. His arms spread in welcome. I had no patience for small talk. The man was leaving tomorrow, after an eventful night with Jupiter and his twisted fantasy of my little mermaid, and I had nothing to say to him. I'd taken his money, now I wanted him gone. Just like Jupiter would be gone. Little did anyone predict he would be her last guest. Evening? I touched my temple as I continued past, not slowing and pretending I didn't see his... Subtle invitation for me to stop and shoot the shit. My bare feet dug into the sand, propelling me away from the civilized part of my island toward the villa housing the torture equipment of my old labs. Calico had remained in the hospital ward with Dr. Campbell as watchdog. He believed her injuries were worthy of overnight observation. However, the other two would have grown very familiar with each other in Ace's old cage. Bet the chimpanzee was watching him from his grave loving the cruel twist of fate that put humans in the trap that he'd called home for so long. Pulling the key from my pocket, I unlocked the villa and strode in, closing the door behind me. The rustle of bodies rousing from depression pricked my ears. Moonlight shone through the windows, glinting off the many bars and cages, twinkling like their own morbid stars. Sullivan! Oh, thank God! Jupiter struggled to her feet, using Neptune's knee as support. Thank you for not leaving us in here all night. We've learned our lesson. Her hands wrapped around the metal, her face optimistic despite the bruises of my fingers around her throat. Neptune wasn't so trusting. She stayed where she was, the wire floor biting into her blue bikini-covered ass. I kept her stare as I murmured, I'm not here to let you out. Neptune nodded glumly, twisting to look away from me, to stare at the wispy silver clouds crossing the horizon. Jupiter rattled the bars. What? But you have to. This cage isn't big enough for two. It's better than a coffin, don't you agree? I smiled icily, because that was the first alternative, until Cal reminded me that wasted merchandise is wasted money. She winced, her cheeks pinking. What do you intend to do with us, then? Keep us in here forever? I strode around the cage, forcing Jupiter to follow me and Neptune to snag miserable glances in my direction. Not forever. Just until dawn. Dawn? 
Neptune whispered brokenly. What happens at dawn? She wrung her hands. Are you... are you going to finish what you started? I closed the distance in one angry stride. My temper flared, remembering the scene Skittles had dragged me to. The painful witness of Eleanor being strangled by a scarf. Both girls jumped as I snarled. I would like to. I'm not going to lie. Jupiter made a feral noise in her chest. What are you waiting for, then? Just get it over with. I narrowed my gaze on her. She was a beautiful woman. But envy had pinched her lips, and entrapment had sunk in her cheeks. Her original price hadn't been as much as Eleanor's. I'd paid 350000 for her. At twenty-four, she'd never quite lost her hatred for me, even while professing her undying love. In eighteen months, she'd slept with seventy-six guests. I'd given her two weeks to settle into her new employment, and charged fifty thousand for her services. She'd padded my bank balance with close to four million dollars, minus the four hundred thousand I would give her when she left and the purchase price. She'd been a worthwhile investment. Neptune, too. Younger than Jupiter, she'd served sixteen months and had seemed to embrace the lust of elixir. She wasn't the instigator in this. Calico was. Neptune didn't need to go. Without the ringleaders, she would fall back into place with the other goddesses on this island. She might even learn to like Jinx. But Eleanor had asked me to free them. And I fucking promised. What the fuck made me do such a thing? I didn't know. But I wouldn't go back on my word. Unlike other people I knew, I didn't believe in betrayal. But it would be hard to say goodbye to assets that kept me rich. Not that their funds came close to what I earned from my pharmaceuticals and successful breakthroughs in the legal drug market. Then again, running Sinclair and Sinclair Group was nowhere near as much fun as being God on this island. I'll just have to source new goddesses to replace these. Eleanor would most likely have an issue with that. But I stood by my beliefs. Black and white was the only way to view the world, because it ensured all things were usable, killable, savable. A stray dog's life was worth more to me than a goddess's, because the dog had existed in suffering for far longer than my own species. A stray dog's life was worth even more than mine. And that was the goddamn truth. I didn't twist my own rules to benefit me. If an animal was at risk from my existence, I would put myself down. Not them. They came first. Always. Even over Jinx. Where's Calico? Jupiter asked, her dress unable to hide her goosebumps. She's alive. Why isn't she with us? Because I had other plans for her. Her eyes glistened with tears. It wasn't all her fault. I encouraged her. I know she's become a little obsessed with you, but Jinx had it coming. I went deathly still. I suggest you tread lightly, Jupiter. My leash might snap at any moment. She gulped, ducking her head. Just, Calico, she's nice. Please don't hurt us. We promise we won't... Enough. I sliced my hand through the air. Nice or not, Calico had made me the most at almost seven million. Her contract was close to ending anyway. Her punishment wouldn't be in a cage, but being kicked off my island without so much as a goodbye. I would not visit her. I would not give her the satisfaction of seeing my guilt over what I'd done. How much I'd ruined her from the shy, skittish beauty when she first landed— to the bitter, jealous thing she'd become. In the morning, Cal would round them up, give them a bag packed full of clothes suitable to whatever climate home was, and an envelope with two things. One, a thick pile of cash. Not a check or bank deposit. Just fresh, crisp four hundred thousand dollars in American bills. The other was a simple note. A threat, really. A reminder that if they spoke of what happened on my shores, the money in their greedy hands would vanish, their lives would be forfeit. I would take no fucking mercy on their soul. 
but stay silent. Slip back into their world as if they'd been working for an exclusive hotelier who required utmost secrecy for his high-caliber guests. Then they could keep every penny. They could live. They could resume their existence before I got in the way. Clean and simple. For all of us. That note never left the helicopter. Burned to ash as the girls slipped onto a plane and went home. So far, out of the few goddesses that had reached their four-year term and been released, not one had blabbed. Money was a powerful cage, better than any other trap or threat. Jupiter puffed hair from her eyes impatiently. Just tell us what you're going to. You're going home. Both her and Nep jerked, making the cage clang. We're what? I paced around them again, needing to move, excess rage flowing down my legs. After what they'd done, I found it incredibly hard to reward such grotesque behavior. But I was also the catalyst for such actions. So the joke was on me. You can thank Jinx for my leniency. She begged on your behalf. I glowered at their shock and suspicion. The girl they'd tried to kill had proven to be above their pettiness and her selfless mercy. Tomorrow you will leave my shores, all of you. You will never see me or my islands again. I stopped and wrapped my fingers around the bars, making Jupiter slink to the other side. I yanked on the wire, jostling them. You tell your families that you had an opportunity you couldn't refuse. If they pry for information, blame no internet or phone coverage for your lack of communication. If they demand to know details, tell them you've orgasmed with princes and fucked politicians and sucked the cock of billionaires. Willingly, I smirked. Or don't. The choice is up to you. You can tell them whatever you goddamn want. But if you mention my name, my islands, or the other girls in my employ, you won't need to look over your shoulder for retribution. It will come swift and sharp, and your parents will be grieving over your funeral rather than your disappearance. Understand? Both goddesses nodded. We understand. I let my hands drop from the cage. Good. Smoothing out my t-shirt, still smelling Eleanor on my fingers, I muttered, In that case, I owe you an apology and a thank you. I'm sorry for taking so much from you for destroying who you once were. I hope you take this experience and use it to improve your life, to know you are strong enough to endure me. Therefore, you can conquer anything. I backed toward the door. Thank you for allowing me to use you. Turning around, I stalked toward the door. Neptune's voice halted me as I reached for the handle. Sullivan? I raised an eyebrow, twisting to look over my shoulder, waiting for her to continue. Jinx, will you let her go, too, eventually? Why do you care? You just tried to murder her. Nap stood up, rubbing her arms. I care because she's not like us. Not to you, anyway. We were safe, in a way. You barely noticed us. She swallowed before adding breathlessly. You've noticed her, and I don't know if that's a good thing. Cracking open the door, I shrugged. Perhaps she wouldn't leave, even if I did set her free. Jupiter sneered, her anger not appeased with her upcoming demotion. Keep telling yourself that, Sinclair. Convince yourself that someone could love you. That a woman trapped here wouldn't use every trick and guile she has to get free. I smiled until my cheeks threatened to split. You didn't try to get free. No, because I wanted this. I wanted your island, not you. My fingers clutched the handle. Even monsters sometimes find their missing pieces, Lucy. She twitched at her real name. She'd have to get used to it again. Monsters are the ones who die, not end up happily ever after. She crossed her arms. Stop fooling yourself. We never loved you. We despised you. 
And now that you're letting us go, I can be honest with myself about that. Whatever I felt for you, whatever your bloody elixir made me do, I hate you. I bowed, low and mocking. I don't care what you think of me, Lucy Hall. Just remember to keep your thoughts hidden from your family. Otherwise, your freedom will be very short-lived. I left before I could wrap my fingers around her throat and finish what I started. Maybe Jupiter would be the first to be exterminated after her freedom had been granted. I didn't trust her. Then again, I didn't trust any of the girls I released. I kept them under strict surveillance after they went home, just like I kept surveillance on all the families who adopted the rescued animals I'd nursed back to health. My mother had taught me that lesson. Pretend you trust them, but never be so fucking stupid. Goodbye, Sullivan. And thank you. Neptune murmured just as the door closed on two girls, who were no longer my elixir-impassioned goddesses. Thank you? What a sad, misplaced phrase. I didn't deserve thank you. I didn't deserve anything. And that was why it hurt so fucking much wanting Eleanor. I wanted her, but in my heart I knew I couldn't have her. How could I? When I reveled in the misery of others. When I put creatures above humans. When I refused to change who I was. To 89082 at gmail.com from S. Sinclair at goddessisles.com. Subject, three staff required. Hello. I seem to require more housekeepers due to a restructure in my property portfolio. All I ask is they're young enough to work hard, diligent, and obedient. At your soonest convenience. Hitting the enter button, I dug my elbows into the desk. Pinching the bridge of my nose... I tried to squeeze out the headache I'd had since draining my system dry thanks to elixir. My lungs still felt odd from inhaling so much water. I overall needed a reboot from the shit in my system. I meant to email Peter Beck and his team of scientists to potentially scale back its potency. It was never meant to be a date-rape drug on steroids. More like better stimulation than Viagra. To make the user beg to be fucked, but not be so out of their minds they'd literally choose death if it meant the nightmare could be over. I'd almost drowned, thanks to its obsession. If Jinx hadn't pulled me from the bottom of Nirvana, I would be dead, and she'd be free. And what had I done? Stuck my cock inside her the moment I could breathe again. God damn it. Raking both hands through my hair... I peeked at my overcrowded inbox. 1 a.m. and I'd done my best to clear new bookings for guest stays, read complicated in-depth text on another scientific recipe Beck wanted to try, and go over invoices for the copious amount of animal feed I brought in each week for Saragala. The words blurred. I'd done my best to stay busy, so I didn't find myself at Jinx's door, ignoring the fact that she was sore, I was sore, and stuffing my body back inside hers before we were fully healed was not recommended. But I'd gone past sex and become delirious with exhaustion. Pika zipped into my office, his black eyes beady with temper. The second he landed on my keyboard, he stomped around like the mini-dictator he was, cawing and carrying on like a madman. Sleep? Tired? Pika? I groaned scratching at my longer chin stubble from not trimming for a few days. Came to get me, huh? Don't like sleeping alone? He puffed up, eyeing the letter Z and launching at it with his sharp beak. Oh, no, you don't. Picking him up like a fuzzy tennis ball, I kept him cupped in my hand, letting him grumble and growl. Fine, I'm tired, too. We'll go. With my free hand, I went to turn off my laptop. A reply arrived from my goddess request. Huh, that's strange. To S. Sinclair at goddessisles.com from 89082 at gmail.com. Subject, re, three staff required. Your email has bounced due to an incorrect address. Please check and try again. First, they advised their operation was on hold. Now their address was no longer operational? Chills darted down my spine.
Either they'd had a complete change of ethics, or they'd been caught. By the police? By a disgruntled client? Either way, my encrypted internet would protect my location, but I wouldn't take any chances. Doing a search on their email address, I deleted every single trace of communication. My supermarket of endless goddesses had seemingly shut down. Now where would I hunt? Eleanor, Chapter 15 For the first time since arriving, I ate breakfast in a different location to the room-delivered feast on my deck. As dawn sent eager fingers of light through the sky, I gave up the pretense of sleep and headed for a long shower. I shared the cascading water with two frogs, courting each other on the rocks, catching doomed flies and the odd mosquito with their sticky tongues. While I shampooed and conditioned, I did my best not to think about Sully, to wonder what he did last night, to try to find him this morning and spend more time with him. Simple time. I wanted simple. I wanted to be two people talking about mundane, normal things, if that's even possible. After I rinsed, I stepped from the shower and turned my back on my reflection. I flatly ignored the purple slashes on my throat from a scarf pulled far too tight. And I didn't bother drying my hair, preferring to leave it loose and long, draped down the back of a simple cotton maxi dress. No jewelry, no makeup. Just me. Vulnerable, but also strong. Naive to have fallen for a man I should despise, but willing to accept the consequences. Brave enough to embrace the war wounds of disgruntled goddesses to move forward with my life. The island had a hush about it as I stepped from my villa and padded barefoot toward the divinity building. The wariness of another attack kept me on my toes as I peered suspiciously into bushes and flinched when Skittles arrived from the golden sky, chirping in welcome and landing weightlessly on my shoulder. Her presence might be minuscule, but knowing I had a friend who had my back made my steps stride bolder and my skittishness fade. The girls who tried to kill me had been released. I hope. Sully had said he would, and I didn't see him as a man to break a promise. I'm safe. I rolled my eyes as I left the pathway and climbed the decking-covered steps of divinity. Safe? How strange that I considered myself safe when women had been kicked off the island, the very same island where men came to fuck drugged goddesses. Not only had my morals leaped off a cliff of comprehension, but it seemed my concepts of health and safety had too. Ah, uh, well, what difference would it make to my situation if I remained fixated on escape and refusal of my feelings towards Sully? It would only make me frustrated, sad, and angry. I couldn't even lie and say my seduction of Sully was to gain my ultimate release, because the thought of leaving now? That hurt, almost as much as the thought of what I'd been bought for. Skittles tweeted and nibbled at my earlobe as I entered the shadowy dining villa and inhaled the scents of fresh baguettes, almond croissants, and all the fresh fruit Sully's gardens could produce. A staff member appeared from swinging doors leading to the kitchens. Morning, goddess Jinx. Are you okay helping yourself to the buffet on offer, or would you rather the chef cook you something? Migoreng, perhaps. Loaded with baby sweet corn, fried spinach, and bamboo shoots? Her gaze landed on Skittles preening herself on my shoulder before finding my eyes again. I smiled. That actually sounds lovely. Thanks. She nodded. You're welcome. Please sit wherever you like. I'll bring it to you soon. With another grin, she disappeared back into the kitchen, leaving me to pour a glass of freshly squeezed watermelon juice from the icy carafe on the sideboard. No other goddesses had appeared yet, granting the odd sensation that I was the only one on this island. Taking my glass outside, I chose a table on the deck next to a tiny lily pond and a large black umbrella. The sun had already added warmth to the world around me, ensuring shade was needed from getting burned. Serenity comforted me as I nursed my drink, wincing with each swallow from the strangulation bruising, watching the island wake up, 
hearing birdsong tremble from treetops and enjoying the humid breeze rustling glossy leaves of hibiscus and heliconia. Life seemed brighter today, more vibrant. Was that from the near-death experience or knowing Sully might, possibly, hopefully, tragically, love me? It was far too soon to admit such insanity, far too quick to trust, so why couldn't I stop the hot ball of infatuation in my heart? Why couldn't I stop my gaze from trailing down the path, hoping he'd appear to share breakfast with me? Because you're an idiot. But I had come to terms with that. By the time my breakfast had been cooked and delivered, I'd relaxed into eating alone. Skittles hadn't budged from my shoulder, and I shared tiny morsels of veggies with her, not caring that I ended up with spinach slime on my shoulder from her messy eating. The aloneness was nice. Not even jealousy appeared. I had so much to tell her. The strangulation attempt, Sully's laugh, and my decision to fight for us. But it seemed no one was a dawn bird on this island, all preferring to be night owls instead. Jinx. I spun around, expecting to see jealousy arriving for breakfast. Only it wasn't jealousy. Another girl who'd been with Calico and her crew when Sully had cornered me at Divinity and given me the diamond skipped to a stop in front of me. Chestnut curls and a splattering of freckles on her button nose said her skin would turn into a piece of goddess jerky if she didn't live in a bottle of sunscreen lotion permanently in this sort of weather. Her rake-thin frame had a certain sexiness about it, a model type of wraithness that looked both elegant and breakable. What was her name? Jewel? Hey, she smiled. Her green eyes were clear of any maliciousness that'd been there when Calico had been leader of the entourage. Do you want company to eat? I'm starving. She leaned closer. I was in euphoria last night in a thruple fantasy. Let's just say Elixir has kicked my ass. She winked. I didn't trust her friendliness, but I wouldn't openly state that. I shrugged with a smile. Sorry, I just finished. I was going to have a swim before the sun got too intense. Skittles cackled and chirped in my ear, not liking that she had to share me with a new human. With a huff, she took off, vanishing into the palm trees. I sighed, missing her tiny comfort already. Seemed her favorite pastime was hanging with me, but the minute another arrived who wasn't Sully, she wasn't a fan. Oh, wow. Is that Sinclair's parrot? She peered into the cloudless sky, trying to see where the little emerald bird had shot to. How did you get it to do that? I shook my head. It's not Pika. Skittles does belong to him, too, but she's kind of adopted me. Her nose wrinkled, eyeing the green stain on my shoulder from Skittles' breakfast. Don't her claws dig into your skin? Sometimes, but they're not sharp enough to pierce. Does it poop on you? I laughed, wondering if this conversation had any purpose and how I could extract myself from it. Not yet. Think she's pretty house-trained. Jewel nodded as if she accepted my oddness. Her brows tugged over her eyes as she leaped toward me, her body language switching from open to full of conspiracies. Did you hear the helicopter take off before? I shook my head, fighting my skin's reaction to shiver at her closeness. No. Another guest leaving? No. A goddess. Three of them, actually. Calico, Jupiter, and Neptune were all stuffed inside, and now they're gone. Her teeth sink into her bottom lip in worry. Do you think... You don't think Sinclair is getting rid of us, do you? I mean, Calico is almost up for going home, but not the other two. Why would he take them away? Is he selling us to other people now? Her facade fell completely as she confided. I've only just accepted this as my life for the next little while. I do my best to fit in with others, even if I don't want to seduce the monster who were in my life, but I'll do it if it means he won't sell me like he did them. She shuddered. We have it easy, Jinx. 
If he sells us, who knows where we'll end up, what will happen to us? Tears welled in her green gaze. At least we have an end date here, you know? Four years isn't so bad. It feels long, but really, it goes fast. Her tears overflowed. Do you think we should hide? Should I go tell him I'll work twice a week? I mean, I don't know if my system could handle elixir twice a week, but I can fake it for a guest. I can make them believe I want them without needing to be drugged out of my mind. I stood, locked in the sand, watching a seemingly brave girl come apart at the seams. Any hint of frivolity of before was in tatters as whatever needle and thread holding her together burst apart. I'm so afraid of what's going to happen. I don't want to fuck every man on this planet. I don't want to belong to anyone. I want to go home. She dropped her head into her hands, crying loudly. I had no idea what to do. Everything she'd said, I already pep-talked myself over and over with. Yes, we had it lucky here. Yes, it was better the devil you knew than the devil you didn't. And yes, four years was better than an undetermined length of time. And yes, I had seduced the monster who owned us purely so he wouldn't sell me. But how was I supposed to comfort her when I was the reason her friends had been flown away, never to be seen again? Could Sully have killed them? Would he be that ruthless to open the helicopter door at full height and kick them to the ocean below? Would he tell me he'd release them, but really lie to my face and release them some other way? No. If I started suspecting him, who knew what that would mean for us? He had a fierce phobia about anyone betraying him. Therefore, it would make sense that he would go out of his way to remain loyal to those he made promises to. And he promised. With a sigh, I stepped into Jewel and wrapped my arms around her. Hey, it's okay. Don't cry. She only cried harder. Her wails soaked my dress, and her body shook mine as I tried to console her. I didn't know if I should tell her what they'd done to me and why they'd left, whether she'd find comfort in knowing the only reason why they'd been sent away was because I'd asked for their freedom after they'd tried to murder me. Would it make Jewel try to kill me too? Somehow earning a pass home by murder? Instead of messing things up, I kept silent, just offering her my hug to cry into. Footsteps appeared behind Jewel, flip-flops worn by a man, striding with purpose and prowess. I looked up, expecting to come eye to eye with Sully. My heart even hopscotched in anticipation. But just like I'd expected jealousy and ended up with Jewel, I ended up with a guest instead of the proprietor. Shaggy brown hair and a slim physique, wearing denim shorts and a white tee, he frowned and strode faster toward us. She okay? I nodded, running my hand over Jewel's curly red hair. She's fine. Just a long night. The guest clenched his jaw, his brown eyes darkening. Yeah, I had my long night a few evenings ago. I didn't know the girls were drugged so badly. I feel responsible. Jewel froze. Tears streaked her face as she looked up, studying the stranger. How can you say that? You knew what you were doing when you bought a stay on some luxury island where sex is guaranteed to be the best you've ever had. He rubbed the back of his neck awkwardly. Yeah, I know. I mean, call me stupid, but I thought we'd sleep with high-paid courtesans who loved their job. Women who dressed up and acted out the fantasy. Not young girls who become any goddamn thing that a computer program can conjure. Joel's temper matched mine, calling him out on his choices. Whatever your fantasy was, I can assure you it would not have been possible without Sinclair's euphoria codes. And I'm sure you enjoyed every fucking minute of it. He winced. I didn't say I didn't enjoy it, or that I'm not entirely grateful for the girl who shared my desires. He peered at her, studying her face for some hint of recognition. Was it you? His gaze flickered to mine. Or was it? His eyebrows shot into his shaggy hair. Wait. I know you. What? I went ice cold. I frowned and shook my head. 
We've never met. He nodded with more conviction. I saw you. Last night. He actually blushed and cleared his throat. Uh, Sullivan Sinclair had his fingers up your dress and... You're mistaken. I blanched, letting go of Jewel. What else had he seen? Heard? He coughed, ignoring me. He called you Eleanor Grace. Pretty name, by the way. He cocked his head. He seemed to have you trapped against that tree. Jewel crossed her arms, looking me up and down suspiciously. Seems you've already begun safeguarding yourself. Did you sleep with him, Eleanor? I'd heard the rumor that redheads were fiery, but her personality flips from sweet to sobbing to sharp made my mind whirl. The guest forgot about her, pushing himself between me and Jewel and grabbed my shoulders with eager fingers. Look, I can get you off this island. If you're trapped here, if you're held against your will, I can get you help. I struggled to get him off me. Let go. But I want to help you. I don't need your help. We do. We really do. Jewel popped up beside him, her green gaze flicking quickly from him to me. We're prisoners here. We were bought from a trafficking operation. We're raped on a weekly basis. She held up her wrist where a matching tattoo to mine and jealousies marred her ivory skin. See? We were bought like a toy, like a blow-up doll. Grabbing his forearm, she hissed. Please get us off this island. Shit. Shit. I fought harder, tripping backward. Let me go. I won't ask again. The man didn't stop clutching me, tripping with me, his face urgent with savior complexes and rapid calculations. Look, you don't have to lie. I know your real name now, and your friend here has told me the truth. Don't be afraid of him. I'm guessing you're his personal fuck toy, that you not only have to sleep with the guests, but him too. He shook me, his fingers digging in deeper. You're brainwashed, Eleanor. You can't see it, but every day that you're his, you're falling into his trap. I'll charter a yacht. I'll come back to save you. Just... No! I shoved him off me, reeling backward. A couple of weeks ago, I would have begged for this scenario, to have a knight in shining t-shirt to profess his allegiance and jailbreak us out. But that was before. This is now. My teeth rattled at how dangerous this was. What would Sully do if he found out? What would this guest suffer? Arching my chin, I said in my snowiest voice, I suggest you go home, sir. Return to your family. Remember your indulgence here and forget about us. No! Jewel grabbed his hand. Please, take me with you now. Take all of us. For some reason, the guest kept his attention on me, as if he pitied me the most, as if he believed that Sully had his fingers inside me last night against my consent. I could see it from his point of view. Of course I could. I was even grateful for his attempt at rescue, but... Where I was concerned, he had it all wrong. I didn't want my freedom because I'd found it whenever Sully touched me. It might not make sense to anyone else but me and Sully, but I would not jeopardize that for anyone, even for my family and friends. I would see them again eventually. Right now, I would be selfish and continue chasing this murky, romantic, sinful path. Leave me alone! I hissed as the man tried to grab me again. I backpedaled as he stalked me. What did he expect to happen? That he'd scoop me over his shoulder and cart me off the island without Sully stopping him? That he could win against a man who had the power of his genius and a bottomless bank balance behind him? Jewel moved with us, frustration at being ignored glowing on her pretty cheeks. I'll go. Take me instead. If she doesn't want to go, then that's her fault. I nodded, holding up my palm as the man tried to catch me again. See? Take her. She'll be grateful for your help. I'm staying. I want to stay. Don't you understand? I realize that sounds crazy to you, but I'm not going... He launched at me, snatching me into him. He hugged me as if expecting me to break down in the same fashion Jewel had. It's okay. I've got you. It's okay. You don't have to lie anymore. I snarled in his ear. Let me go, you bastard! 
Not until you admit to yourself that you're being fucked left, right, and center by fucking assholes, and you're so brainwashed that you think you like it. I'm not. You don't know anything about... You are! How do you know I didn't fuck you the other night? That euphoria abomination can turn anyone into anything? How do you know it wasn't me? I think it was you I was with. We shared a moment, remember? I hugged and kissed you and told you I'd fallen in love with you, and you asked me to help you. You straddled me and said you'd be mine if I ever found you outside of that world. He crushed me harder to him. I bit his neck, doing my best to get free. Let go of me! It didn't stop him from stroking my hair, pressing my body flush with his. Shush. It's fine. I've got you. I've found you. I'll protect you. Stop! I roared, my temper reaching snapping point. Get the fuck off me! He pulled back, his gaze finally showing pinpricks of surprise. But I... You know nothing! I shoved him away, relieved when he let me go. But Eleanor... Don't use my name. Well, don't be so stupid to think this place is normal. You're a brainwashed, drugged, and raped victim. I'm offering you a chance at freedom. Are you so fucking broken to refuse it? I inhaled through my nose, clenching my fists until my nails dug into my palms. My skin was covered in sweat from fighting off this idiot. My heart raced a gazillion miles a minute. I needed to find Sully. I needed to fling myself at his feet and tell him if he had cameras or microphones on this island, listening and watching to our every move, it wasn't me who told this man my name. He'd done that. Sully. Sully hadn't been careful while he'd kissed me, touched me, bowed to what I'd asked. I didn't want to leave. I fought to stay. He has to know that. I need to find him. Now. Come on. He held up his hand. Or are you too scared to trust? Trust? My spine braced as I lost control, allowing fury to rampage through my blood. Trust? How about you trust what I say? I don't want to leave. You are mistaken. Glancing at Jewel, I tried to swallow back the words, scalding my tongue, but I couldn't. I turned as possessive as Sully toward me. I wanted them to know how wrong they were how I'd found happiness instead of hell, how Sully was mine as surely as I was his. I opened my mouth and... Sullivan, Chapter 16 My name is Eleanor Grace, and I am a goddess on this island. I was bought by Sullivan Sinclair, and I serve at his command, but I... Jinx! I boomed. My voice was a battering ram, a missile, a trebuchet with flaming hot oil and arrows. How fucking dare she? What the fuck was going on? Fucking hell, I was an idiot. A goddamn motherfucking moron. I thought she felt the same way for me, yet here she was, telling a goddamn guest her goddamn name. Telling him how she came to be here, telling him shit that would get him fucking killed. Eleanor spun to face me. Her hair whipped around in slow motion. I loved her hair. I loved her smoky eyes, her sexy voice, her soul. I loved her. And she'd just fucking betrayed me. I laughed at the absurdity of it. I laughed like a fucking imbecile because if I didn't laugh, I'd fucking kill her. She was my karma. She'd lived up to the curse that I'd named her after. She wasn't just a jinx, but a fucking pandemic upon everything I had left as a man. Sully. Her eyes flared to silver orbs. Her lips spread in utmost panic. It's not what you think. Please, let me explain. All color drained from her skin. All hope died in her eyes. I knew that look. I'd seen it in possums as they were shot for fur. In pigs as they waited to be gassed in foxes as they ran from the huntmaster. She knew she'd just signed her fucking life away. It's over. Done. The cunt beside her, a guest who worked for a big-time Wall Street exec, who'd told him to grow a pair if he wanted to join the big leagues, grabbed Eleanor's elbow, stopping her from running to me. 
Stop, I'll protect you, I promise. His hands on her. His face, as he looked at me as if I was some despicable creature. His gallant act at saving my own goddamn possession from my brutality. It made my chest fold in on itself in a bloody, gory, agonizing mess. It made me want to fucking slaughter him. Get your hands fucking off me. Eleanor screeched, scratching the man's forearm, granting no mercy with her nails. The guest hissed in pain, recoiling backward. The second she was free, she bolted barefoot toward me and threw herself into the sand at my feet. She clutched my ankles, wrinkling my expensive charcoal suit, smudging my polished shoes. I wanted to be sick. I wanted to finish what the other goddesses had started and wring her fucking neck. I didn't tell him my name. I promise. You did. He heard you last night when we... Get up. Squeezing my fists into boulders, I kicked her away from me. Stop fucking lying. I'm not lying. Her eyes blazed with terror, but no tears rained. This was beyond tears. Her treachery would not be forgiven with such pitiful, unbelievable excuses. I'd gone to her villa this morning to announce I'd done what she'd asked. That Calico, Neptune, and Jupiter had all been returned to loved ones. I'd planned on taking her out on the water. Just us. Just us and vast open waters where we could finally drop our protections and be real. To see if what we felt could be long-lasting. To see if I could trust what she offered me. A chance at happiness. True. Happiness. A date. The first date I would have been on. Because I'd never let anyone get close to me like I'd let Eleanor. I'd gotten my kicks from sex clubs around the world. I'd fucked women who'd remained faceless and distant because I chose that. I chose not to trade emotions. Not to catch feelings that might end up destroying me. I'd been right to be wary. I'd been so fucking stupid to think Eleanor goddamn Grace could cure the burnout that'd steadily been creeping over me since I'd killed my parents. Not trusting anyone was exhausting. Not dropping my guard was beyond tiresome. It'd become debilitating to the point where I craved the ability to set down my grudges and guards, begged for a woman to love me for me. The dark parts, the dangerous parts the parts that would go to fucking war in her honor and place my life at her feet. Eleanor could have been that girl. But she'd proven there was no such girl. No such angel worthy of a monster. No such goddess faithful to a god. My anger blended with heartache. I studied her, bowing before me, drenched in my shadow. And I felt empty. Achingly furious and murderously mad, but beneath that heat was the ice-cold dagger of delusion. Just like my dream girl, Eleanor had turned out to be a fiction of my idiot hopes. Bending down, I wedged my knuckles under her chin. She shivered as I arched her throat up, not caring that she winced from her bruises, not stopping even when pain flared in her gray gaze. She'd caused me untold misery. The least she could do was feel a little discomfort. First, you make me release three perfectly trained goddesses. You cost me a fucking fortune. You use the power you have over me against my business and livelihood. She swallowed hard as I cupped her chin, holding her firm with cruel fingers. And now? Now you want off my island, too? I bared my teeth. You tell a guest your name. You inform him of our little arrangement. You sign his death warrant as well as your own. Sully, please. She reached up to touch me, but I snarled in warning. Touch me and you won't like the consequences. Her hand dropped into her lap. Her eyelashes feathered down, hiding the turmoil in her stare. Are you determined to free all my goddesses? I whispered. You think you're saving them from the cruelty I've caged them in? She tried to shake her head, words tumbling from her lips. I don't want to leave. I fought him to stay. He tried to take me away. 
Ask Jewel. Ask him. I'm telling you the truth. The truth? I shook her, making her eyes snap close with a wince. The truth is I think you believe you've got me so wrapped around your little finger that I'll do whatever you damn well ask. I kissed her cheek, not with affection, but pure intimidation. That you're above my retaliation? No, I don't think that. More words spilled in a rush. You arrived before I finished. I was going to tell him that yes, he knew my name, and yes, we might have been brought here against our will. Jewel showed him her tattoo and told him about the traffickers, but none of that matters, because I've fallen in love with you. That I have no intention of leaving because you are worth fighting for. I did fight for you. Ask him. Ask him how many times I told him to remove his touch. I was going to turn around and run straight to you. The moment I said my bit, Sully, I swear. Tears did start now. The cracking of her heart and soul in each crystal droplet. I love you, Sully. I'm in love with you. You have to believe... Believe? I ripped my fingers from her face. I believe this is another trick. Just like you tricked me into removing three goddesses. You're so determined to free everyone, Jinx. Fine. Be my guest. You can do all their workload. You can serve every fucking night in Euphoria and see if I give a damn. And this time, it won't be me. You have it wrong. Just listen. Leave her the fuck alone, Sinclair. Adam Marks the wannabe con man and Wall Street wolf, finally decided to step forward and stand up to me. It's true what she said. I saw you fingering her last night. I heard you use her name. I froze. You spied on us? He scowled. You were pretty hard to miss on the main pathway. Yet you stayed to watch? I cocked my head. Why? Thought you could fuck her after I was done? He bristled. No. I stayed because I needed to get past you to go to my villa. In the time it took to decide if I should find another way around, you'd finished. I'm surprised you didn't follow her, to see if you could sample what I had. He shook his head. You really are an asshole. Pointing at Eleanor, he snarled. She's obviously telling you the truth. She did fight me. She went against all reason when I offered to take her away from here. He rolled his eyes. Personally, I think she's been brainwashed to the point where she's unsavable, unlike the other girl here. He pointed over his shoulder at Jewel, who wisely stayed silent and still. She was all for my rescue attempt, but not that one. He sighed, looking pityingly at Jinx. Whatever you've done to her, you've broken her heart and soul, Sinclair. She genuinely believes she loves you, and all you can do is threaten to let a thousand men rape her. Wiping his mouth, he backed away, his face going slightly green. You know what? I want off this place. I'm getting my bag and I'm leaving, right now. My temper hissed and lashed in my veins, my voice a howling blizzard. Great, I'll arrange the helicopter for your departure. His shoulders braced as he prepared to deliver an ultimatum. An ultimatum I'd heard before from men who'd fallen hook line and sinker for their goddess, men who thought they could make a difference when they were part of the problem. Their morals might have suffered an awakening after they'd spent five hours fucking a girl out of their mind with lust, but they'd still paid, they'd still traveled countless miles to indulge in my paradise, and they were still guilty as fucking sin. Human to the end, selfish to others' misery, blind to others' suffering as long as it benefited them. Smoothing down my lapels, I cricked my neck and let the blizzard in my tone fade into the aftermath of thick, white-out snow. Before you warn me to stop my operations, Mr. Marks, before you conjure some way of threatening me, allow me to remind you of a few things. Stepping around Eleanor, still quaking in the sand, I muttered, You enjoyed yourself immensely with Goddess Sailor the other night. Your DNA is still in her body. I have footage of you fucking her. I have dossiers of your fantasies. I have a background check of who you truly are. I have enough evidence on you that if you tell the police about my enterprise, you will be equally implicated and be arrested for similar crimes. 
The only difference is, I will get away with it, and I will ensure you will not. You will kiss goodbye to your climb up the shit-stained ladder of Wall Street. You will never have that private plane your girlfriend has already reserved online. Speak of what you did here, and I will fucking bury you. I stepped into him, my height placing me at least three inches over his eye line. I looked down, smiling a cordial, gentle smile. Oh, and by the way, another friendly reminder, you signed an ironclad NDA when you first arrived, remember? I raked a hand through my unruly hair. Not only do you stand to lose everything, I'm also fully within my rights to wipe you off the face of this fucking planet if you break it. Adam Marks gulped. The sheen of sweat on his upper lip glistened. He tried to hold my stare but broke under pressure and glowered at the sand below. Slowly, he gave up his crusade. He stopped trying to liberate Jewel and Jinx and nodded glumly. You win, Sinclair. I'll do what you want and return home with my tail between my legs. Appreciate that, I smiled. Your ride leaves in thirty minutes. He left without another word or look at the two goddesses. The second the jungle had swallowed him up, I pinned my gaze on Jewel. Had Calico's rot spread throughout all my stock? Did I have to replace them with new before anarchy reigned? Or could I talk sense into her later? Pointing at her, I muttered, You and I are not done, Jewel. A little chat is in order. Find me tomorrow and I'll deal with you. She bowed her head. Red curls cascaded around her cheeks. Yes, Sullivan. Blushing with fear, she bolted down the pathway, spraying sand on my purple orchids. When four people had been reduced to two, I turned back to deal with Eleanor. She stood, brushing granules off her knees, her simple dress looking like a robe upon a queen. That damn invisible crown had somehow adorned itself with yet more diamonds, frosting her in courage and transparency. Her silver stare repeated what she'd confessed. I love you. I'm in love with you, despite what you are. She admitted something I'd guessed while on labor yesterday. Yet I still didn't trust it. I didn't trust her. I didn't know if I ever could. Therefore a game was in order. A final game, where I knew all the rules, and Jinx knew none of them. A game that would prove her loyalty, once and for all. Snapping my fingers, I prowled around her and growled, You're serving in euphoria. She gulped. When? Right fucking now. Eleanor, Chapter 17 I padded beside him. I didn't say a word as he stalked mercilessly down the lane. My stomach ached. It burned and snarled, corrosive with denial at how swiftly things had been destroyed between us and full of barbed wire knots at the blistering betrayal in Sully's eyes. The way he'd looked at me, the pain, the absolute horror, had been a gunshot right into my useless heart. Snatching his phone from his pocket, he called Cal as we continued walking in nasty silence. Cal answered straight away, his voice echoing loud enough for me to catch what he said. What's up? Sully's body was a coil, an explosive spring ready to detonate at any moment. Tell the pilots they're due to taxi Adam Marks back to Jakarta. He has a plane to catch. Sure, consider it done. A pause before Cal asked. Anything else? Sully narrowed his eyes, shooting me a glare. Finalize the fantasy for Conrad Smithy. I just finished the coding, but he's not due in Euphoria until tomorrow. I expect it to be loaded within twenty minutes. Okay. Cal's voice changed to suspicion. Why? What's going on? He getting stroppy and wants an earlier fuckfest? Tell him I have a goddess ready and willing. Sully's hand tensed around his phone. Blackness filled his blue eyes as he bared his teeth in my direction. She's willing to work a double shift this week, triple if there are guests requiring special care. Cal stayed silent for a moment before guessing far too much. 
This goddess, it's not Jinx, is it? Sully tore his furious gaze from me, striding faster. I trotted to keep up with him. Partly because I didn't want to make him any angrier than he already was, and partly because I wanted to continue listening to their conversation. The one and fucking only? Sully hissed. She just volunteered. I wedged a fist in my belly. Somehow, even if I hadn't served a guest yet, thanks to Sully's tampering, that seemed like it was all about to change. His temper was a monstrous entity clouding the sky, tainting the air with another thunderstorm. Electricity crackled between us, but this time it wasn't full of lust, but rage. Shards of power crackled over his suit, his movements jerky with fury. He wouldn't forgive or forget, not until I'd sufficiently paid in pain and disgrace. Cal muttered, You let him fuck her and you'll severely regret it. Don't tell me what the fuck I'll regret, Calvin. Sully snarled. Have the cipher ready and keep your goddamn thoughts to yourself. You're the boss, sir. Consider it done. Cal hung up. Sully shoved his phone into his pocket and picked up his pace. I jogged faster, running to my demise, my death, my doom. Go stand in the center. Sully snapped, shoving open the door to the virtual reality playroom of his Euphoria Villa. I didn't try to argue or attempt to persuade him otherwise. The Sully who dropped a little of his barriers, allowing me to witness pieces of himself, had well and truly frozen me out. He'd returned to the ruthless bastard who'd force-fed me elixir, then made me sit on his fingers in delirious intoxication. He'd shown no empathy then. He had no empathy now. I swiftly made my way to the center, standing beneath the delicate metal harness hanging from the ceiling. Sully turned and closed the door behind him. Silence fell thicker as he kept his back to me, inhaling a huge gust of air before curling his hands and spinning to stalk toward me. My mouth was dry as the beach, my tongue pierced by tiny shells and throat lodged by poisonous coral. If I had words to speak, I doubted I'd be able to give them sound. I tried to convince him. Even the guest who'd been the reason for this awful mess had vouched for me, yet Sully's ability to believe me was broken. Any faith I'd earned had just vanished like smoke from an extinguished candle. All that remained was the soot of our strange relationship and the waxy shards of consequences. Without speaking, he pulled out his phone and pressed a button. Immediately, the harness descended, whirring gently to swing behind me. I tensed, waiting for Sully to step into me and trust me up in the imprisonment. Maybe if his skin touched mine, if his body thought for him, rather than his battered ideals, we could stop this before it was too late. However, unlike the other two times in Euphoria, he didn't reach out to equip me himself. He didn't take away my choices and dress me in sensors that stole my taste, touch, sight, hearing, and smell. He made me do it. Take off your clothes and put the harness on. His voice resembled an iceberg, impenetrable, icy blue, and cold, cold, cold. Heading toward the cupboards ringing the arena where sex took place between two people who saw an entirely different world to the one we currently resided in, he yanked open a door and removed a trolley full of black boxes with a purple orchid stenciled on the top. The sensors. Swallowing hard, my stomach ached even worse. A tumbling, tightening mess of worry of what would happen after this and an excruciating feeling of loss. I've lost him before I'd even had him. Tears prickled my gaze, but I sniffed them back and did what he'd asked. Grabbing fistfuls of my dress, I pulled it over my head and threw it to the side. Standing in a turquoise bikini, I undid the bows behind my nape and lower back, tossing the top piece aside and repeating with the bottom half. Sully's jaw locked as he stole a glance, bringing the trolley to a stop beside me. He remained in his expensive suit, looking every bit a pissed-off mogul with no mercy. My nakedness dressed me in goosebumps. Not from the cold, the island was never cold, but from the coldness of the man who I'd given my heart to. I'd rescued him from drowning. 
I'd accepted his body into mine. We'd shared parts of ourselves that we'd never shared before. And to be on the precipice of throwing all of that away made me sadder than any other time in my life. Sadder than when I'd been stolen, trapped, and sold. Sadder than when I didn't think I'd see Scott or my family again. I was sad when my past had been ripped away, but now, now my future had been taken too, and that was far, far worse. Sully could have been a wonderful future, a future I would have gladly, gratefully accepted, turning my back on everyone else because he was worth it. He was the singular reason I'd been put on this earth, and also the reason why I wished I'd never met him. He'd awoken my heart, only to pulverize it into dust. Tears once again tried to spring, a well inside me crashing with waves up the sides, doing its best to escape through my eyes, to make me weak, to make me beg all over again. Damn man, damn... Put the harness on, Jinx. His gaze tore itself off my breasts, his hands ruthlessly tearing open boxes. Don't do this, Sully. His teeth glistened, his lips thin over sharp canines. Your right to call me that has once again been revoked. Sullivan, then. I bawled my hands, laughing a little crazily. Mr. Sinclair? Shut the hell up. Nope. I have something to say to you. I have no interest in- I fucking love you, you son of a bitch. He refused to look at me, icing me out all over again. This wasn't how declarations were meant to go. Anger should never be the main ingredient in professing the terminal diagnosis of falling in love, but so what? I embraced my rage, using it as a shield against his. You know I love you. I know you do. You saw it the moment you looked at me after you laughed on the boat yesterday. I tensed every muscle against the painful memory, the way he jolted when he'd read the message clear in my eyes. When he understood the unspoken language, literally howling the truth in his face. And he'd looked at me with the same raw connection. He tried to stop it. He'd gritted his teeth and looked away and returned to driving the boat as if nothing had happened. But something had happened. Something that could transcend this wreckage. If he was prepared to fight for us. For me. If he was ready to put his past behind him and choose a new kind of future, where trust was the foundation that could sprout such happiness. You have nothing to say to me in return? I hissed. You're honestly going to pretend you feel nothing. He ignored me, continuing to shred boxes apart and rip out their contents as if it was me he systematically destroyed. I love you, but I damn well hate you right now, Sully. His jaw clenched, his entire body seethed with the visible restraint of not entering into the war I was so desperate to have. He wanted to prove he felt nothing. He wanted to hurt me this much. He wanted to throw me away without allowing common sense and the truth to fix us. Fine. Fine. You're a coward, Sullivan Sinclair, a goddamn coward. He stilled. A subtle shift of sizzling tyranny settled into blistering self-control. His hands stopped massacring the boxes. His shoulders turned stiff. His very breath slowed from harsh to hardly at all. Terrifyingly slowly, he turned to me. His eyebrows raised mockingly while his blue gaze remained on lockdown from feeling. Interesting choice of words. Jinx. What? Coward? I narrowed my eyes. No, actually, I think it's the perfect one. A dangerous slur to slander. Truth is never dangerous. He smiled with daggers of frost. Truth is the most dangerous thing of all. Is that why you run from it? It's why I deal in lies. He rolled his shoulders, doing his best to stay in control of the volcano I poked. I created this island and filled it with hypocrisy and fraudulence. I embraced the fact that all life is a lie. All feeling is fiction. All trust ends up being deceit. Trust is hardwired into us. It's a fundamental law for coexistence. 
and yet I've survived just fine without it. Trust me, you are not fine. I pressed a fist between my breasts, imploring him. Survival is not happiness, Sully. Survival is a damn imposter for living, truly living. To laugh, to be free. Can you not remember how good it feels to relax, to have faith, to trust? He laughed with a scary chill. You ask me to do something I've proven is the one thing I am incapable of doing. You've just trusted the wrong people. He swooped toward me, snatching my jaw with no sympathy. I trusted those I called family. I flinched against his aggression. Family doesn't automatically earn a free pass. His eyes darkened until I stared into a black hole. Family are supposed to be the one network that's got your back. Family we're born into can make mistakes. I struggled to speak with his tight grip on my jaw, but I wriggled until I had enough freedom to mutter. Family we choose to share our life with can make mistakes. But the family you choose with your heart, your soul, that's worth trusting. Trust is 99% of what makes being in love so magical. To know you'll be cared for in sickness and in health. To know they accept you, regardless of your flaws and... Trust is the one reason why I will never be in love. His gaze flickered to my lips before narrowing back on mine. You're already in love, Sullivan Sinclair. You're just too chicken to admit it. His eyes snapped closed. His fingers dug into my cheeks until I tasted blood. I suggest you stop antagonizing me. Before I do something we'll both regret. You're already doing something you'll regret. I poked his unrelenting temper with a stupid twig of truth. I knew Sully had the potential of exploding, of cracking the very earth I stood on, of suffocating me in smoke, of burying me in lava. But it didn't stop me. It only made me wilder, stupider, reckless, and careless, and desperate. Desperate to stop him from being such a stubborn asshole. My temper had always gotten me into trouble. I'd kept it silent in Mexico. I'd done my best to keep it tethered around this man with unfortunate results. But here, now, I couldn't contain the tempest inside me. I was the sea whipped by the wind. I was the sky pierced by lightning. This could get me killed. Or it could save us from a mistake that would ruin both of us for life. Because if he did this, if he gave me to another man after our hearts had tangled into this messy, tricky chaos, then he would lose me, as surely as I'd lost him. Men in love don't share. Men like Sully, who wore possession like expensive diamond cufflinks, did not rent out the woman they'd chosen. If he could do this, if he could give me to another, then what I felt for him was a lie. And what he made me think he felt in return was the worst kind of forgery. This whole damn island was full of deceit and distortion and the very myths he traded in. And I was done trying to yank at the curtain, doing my best to get it to tumble down, frantic with the need to shatter the illusion Sully had trapped himself in. The illusion that trust would hurt him. Trust would bruise and kick and punch him. Trust would kill his animals, his sanctuary, his heart. My voice lost its heat, mimicking the ice he cast himself in. I arched my chin in his hold. I locked eyes with the one man I was made for and hissed. You make me serve a real guest, Sully, and whatever this is between us is dead. No resuscitation, no reincarnation. I will never speak to you again. I will never look at you again. I will treat you as you've treated me, with disdain and impatience. I will turn my back on you when you summon me to serve. I will spit in your face if you touch me. I would rather sink to the bottom of the ocean than ever let you fuck me again. I sniffed, unable to hold back the two droplets of pure fury as they cascaded down my cheeks. You do this, and you are invisible to me. His hand fell from my cheeks. His chest strained in his suit. His arm trembled as he raked fingers through his bronze-tipped hair. Stumbling toward the trolley, he growled. Put the harness on. 
Jinx. For a second, I heard a fairy tale. I heard him say, I love you with all my fucking heart. I'm sorry, you're right. I do trust you. Instead, reality slapped me in the face, and I nodded with finality. He chose to believe what he'd seen, that I'd betrayed him and given my name to a guest. He ignored my explanation. He rejected what Adam Marks had said. He'd survived for too long without love or trust. Jealousy was right. Sullivan Sinclair was rushing headfirst toward a crash-and-burn breakdown, a burnout of his own making because he refused to allow anyone to carry a tiny piece of his heart. I nodded, slowly. Another cloak of goosebumps settled. My temper vanished with a silent scream of frustration. My heart stopped thumping with violence and turned sick with loss. So be it. With sudden shakiness, I grasped the harness and quickly slipped it around my waist, shoulders, and thighs. I didn't look at him. I kept my part of the bargain. He was invisible. He was nothing. He's gone. Slowly stood by as I secured the clasp, ruthless with silence. The snap of the lock made me wince. I let my arms fall to my sides, closing my eyes when Sully's fingers grazed my belly, testing the latch, ensuring I'd obeyed and properly secured it. With a fierce grunt, he passed me the small jar of oil. Smear this over yourself. I swallowed back the sand and coral in my throat, ready to speak over the rubble left by our argument to ask why he didn't do it himself. But he'd made his decision, and I'd made mine. I would never speak to him again. Snatching the jar, I tipped a glistening puddle into my spare hand and rubbed it over my skin. I kept my teeth gnashed together as I diligently spread and coated my entire body. The silence festered between us, rotten and full of goodbye. His nostrils flared as I passed back the empty jar. His five o'clock shadows seemed darker around his mouth, shadows swallowing him whole. You have to take responsibility for your actions, Jinx. This is entirely on you. I will not prepare you. I will not make this any easier on you. He leaned forward, his body heat scalding my chill. Trust isn't given. It's earned. My eyes snapped up. What does he mean by that? That I had a hope of earning it? That this wasn't as black and white as my normal dealings with him? Keeping my stare, he held up another box, the mouthwash. I cracked the lid and swilled without complaint. My mind that logically accepted my defeat and my heart that painfully cast him out slowly nudged me alive with idiotic optimism. Trust isn't given. It's earned. Did he expect me to prove myself by sleeping with another man? Prove that I would do whatever he commanded? What would that achieve? That I'd finally accepted my place as his belonging and not a woman with her own free will and thoughts? No, that doesn't make sense. I bit my bottom lip, trying to rip out his secrets with just a stare. He avoided eye contact, handing me the roller of scent deception, waiting while I smeared it beneath my nose. I passed it back and he threw it onto the trolley. Selecting the box of earbuds, he shoved them into my hands. This time our eyes did lock, and the sea blue of his gaze was as deep as an abyss filled with sharp-toothed sharks. He looked as if he wanted to bite me, to make me cry out, to make my vow to ignore him meaningless. Keeping his threatening stare, I inserted the buds into my ears. The room muffled, amplifying my own heartbeat and breath. Sully took the empty box and handed me the eye lenses without a word. Our transaction was void of anything but clinical interaction. Gingerly, I fumbled with how to insert them. Sully held up a mirror, being patient while I unwillingly learned how to plant contacts over my pupils, flinching with foreignness once again hating how my vision went hazy, waiting for my brain to figure out how to see past the unwanted film. Only once I stopped blinking, I could see enough not to be taken by surprise, did Sully put down the mirror and pick up the final box. The fingerprint sensors. 
the one thing I wouldn't be able to do myself. With a heavy inhale, he murmured, Give me your hand. I braced myself and placed my fingers into his control. The second our skin collided, a supercharged current of want and wicked hunger zapped from him to me. I winced as the power bolt fizzled up my arm, through my heart and into my core. For the first time since he'd dragged me here, my body melted instead of tensed, preparing for love, not war. He vibrated with fraying self-control as he ignored the hissing, hurting bond between us, tearing off the sensors from its sticky sheet and placing them firmly over my fingertips. With each sensor he glued on me, I grew hotter, wetter. With each caress of Sully's touch, it made me want to slap him, then kiss him, then slap him all over again. By the time he'd done all ten fingers, we both had no control over our breathing or the nightmare our bodies had shackled us with. I was wet, he was hard, yet we would find no satisfaction in the other. There would be no kisses before he loaded me into the arms of another man, no tongue on my clit while he tried to convince himself he didn't want me for himself. I'd never seen him so resolute or pig-headed about a decision that would only bring aching regret. With a fierce squeeze of my hand, he let me go, unable to look at me, avoiding me as if he walked the narrowest road, or if he veered off course just for a second, he'd choose a different path, a fork in our destinies that had appeared the moment we met. Does he see it, too? Did he see the different destinations on offer, the dark, dismal ending if we turned our backs on each other, compared to the bright, hopeful beginning if we fought to be happy? It was a shame, really. Such a shame we were so similar in all the ways that mattered. We had the same morals, same ethics, same personalities. We could have been amazing together. We could have been forever. With a tummy-clenching grunt, Sully backed away from me. He balled his hands against the tug of togetherness. He revoked fate's incessant pull. Stubbornness ought to be a sin a deadly penance-earning, hell-inducing, biblical sin. Then again, stubbornness could also be confused with pride. The way Sully braced his shoulders, standing tall and majestic and embracing what his goddesses called him, an emperor upon this island. The more I didn't know if it was pride that Sully refused to shatter, or his stubbornness. Either way, it would end whatever we had. Yanking his phone from his trouser pocket, he planted his legs into a fortifying stance and typed on the small screen. He typed for longer than usual when loading me into Euphoria. He typed so long I grew impatient. I wanted this over with. I wanted some pill to swallow to remove him from my head and heart. I wanted a drug. Wait. He didn't give me elixir. I looked up studying him as he continued to type, his jaw set and eyes tight, his forehead furrowed with signs of his emotional exhaustion and inflexible stubbornness. How had he forgotten to give me elixir, and why did that worry me the most? My heart kicked with worried flutters. You know why. I reached for the harness clasp around my waist. Sully typed a final sentence, his nostrils flared with pain. Wait, wait! I didn't want to be sent to a guest without being high on elixir. I didn't want to have to sleep with someone as a me, and not an animal drowning beneath disgusting lust. That lust kept me safe. It turned sex for them into sex for me. It gave me power. It gave me sanctuary. It gave me peace from my thoughts and allowed my body to rule. Without elixir, I wouldn't be mentally intact afterward. I'd be broken, well and truly shattered and precisely what he wanted me to be, his to use, abuse and command. Slowly looked up, his thumb hovering over the button glowing on his screen. I opened my mouth to beg for something I never thought I'd want. Give me elixir, damn you. Don't gift me to someone and ask me to fuck them as me. Eleanor wasn't capable of being a whore, but Jinx could. Jinx had. Jinx... Let's see if you're different, Eleanor Grace. Slowly raised his hand, the phone condemning me in his grip. Let's see once and for all if you can be trusted.
Sully, no. Too late. His thumb came down. The censors blinded me, deafened me, stole me. White, silent, nothing. Sullivan, Chapter 18 I was the master of sniffing out lies. Thanks to Drake's firm tutelage when we were kids, he ensured I'd learned that lesson very well. When he pulled me in for a hug because our parents walked into the room, I felt the fakeness of his embrace. When he shared his dessert because our mother glowered at him over the table, I tasted the phony sugar. When he punched me in the goddamn face, only to kiss my cheek as a concerned brother when our father caught us, I throbbed with the bruises of forgery. Thanks to him, I knew every feeling of a lie. The weight of it, the heat of it, the sound of it. All lies had the same construction, the same level of hypocrisy mixed with beguiling misrepresentation. A lie was worse than any other danger because your own mind wanted so much to believe it. It wanted to accept the smarmy untruth, to believe the counterfeit tale. It took discipline to see past such a thing. It took ruthlessness to punish the liar. After a while, I used lies to my benefit. I played games with those who thought they were masters at deceit. I made them think I accepted their bullshit, all while waiting for a time to reveal the hand of cards I'd been steadily gathering against them. Each time I chose to prove their inability to hoodwink me, I had a winning hand. And each time I played such a game, the loser never had access to me again, either in a personal relationship or business. Cross me, lie to me, and you're dead. On paper to start with, but push me. Keep trying to convince me that I was the one in the wrong, and then you're dead in reality, too. As Eleanor slumped in the harness, her eyes snapping closed and chin crumpling to her chest, I suffered a pang of unease. Thanks to her, I had a conscience these days. She'd been another teacher in my life, just like my brother had. She'd taught me the signs of heartbreak. The taste of bitterness, the ache of wrongness, the awful, nasty understanding that no matter how you felt about someone, they could still double-cross you. You couldn't control them, couldn't stop them. She had her own thoughts and feelings, her own beliefs and convictions. She believed them so strongly, she almost convinced me of her lies. Strangely, it wasn't the monster inside me who'd constructed this little game to sniff out her truth. The monster had already thrown his stupid heart at her and given her the key to every shred of trust he had left. But the monster didn't have an excuse. After all, it was an animal, a beast driven purely by instinct who'd chosen Eleanor for its mate. It was the man who'd loaded her into euphoria, the man's last-ditch attempt to survive her, to prove that she was a liar, a thief of his fucking heart, and the best con artist he'd ever met. It didn't matter that her lies didn't taste right, or sound right, or showed any of the normal revelations of a fib. It didn't matter that I already knew she spoke the truth. Adam Marks had heard her name from me, not her. Thanks to my lack of security and obsessive desire to be inside her last night, I'd caused this mess. If anyone deserved to be punished, it's me. And that was exactly what this was about. This little game wouldn't break Eleanor. It would break me. And when it did, every single piece would be hers. And she could either leave me, scattered by her feet, or gather up what was left and sculpt me into whatever she wanted me to be. Because if this worked, I would be free. Free to trust wholeheartedly. Free to love completely. Free to be happy. And if it didn't, well, hell already had a throne waiting for me. Eleanor, Chapter 19 As far as fantasies went, this was a tame one. I stood in the middle of a hay barn. The sweet scent of harvested grass, the natural heat from fermenting bales— the dust motes shimmering on the air from the sunset spilling through the windows at the top of the huge A-frame building. It all spoke of calm country, 
A slower pace of life for a city lover and a world away from a tropical island in Indonesia. Spinning in place, I drank it all in. Stables waited for equine guests by the large double wooden doors. A tax shed held a multitude of saddles and bridles. And a mismatched trophy wall held sun-bleached photos of someone galloping, running barrels, and smiling in victory with ribbons. The brick floor looked freshly swept, and birdsong outside mingled with the crow of a rooster and twitters of happy hens. Without elixir fogging my mind and body, I had the luxury of judging the quality of Sully's virtual reality. He was right when he said he contorted the parameters of fact and fiction. Try as I might, I couldn't spot a glitch in the illusion. Not when I swiped a hand through the air and felt the heat of a dry summer, rather than the damp mugginess of the tropics. Not when I stepped forward, my feet encased in simple lace-up stained with mud, manure, and who knew what else? Not when I ran my hands over the blue-flowered cotton dress that skimmed my thighs with a flirty hem. I pinched myself, trying to force my body to return to truth thanks to pain. However, unlike a dream, the barn didn't vanish. I stayed, standing in the center of a farm I'd never been to before, all while my body remained tethered to some harness in Sully's euphoria villa. My heart raced at the thought, at the unnaturalness of it. To be torn down the seams and denied access to my body, the more I thought about it, the more panic crept over me. I didn't like the distance. My mind was homeless, my heart in two locations at once. The feeling, knowing, instinctual part of me existed in this fantasy, but the pumping, working, biological muscle remained in a place I couldn't see, hear, or touch. I didn't like it. Claustrophobia clawed, scratching my skin and licking through my hair. I want to wake up. I need... A boot scuffed on the broken brick floor. My eyes soared upward, my body twisting to face the intruder. Instantly, my heart pounded even harder, confused and alarmed, sensing a trap even while skipping with hopeful joy. Sully. He stepped from one of the stables as if it held a portal to another dimension. He'd been inserted into this illusion through a simple button, rather than walking through the barn doors. He didn't speak as he came toward me. His tall, muscular frame no longer wore his armor of suits and ties, but had traded them in for wholly torn jeans, complete with smears of dirt from hands used to working outdoors. His black and blue plaid shirt was rolled up to his forearms, revealing hair damp with perspiration. The hollow of his throat and sweeps of his collarbone held grime and sweat, begging me to lick and taste a male not afraid of hard toil. My core clenched as he continued toward me, unhurried and entirely untouchable. His boots crunched stray hay. His long legs ate up the distance, and when he finally stopped in front of me, I was as wet as if I'd taken elixir after all. I trembled as his hand swept up and cupped my cheek, I moaned as his thumb traced my bottom lip, then speared into my mouth, and I positively whimpered as he dragged me forward by hooking his thumb against my lower teeth, pulling me into him and slamming his lips over mine. His tongue replaced his thumb, the tang of salt and dirt taining a spiteful, nasty kiss. With his fingers still wet from being in my mouth, he trailed it over my cheek to cradle the back of my neck tingling his touch on my loose, long hair, keeping me imprisoned for his taking. His other arm went around my waist, jerking me into him. My body responded. It melted against his hard edges and welcomed the bite of his belt buckle. I relaxed into his touch, confused as to the purpose of this fantasy. Why had he loaded me with the threat of giving me to another man, only to appear in his own form? What sort of punishment was that? How exactly was I supposed to earn his trust if it was him I trusted? His tongue go deeper, sending my thoughts helter-skelter into dark corners. I kissed him back. I reached for his hair, scratching his nape with my fingernails, wanting to hurt him for making me need him so much. I wanted to continue hating him, but that was impossible when every urge said to spread my legs and submit. His kiss turned vicious, demanding more of me killing my ability to think. 
I wanted to throw myself headfirst into sex, to fall to the floor and allow him to fuck me, to somehow enjoy and abuse this strange situation for my benefit. But something, something kept my mind racing. Something kept tucking me back. Something doesn't feel right. He tugged at my hair, jerking my head back to bite and suck his way along my jaw. He hadn't said a word, yet for some reason I feared his voice wouldn't sound like him. His touch was hot and erotic and everything I enjoyed, but that spark was missing. That full-body electrocution that made me beg for it to stop, but also sadistically wanted to turn up the voltage until we both shuddered with mutual pain. His tongue fought against mine, hot and slippery, masculine and bold, but I felt the same way about his kiss as I did about Scott's kiss. Perfectly acceptable, arousingly skilled, but lacking, lacking that magic. Void of the curse Sully had condemned me with. This kiss was mediocre. This kiss was from a man I hadn't fallen in love with. Stop! I tore my mouth away from his. His lips glistened from shared spit. His tongue ran along his bottom lip, tasting me on him. His blue eyes flashed with impatience. Stop. He rolled his hips, wedging his throbbing erection against my stomach. How can you tell me to stop when this is what you do to me? I waited for my belly to flip, for my core to liquefy, for my heart to gallop with lust. I waited for every synapses to falter and fritz, knowing I was wanted by a man of Sully's caliber. A man who was rich, not just in money or genius, not in physical assets or skills, but rich in whatever alchemy that switched us from normal individuals into the exact needs of each other. We were meant to be, pure and simple. And this man? He's not Sully. Pushing his broad chest, I squirmed in his hold. Let me go! Anger furrowed his brow. Silly girl. His fingers dropped to my hips, digging his cock deeper against my stomach as his biceps flexed, dragging me into him. That's not how this works. I'm going to fuck you and... I slapped him with a swift right palm, then drove my knee as high as I could against his balls. He stumbled backward, nursing the bright red handprint on his cheek, luckily avoiding my knee to his testicles. Fuck, you're going to pay for that. For a moment, my resolve faded. His voice had the same gravel and velvet. His jaw had the same twitch of fury. His eyes danced from turquoise to navy to every color in the ocean. Even his hair fell the same way over his forehead, complete with lightened tips, laughing in the face of dark ebony. His height was right. His smell was right. His touch and taste and mannerisms were right. So why did I doubt? Why pin my refusal on the flimsy idea that just because his touch didn't affect my soul that he was an imposter? Why did I think I could sense a lie when every sense had been hampered by Sully's technology? What is going on? I paused too long. He scooped me into his control, backing me across the barn with a furious scowl. Let's see if you have anything on under that dress, shall we? I gasped as he shoved me against the wall. The barn shuddered from my impact, releasing dust from wooden planks and cobwebs to string and lace from the ceiling down into my hair. His temper was right. His breathing was right. His fury as he hoisted up my skirt and found I wasn't wearing underwear was right. My head fell back, bashing against the wall as he shoved two fingers inside me. His touch was right. His groan was right. His thumb against my clit and the feathering of his fingers inside me was all right. Yet the more he touched me, the less I desired him. Had I cursed myself when I promised he'd become invisible to me? Had I truly broken that all-consuming, heart-knotting bond we'd shared? Stop! I pushed at his chest, unable to get proper purchase as his body crushed mine, his boot kicked my lace up, spreading my legs. He fingered me roughly. He took me in ways he'd already taken, but unlike those previous times when I'd spread on my own accord, when I'd begged for more, 
when I'd basked in that damn glow, ember and pinwheeling firework from his touch. Now I turned frigid. I tried to cross my legs. I did my best to grab his wrist and stop his pumping fingers. You're not him. You're not him. Terror finally broke through my confusion, tearing apart what I'd been too terrified to admit. Sully had blocked me in euphoria. He'd given me to a guest. A guest wearing his skin. The worst deception I could imagine. Just like the caveman hid Sully behind huge physique, scars, and growls, this guest had the perfect disguise to destroy me. That was why he hadn't given me elixir. That was why he didn't use my lust against me. He thought I wouldn't need it. That he was my elixir. That I would buy into the illusion with every idiotic bone in my body and be so damn grateful that he'd finally trusted me. That he'd given me his affection and acknowledgement of his faith and forgiveness. It's all bullshit. He'd just given me a taste of his world. He'd taken my trust and shat all over it. Tears spilled from my eyes as I went wild. I scratched his face. I kicked his legs. I wiggled and squirmed. I screamed. I screamed and screamed. I screamed for this illusion to stop, for this guest to disappear, for this whole screwed-up punishment to be over. Get your fucking fingers out of me, you damn bastard! I tore at his hair, ripping at the strands I'd always found so sexy on Sully Sinclair. I snarled as he tried to kiss me. I choked as his free hand latched tight around my throat. Stop fucking moving. His fingers withdrew from me, fumbling for his belt. You want to scream? You can scream while I drive my cock deep inside you. No, this isn't happening. No. At no point in my captivity had I ever felt so petrified. Never had I been this close to feeling like what a true slave would feel. I had no choice. I had no power to stop him. I was a goddess, bought and paid for, a vessel for this guest's feral fantasy. I moaned in absolute horror as the zipper of his jeans sounded, followed by his grunt as he inched the denim off his hips. No, please, no, stop, stop, stop. He pressed against me. He bent his knees, he angled to thrust. She said stop. The man wearing Sully's body froze. Together, our heads whipped to the left where a stable hand appeared from the tack room. Lean and lanky, he could be a jockey instead of a groom holding a pitchfork for mucking out soiled hay. How about you stay out of this? Sully not Sully growled. I shivered at how real his voice sounded, and once again a tiny piece of me wondered if I'd gotten it wrong. How could I base my conviction on just a feeling— a profoundly powerful feeling, but still just a feeling. But then, Sully, not Sully, pressed himself against me again, and I knew. No amount of sensors or oils or gimmicks could prevent me from knowing. I knew without any remaining doubt. This man was not him. This man did not have the right to touch me, fuck me, love me. This man was nothing. Let me go, I snarled. Sully, not Sully, flat out ignored me, arching his hips to slide his cock between my legs. The glint of a dirty pitchfork wedged against his jugular. She said, stop. A repeat of what he'd already muttered, in a voice that held the barest of gruff and laced with a southern accent. I'd never heard that voice before. I'd never met this brown-eyed, blonde-haired boy in my life. And yet... Sparks. Awareness. Knowing. Goosebumps sprang all over, reducing my horror to hope. Could it be? Was it him? And if it was, why? What was the purpose of this hellish trick? How could I trust anything, anyone ever again? Was that the game? To understand how Sully struggled to see past masks and promises and fakery? To reveal how trust could never be given if your heart said one thing but your mind another? Even suffering this riddle for a few short minutes, I was exhausted. Exhausted fighting my psyche's natural craving to trust. 
The undeniable need to believe in what you think is real because that was where safety lay. If the one person you thought you could trust turned out to be your worst enemy, then nothing was safe. The world was a cesspit of liars and thieves and murderers, all hiding behind sweetness and smiles and the utmost simplicity of trust. Trust. That damn inconvenient emotion that ultimately destroyed the gullible and allowed the deceitful to run free. My shoulders slumped. My revelation had come fierce and fast, leaving me fumbling for air. The stable hand shot me a worried glance. His brown eyes glossed with concern. His eyebrows tugged low in hatred for the man forcing himself upon me. Without a word, he jabbed the pitchfork deeper against Sully, not Sully's throat. Get off her. Three new words in a stranger's voice. But I closed my eyes and listened to the magic behind it. The crackle of lightning, the hint of thunder, the tropical breeze and salt-dusted home of the man who'd done his best to break me. I sighed as the pitchfork drew a droplet of blood from Sully's imposter, forcing him to back up and tuck his erection back into his jeans. Seeing such a gorgeous man like Sully be borrowed by a guest with no conscience made me exquisitely sad. Could I ever look at him the same way again? Could I trust him next time he touched me? Can I ever forgive him for what he's done? Are you okay? The stable boy murmured, placing himself in front of me, still angling the pitchfork at Sully, not Sully. Whoever the guest was had gone strangely silent. The rebuttal or rage that I expected was mysteriously absent. Smoothing down my dress, I nodded. I'm fine. Did he hurt you? My tiredness made me want to slither down the barn wall and slump into a pile of hay. I was done playing this game. I was through being used in whatever way Sully intended. This was a breach of everything between us. This was unforgivable. New tears trickled down my face. These born from grief and pain. Giving in to the exhaustion, I planted my hands over my eyes, unwilling to look at the man I thought I knew and the stable hand I didn't. A buzz sounded, a click and a whir. I looked up. The stable hand stood in front of me, the pitchfork at his feet. One hand dragged through his sandy blonde locks, the other balled into a fist by his thigh. He wore a simple black shirt with tan patches sewn over areas of wear. His jeans were equally as filthy as Sully, not Sully's, had been. He was the exact opposite of the blue-eyed, miserably brooding mogul who ruled 44 islands in the middle of nowhere. But I knew him. My soul recognized him. He was familiar. He was mine. Or at least he was. He shifted under my stare, guilt flaring with brown fire in his gaze. I frowned, once again sensing something wasn't right. But what? Looking over his shoulder, I expected to see Sully's imposter staring at us, watching this tender moment, ready to attack the stable hand and continue his assault on me. Only, there was no one else. No hint that there had ever been a third person in this complex, confusing illusion. There was just me and this lanky boy who watched me with utmost desolation, knowing he'd fucked up, tongue-tied on how to fix it. With a weary sigh, I gave up pretenses. I stopped playing this game of lies. I looked at the boy directly in his face and gave him the finger, a slur that needed no interpretation. Fuck you, Sully Sinclair. Fuck you. Sullivan, Chapter 20 How? I shrugged with utmost vulnerability. Vulnerability I'd always kept buried. How did you know? Eleanor swiped at her tears and straightened her spine. The same way you'd know if I appeared in a different form. I frowned. That didn't answer my question. I wasn't psychic or gifted. I didn't have whatever voodoo she possessed to be able to see past my hallucinations. Had my program glitched? 
Had she seen past the coating and seen the lack of humanity in my doppelganger's eyes? Glancing at my hands, I scowled harder. The fantasy was still intact. I stared at the fingers of a stable boy, complete with blisters and thickened palms. I shed my usual tall height and operated the body of a younger man. For all intents and purposes, this blonde-haired farmhand was a puppet, dancing to my jerks on his strings. The only difference was, the link between his actions and my own was flawless. She shouldn't be able to know. She should be crying out in delirium while the program I'd written, when I'd first dabbled with the parameters of euphoria, Pile drove her against the wall. She should be having sex with me. Sully. Not watching some stable boy with a painful mix of unhappiness, hate, and condemning certainty. The hand I'd inspected curled into a fist as my temper rose. She should be happy to be fucked by him, grateful that our fight was seemingly over, not standing here with glowing confidence that the cipher that looked identical to me was the stranger and not this exact opposite standing before her. How? I asked again, my temper bleeding through my voice, laced with a southern twang and not as deep as my born attributes. Tell me how you knew. Eleanor sighed heavily. For a moment she looked as if she'd slapped me. Rage had turned her gray eyes into lashing quicksilver. However, she wrangled her anger back into controllable and pushed off from the wall. My borrowed body reacted as she moved toward me. My cock thickened. My heart thundered. She would always be it for me. She would always be the one. Yet she never did anything I expected. Thanks to this little game, I was supposed to be the one nursing a broken heart. I was supposed to be living through a nightmare of watching the woman I loved with all my fucking soul make love to a man who wasn't me. I was supposed to be justified in my suspicions that trusting anyone, even those my mind had deemed safe, were entirely justified. That trust was the true traitor here. That humans were gullible and weak, and it wasn't our fault that we betrayed each other, because in the end, we trusted what our eyes and ears told us over instinct. We had blinded and deafened ourselves to the animalistic part of our natures in so many ways. I knew it was a shitty thing to do to her, but I'd done it for me. I'd done it so I could finally admit that whatever I felt for her would only break me and ultimately kill her because I wouldn't be able to control myself if she betrayed me again. That trigger wasn't something I could control. Therefore, I had to shove the truth in my goddamn eyes and accept that Eleanor was just human, and I was asking far too much to expect her to always have my back, to expect her to love me, regardless of shape or form or what her rational mind told her. The carbon copy of myself, the man she'd tried to knee in the balls, had been an exact replica. In my mind, I'd already said a painful goodbye because how could I expect her to realize it wasn't me when it was me standing before her? I'd set her up to fail, digging that poisonous knife deeper into my useless heart. However, Eleanor had just blown apart my theory with her determined one-finger salute. She'd made all my pain and fears slam to a screeching halt. She'd proven just what a twat I was by shoving the truth into my eyes. She wasn't like the others. She was different. She'd always been different. And she made me doubt everything. She stood up to me like she had that second day when she'd yelled at me in front of the guests. She'd torn into me without any concern for her safety after she'd finished. She watched me the same way now. She watched me come apart and splinter into worthless fragments. How? How did she know? How was I so fucking stupid to hurt her this way? Her teeth clenched as she pointed at my forearm. Pull up your shirt. My thoughts bounced and collided, ratcheting my heart rate into a goddamn mess. Excuse me? You heard me. She straightened her shoulders, as if conversing with me pissed her off. Pull up your shirt. Pursing my lips, I did as she asked, yanking at the cuff until it bunched under my elbow. Blonde hair scattered my sun-bronzed skin, the size of the arm smaller than my usual one. It felt strange to stare at a limb I had no connection with, no sense of ownership. 
My scars from my past were gone, my broken and healed bones no longer a part of me. I had no kinship with this body, and yet... Eleanor had known almost instantly that I hid inside it. How? Fucking how? With another deep breath, she stepped into me. Hesitatingly, she raised both her hands, ready to touch me. I stiffened with anticipation. Her gaze caught mine with molten steel. Close your eyes. I scowled. What? No, I... Close your eyes, Sully. I wanted to argue. I wanted to know what this experiment would prove. She hadn't answered my question. This was wasting time. She stepped back, dropping her arms. You know what? Let me out of this hallucination right now. I want to get as far away from you as possible. My heart twisted into an agonizing knot. You're mad at me because you think I gave you to a guest. A guest wearing my body. She flinched and bared her teeth. I'm mad at you for not trusting my word. For putting me in this situation, even if it is just virtual reality. You made me believe I was about to be taken by force. I'm mad at you for the panic, the helplessness, the sheer panic of not being able to stop it. Her skin lost its color. But I'm fuming mad that you're watching me, as if you don't understand why I'm cursing the very ground you walk upon. I shrugged helplessly. It's true. I don't understand. She sniffed with fury, ready to rip into me again. My hand shot up and I rushed. I get what you've said, and I get that I fucked up making you live through something out of your control. But it was never supposed to be about force. You were supposed to want it. She laughed icily. Want it? That I'd enjoy fucking a complete stranger who wore your face? The face that made my heart trip with connection the second I met you? The body I fantasized over even when I was supposed to despise you? My nostrils flared. You've just proven my point. You say you love me, but you don't know me. You know my body. You know what you can see and hear and touch. You don't know what I'm capable of. What I'm made of. Inside. She rolled her eyes with a mix of condescending disbelief and livid condemnation. That's where you're wrong, Sullivan Sinclair. I do know you. I know more than you think. That's why your stupid sensors didn't work. Why seeing and hearing and touching didn't convince me of your lies. She pointed a finger in my face. That's why I didn't want to have sex with whomever that was borrowing your body. I knew it wasn't you. How? I demanded, my patience wearing thin. How the fuck did you know? The illusion is faultless. If you have to ask me that, then maybe you don't feel the same way I do. She smiled sadly. Maybe this whole thing was a huge mistake. I didn't like the defeat in her tone. I despised the morbid acceptance in her eyes rather than the fierce temptress of before. She acted as if I'd well and truly ended us, when really, I'd only been trying to end myself. This wasn't about you, you know, I whispered. It had everything to do with me. She froze. What do you mean? I mean, watching you fuck another man, even if it was a shitty thing to do making you fuck someone who looked like me, would have proven that I'm not special. That it wasn't who I am inside who you fell in love with. That it was just the pretty packaging hiding the despicable creature I really am. She scrubbed her face as if my logic drove her up the wall. Ugh. Digging her fingers into her eyes, she abruptly dropped her touch and looked at me with such a piercing, painful stare I sucked in a breath. Whoever broke your trust so badly to make you this way, Sully, ought to be severely punished. My lips pulled back in a threatening smile. Oh, they've been punished. Don't worry. She didn't shudder or act repulsed that I'd sought retribution. She just nodded and braced her shoulders. Stepping into me again, her posture remained stiff and jerky as she commanded. Close your eyes and hold out your arm. Last chance. I won't ask again. 
You want to know how I knew? You want to know how I can stare into the brown eyes of a farm boy I've never met, but know that I am hopelessly his? I'll show you. My guts tangled with something sharp, making me bleed sheer pain. I stared at her. I loved her. I was afraid of her in that moment. Afraid of what she'd do to me. Afraid of what she'd make me become. Afraid that there was no turning back from this, regardless if I was ready or not. Adrenaline rushed through my bloodstream as I locked my knees and closed my eyes. I didn't know why I was afraid. Why, standing before Eleanor with my arm outstretched, made me feel defenseless, exposed, and utterly at her mercy. Seconds ticked past, making me bristle and my stupid heart double-beat. I needed to see, to look at her, to know what the hell she was doing. But the softest feather touched my hand, followed by another on my forearm. I jerked. Shit. Heat. Sizzling. Crackling. Potent and powerful and perfect. Even your damn euphoria can't stop the link between us. She murmured as one of her hands traced the sinew of my forearm, so soft it almost tickled, but firm enough to prove it wasn't my body's sensory reaction to her delicate touch, but the central nervous system of primal desires. No matter your technology and masks, Sully, our chemistry will override everything. Her other hand linked with mine, threading our fingers together, joining us in a bind that was so innocent and yet dripping with carnal yearning. I went insanely hard. I turned breathless as she traced the underside of my wrist. I swayed as my heart drummed, skipping to a new rhythm thanks to the electrical charge she fed me. Her electrical pulses collided with mine, conductive and disruptive, sinking with my own power, ensuring the positive ions within her soothed out the negative ones within me. Fuck. Me. Such a sinless touch. Yet I'd never been more aware, more in tune, more hungry. This was how she knew. This was how she knew instantly that it wasn't me kissing her. Not from her outward senses, but her inner ones. Those that could not be faked. Those that could not be lied to. Those that could not be tricked or cheated or scammed. Christ. I shuddered as her hand added pressure, linking her fingers around my wrist and pulling me into her. My eyes stayed closed, basking in the raw power between us, loving the unhindered connection, the blissful awareness that what I felt for this woman and what she felt for me was real. It wasn't about trusting what someone said or did. It wasn't about trusting our own external senses. It was about trusting how they felt within how our force fields blended, how our souls spoke in that unknown language that we both understood. I didn't need sight anymore. I only needed touch. I needed to touch and kiss and slip inside this amazing, wondrous goddess who had just set me free. Wrapping my arm around her waist, I pressed her into me. Our hand remained linked, glued at the palms and entwined by fingers. And when our lips met, I groaned in agony. Agony over what I'd done. Agony over what I was. Agony that she might never forgive me, and this magic, this mayhem, this magneticism between us wouldn't be enough to keep her. My tongue speared past her lips. Her taste exploded in my mouth. I groaned again, clutching her closer, trying to climb inside her. The kiss switched from a simple connection to an attack of lust and lunacy. Our heads danced, our tongues dueled, our lips heated from friction. I could come just from kissing this girl. I could come just from holding hands with this girl. She was everything. My legs buckled as her tongue swept over my teeth. My brain misfired, forgetting to hold up my weight when all it cared about, all it needed was to be inside her. I slammed to my knees, dragging her down with me. Her mouth opened wide in discomfort. Hay pricked us, brick bruised us, but I couldn't stop kissing her. 
Unlooping our fingers, she pressed both hands against my chest, pushing gently. Stop, please. Stop. I couldn't. I didn't want to. I never wanted to stop. Sully. She avoided my seeking kiss, needing to taste her again. Please stop. My eyes opened, blinded at first as if I'd lived in a different realm and forgotten how to see in this one. Eleanor stared back, her lips swollen and pink, her cheeks flushed, her gaze cool and resolute. More pain, a goddamn axe to the chest. It took every strength I had left, but I pulled away. My lungs pumped air to a suffocating heart. My blood pressure ensured I would never walk again unless Eleanor helped relieve my excruciating erection. But with the way she watched me, it hinted of punishment instead of pleasure. Punishment I deserved, and punishment I would gladly take if it made me worthy of her. Worthy? Shit, I'd done so much to be the opposite of worthy. My ribs cracked with overwhelming force, an emotion that I'd done my best to murder each time it appeared, a truth I could no longer deny. I ran my tongue over my lips. I raked both hands through blonde hair. I prepared to give myself to another, to her, forever. Our eyes caught. I shrugged, almost in apology. I stared at my queen with her invisible crown and confessed, I love you, Eleanor Grace. Eleanor Chapter 21 The world stopped. I sat in a bubble of time, an iridescent capsule where nothing and no one could touch me. I love you, Eleanor Grace. I love you. I love you. In another life, I would have launched into his arms and kissed every inch of him. I would have clambered onto his lap and inserted him deep inside me so we could consummate such a vow. But now, after what he'd done, after the tricks and tests, after doubting my honesty, I was wary. I was burned. I was hurt. I didn't accept what he said. I didn't know if he was capable of love. I didn't know how to trust it. Trust. I laughed under my breath. How ironic that Sully was finally prepared to trust our connection, when at the very same moment I had lost the ability to do the same. I mean, how am I supposed to accept such a declaration when it comes from a stable hand with blonde hair, brown eyes, and a body half the size of Sully Sinclair's? Yes, our souls sparked when we touched. Yes, I heard him behind the voice of the disguise. But it was still a mask. A mask designed to protect himself, just like all the other masks he wore in his life. He slipped between them so effortlessly, I doubted he knew he did it. But I knew. I'd been witness to the genius scientist who spoke of elixir like he'd birthed it, rather than conjured it in a test tube. I'd watched the sadistic hotelier as he welcomed guests upon his shores. I'd seen the golden-hearted man who killed himself with empathy over animals he couldn't save. I'd studied the green-fingered gardener who prowled through vegetable patches bursting with life. I'd swooned over a man who loved a tiny parrot more than money, power, or possessions. And I'd fallen for the boy behind the mask of a monster. The boy who'd been taught a lesson when he was young that trust was an abomination. A boy who still carried that lesson at the forefront of his mind. And now, I was supposed to believe that after decades of conditioning, he'd suddenly been able to switch? That he'd let me into with a heart that had a thousand walls and locked with a million keys? Eleanor. He pinched the bridge of his nose for a second, gathering his thoughts. The action might be done by a blonde farm boy, but it was Sully's mannerisms without a doubt. The way his shoulders rolled, the way his chest strained with violence to argue his case and restraint to accept my refusal. I don't expect you to leap for joy over such a confession, but... He dropped his hand, staring me dead in the eyes. I do expect you to believe me. I splayed my hands in surrender. 
How can I know if it's the truth? He grabbed my right hand and slammed it over his heart. It hammered beneath my fingertips, irregular and panicked. Panicked at the thought that I would deny his devotion. Panicked that just because he'd chosen me didn't mean I'd chosen him. That is yours. It was yours the moment I fucking met you. I knew. All the while I tried to say otherwise. I tried to take my hand back, unnerved by the walloping of his pulse. Sully. I love you. I can tell you again and again. Tell me how many times I need to say it to make you believe me. I smiled sadly. It's not about repetition. What's it about, then? He let me go, balling his hands. What do you need to trust me? What did I need? What would fix this after he'd broken it apart? I studied him, noting the faint freckles over his nose, the golden strands on his head, the slightly crooked front teeth. As far as disguises went, this one was cute in a first boyfriend kind of way, first roll in the hay, first kiss behind the barn, first heartbreak at the end of summer. The only thing was, Sully was none of those things. He wasn't innocent or young or blonde. He was stubborn and weathered and dark, dark of hair and dark of soul, dark enough to need the light I could bring him, dark enough to hopefully step into that light, to show me his secrets, to hide nothing from me. I looked up. My tummy clenched. I braced myself against his reaction. Tell me the truth about everything. His forehead furrowed. What truth? The truth that I love you? That I always will? That I know who you are now? That I finally have an answer to a question that's kept me up at night? You are mine, Eleanor Grace. You were mine the moment you took your first breath. Just like I am yours. Goosebumps made me shiver. My stupid romantic heart wanted so much to stuff those words into its pocket and keep them safe. To pull them out and reread the love letter. To hear them spoken every damn day for the rest of my life. Just like this farmhand was the beginning of a romance. First kiss, first fumble, first goodbye. Sully was the end. The forever. The always. There would be no goodbye. No heartbreak. If I'd done the impossible and made a man like him fall in love with me, then it wasn't to be taken lightly. He would always love me. He would never stop. He would never accept anything less from me. I was his. More so now he loved me than I ever had been when he'd paid money for my life. In his mind, my soul now belonged to him, not just my body, and that was something he would never give back, even when I died. That sort of dedication was petrifying, but also immensely comforting. He would never share me. He would never hurt me. He would ensure I was always happy because I was in charge of his happiness in return. God, how could I have known I'd find this level of intensity when I'd been kidnapped? How could fate have brought us together in such a way? How would we ever be normal? A normal couple sharing a life, creating a home and hearth when men paid money to fuck elixir-drugged goddesses. How could I stand by his side while women were purchased and trapped? What do I need? I need convincing that I have enough power over Sully that our joint future might be different than his singular one. I need to do what jealousy told me. I need to give Sully his freedom, so others might have theirs. I caught a stare. I know what I need. He tensed, wary but willing. What? What do I need to do? Jealousy's voice filled my head. He will lie to your face if you ever ask him if he loves you. He will lie to himself until he almost believes he feels nothing. He will never admit that you've warmed your way past his defenses because that would force him to confront his very existence as a man. By admitting he's fallen for you, he's effectively signing his own death sentence because there is no easy path from there. He'd already admitted he loved me, so that death sentence was signed. He was the one who gave you that diamond. 
He was the one who fucked you in euphoria. He was the one who told you he was in love with you because he could use the disguise to hide the truth from you as well as him. I guarantee if you get him to where he thinks he can hide behind a mask, he will be far more lenient with the truth. He'll admit what's in his heart because he knows he can take it all away again, and it won't mean a thing because it wasn't him admitting them. And that was what I needed. He had admitted he loved me while wearing yet another mask. The only way I would believe him, trust him, would be to hear it from him. Not this blonde boy, not the island god, not Sullivan Sinclair. I need to hear it from Sully. I straightened my spine and commanded. Remove my sensors. Stop this fantasy. Tell me it was you who fucked me in euphoria as the caveman and again as the father in love with his daughter-in-law. Tell me you love me as you and... Okay. He nodded, cupping my cheek with a shaky hand. Okay, Eleanor Grace. Never looking away from me, he swiped his thumb beneath my nose, dispelling the scent deceptor. Bending close, he kissed me softly, then arched his chin, pressing my face into his throat. I inhaled deeply. My heart went wild, recognizing the scent of coconut, sea salt, and sun, the irrefutable cologne of a man who loved the tropics. Kissing my cheek, his fingers went to my ears, gently pulling out the buds lodged inside. A loud crackle, a hiss of white noise, a screech of feedback, and then they were gone, tossed to the barn floor, sticking to dirt and hay. It was me who fucked you in euphoria. As the caveman. And as Roy Slater. I jolted with lust as Sully's true voice filled my heart with honesty. He didn't stop taking off his shirt to wipe at the oil on my skin. Each swipe of the soft material granted back the sensation of muggy island rather than dry summer. I told you the truth when I said I was in love with you in those illusions. I could be honest, even while I still tried to believe a lie. He continued to wipe off the oil, turning his care to my legs and feet. Did you honestly think Marcus Grammer would have that stamina? The blonde boy smirked, even as Sully's voice fell from his lips. How many times did we have sex that night? Nine? Nineteen? You drained me dry, Eleanor. You drugged me as surely as I drugged you. I couldn't get enough. I never wanted you to wake up. I wanted to stay with you in that cave forever. Just the two of us. I shivered as he threw away his shirt, not caring that he sat half-naked before me, the hairless chest of the stable hand still masking the breadth and power of the man I knew was in there. He shrugged. The second time, I knew it was over for me. Twice I put jealousy in your place, transforming her into you, letting men believe they fucked you when, in reality... I would have torn their fucking heads from their corpses if they ever touched you. I was late to the illusion as Roy Slater, leaving you on that doorstep, drowning in need. And when I opened the door to you in that cute restaurant outfit, fuck me, I choked on a confession there and then. I wanted to tell you everything. To stop playing the charade of having a son and pretending you were untouchable. Of having the luxury of telling you I was in love with you and not hide behind a fucking guest. Christ, sleeping with you in that fantasy, I walked a tightrope the entire time. A few times I worried I'd broken the illusion, that you knew exactly who filled you, that it was me admitting all my fuck-ups. Rising onto his knees, he came closer, cupping my cheeks again. You were right, that it's different when we touch. That bite between us, that painful kick of awareness has never happened with anyone before. When I touch you, I feel it. It hurts my heart and turns me hard. And no matter the tricks I employ or the code I use to blind, that chemistry can never be hidden. Smiling sadly, he added. Oh, and the diamond was from me. I pretended it was from grammar because how the hell was I supposed to admit that I'd fallen for you so quickly? I was jealous of myself. Jealous of the memory of being with you. Jealous of the freedom we'd found together. Jealous that I couldn't have you in reality. Tears glossed my vision, making him dance and blur. Don't cry. 
He tatted under his breath, wiping the droplets away with a thumb. Please don't cry. Pressing his forehead to mine, he swallowed hard and murmured. I created Euphoria from a dream. I had computer hackers and tech gurus transform a harebrained idea into something that traded mundane into magic. I'd never used it until you. I'd never wanted to be tricked into feeling something I couldn't afford to feel. But I fell for you in the same way. I dreamed about you, Jinx. I dreamed of a brown-haired goddess with silver, stunning eyes, and I fell in love with a figment of my imagination. He chuckled almost sadly, pulling away to look at me. Imagine my surprise when you turned out better than my fantasy. When you overshadowed my dream girl. When you made me realize how much I fucking love you. Taking my hands, he slowly pulled at the sticky sensors on my fingertips. Deep in the illusion, I couldn't see anything existed on my hands. I couldn't feel the sticky sensors. I couldn't pull them off on my own. But as Sully systematically removed them, I gasped as they appeared in his touch. The oddness of him peeling something I couldn't see off my own body and then witnessing them appear out of thin air made the power of his creation even more dangerous. What he'd created with Euphoria could be used for greatest pleasure and for the worst kind of nightmare. What if his program fell into the wrong hands? What if it was used for torture instead of orgasms? The poor person trapped inside it would have their minds scrambled until it trickled out of their ears, mentally broken forever. Slowly halted my fear, placing my sensor-free fingertips on his chest. I instantly moaned at the contact. Not because our skin once again ignited with fire, but because I touched Sully, not a blonde stable boy. I ran my hands over hair and muscle. I felt power and heat and a body I recognized over the one I'd never seen before. It was so strange to touch a smaller man yet feel a larger chest, to trust what my fingers told me rather than my eyes. He shuddered as I dropped my hands lower, tracing the hard ridges of his belly, teasing the soft flesh above his belt. His voice thickened with harsher gravel as he continued. The illusion tonight. The guest you think wore my body. He waited until I looked up, needing me to concentrate and not ruin both of us with need. There was no guest, Eleanor. I frowned, my fingers stopping their exploration. But how? It was a computer program. He bent and kissed me, licking my lower lip once before murmuring. Do you honestly think I'd be able to let some man touch you now, when I wasn't even capable of that at the beginning? I shivered. I don't understand. While learning how to write the cipher for fantasies, I wrote a code for myself. I copied my attributes and uploaded an avatar into the system. I've never used it. Until now. It can be run without a host. I just type dialogue and allow the program to interact with you. So, it was you, just... It was empty. A hollow hologram. He nuzzled into me. Precisely what I was before I met you. I... I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything. It's my turn to speak. His hands skated up my back, cradling my nape and pulling my hair until I tipped my head back. Keep your eyes open. I sucked in a breath as his fingers loomed over my eye. I fought the urge to shut him out, straining as he carefully pinched the lens, obscuring what was real and what was not. I winced as he removed it. Tossing the first one to the ground, he smiled. I flinched. My brain boycotted the imagery. One eye was free to see Sully on his knees in this dark villa of euphoria. The other was programmed to view a blonde farm boy with hay in his hair. The two images overlapped, flickering and giving me an instant headache. I recoiled backward, shaking my head at the scrambled input. It's okay. Don't fight it. Come here. Sully captured me again, carefully touching my pupil and removing the other sensor. For a second, I kept my eyes closed, willing my head to stop pounding. Sully waited patiently, his hands falling from my hair, not touching me at all. With a heavy inhale, I stiffened and opened my eyes. Sully... In his shirtless island glory, 
dark hair with the rebellious bronze tips, sculptured body with its faint silver scars, so many stories from a past he refused to tell, pressed trousers instead of jeans, kneeling on the tiled floor. His lips glistened from our previous kiss. His chest rose and fell with hesitant breath. His exquisite blue gaze crashed with waves of blue and worry. Lines bracketed his mouth as if afraid I'd climb to my feet and bolt, and his forehead never unfurrowed, the strain of being honest painting him in a harsh, unforgiving light. He looked older. He looked exhausted. He looked on the brink of that burnout he'd been running full speed toward. His hand touched my naked thigh. Please forgive me, Eleanor. Forgive me for putting you through that. Forgive me for scaring you, for being cruel to you, for not trusting what exists between us. I used that trick to prove to myself that I was stupid to feel so strongly for you. To school myself once and for all that you didn't love me. You couldn't love me. That I could never hope to be worthy of having you. He traced my knee, sending another flush of goosebumps up my limbs. But, instead of breaking myself, I fear I've broken any trust you had. I fear that I've lost you, even while I touch you. I fear that I went too far, and that no matter what truth I give you, it won't be good enough. He kept his gaze on my thigh, his touch warm and filled with that never-ending voltage. My chest ached for him, for his vulnerability, for his unshielded heart without his many, many walls. Had he gone too far? Could things be different now we'd touched the end and both recoiled from it? Only one thing would prove that this was salvageable. This was survivable. One sentence to be said without any masks, disguises, or ways to take back his vow. I placed my hand over his, pressing his touch into my naked thigh. The blue flowered dress I'd worn in the hay barn had vanished, along with the hay, the boy, and the lace-ups. It was just him and me, a girl and a monster, and an empty room full of possibilities. Sullivan, Chapter 22 My hand caught fire under hers. I looked up, bracing against her rejection. My heart lurched with panic because her gray gaze held one chance. A single chance to fix this. The knowledge of what I had to do blazed through my body. She opened her mouth to ask. The first sound of a request fell from her lips. But I intercepted her. I didn't want her to ask. I didn't want her to think she'd made me do this. I wanted this to be the moment where she became mine. Forever. Despite what I was. Despite what I did. Despite everything I'd done to her. Snatching her around the waist, I yanked her naked body from the bare tiles and straddled her over my lap. Her legs spread on either side of my hips, revealing her pussy, showing that she wanted me as much as I wanted her. My erection strained against my trousers. My heart bashed against my ribs as our bare chests touched. I could barely breathe as I dove my hands into her hair and captured her head so she had no choice but to look at me. Her long chocolate strands puddled over my legs. Her lips parted. Her eyes flared. And I tore off my final mask. For her. I gave myself no going back. No pretending I hadn't said such a thing. No way of convincing her she'd heard wrong. I love you, Eleanor Jinx, Grace. I love you for your fire, your bravery, your stubbornness. I love that you're not afraid of me. That you call me out on my bullshit. That you are the mirroring piece of everything that I lost along the way. I love that you are so kind to animals. That you are cursed with the same empathy I carry. That you're a goddamn vegetarian. I love that Skittles fell for you, even though she's the reason why I lost everything I am. I lost everything because I gave it all to you the moment I saw her land on your shoulder. I love that you're different to anyone else I've ever met. I love that every time we touch, we spark. I captured her chin, holding her firm. I love you. That's the curse you put on me. The reason I called you Jinx 
the hex I felt the moment you stepped on my shores, and I'll happily remain cursed for the rest of my godforsaken life if it means I get to keep you. She didn't cry. She didn't lean in to kiss me. She stayed staring into me, frowning slightly, letting the echo of my commitment puddle around us until we were an island in a sea of pledges and promises. I didn't move. I couldn't. I had no other card to play. I had no idea if I would win her, and I was too chicken shit to shake her and demand a reply, because as long as she sat on my lap then I hadn't lost her. It didn't matter if she refused to give me an answer for decades. I would sit here and wait. I would hold her through every sunrise and sunset and wait. I would wait until she gave me my freedom by admitting that she loved me back. Please. Slowly she moved. I sucked in a breath as she pushed upward with her knees, dislodging my hold in her hair. I couldn't lie. My heart motherfucking broke. After everything, after pouring out the nucleus of who I was, stained and tainted with the filth I'd carried inside me for so long, she'd made up her mind. I've lost her. I sighed heavily, slouching in place and letting my arms fall to my sides. I wouldn't stop her from leaving. I would do whatever she asked, even if that request meant she wanted me to keep my distance from her at all times. Fuck. My eyes bruised with grief, but I gritted my teeth and stayed stoic. I stared at her belly, unable to look into her stunning silver gaze as she walked away. God damn it, everything hurt. My head, my chest, the very blood in my veins. I'd felt loss before, so many times before. I'd watched pets being butchered and animals being tortured, and I'd mourned for them until I'd vomited up my uselessness to help. But that was nothing compared to this. She remained astonishingly silent as she poised over me, ready to push off and climb to her feet. Only? Her hands didn't go to my shoulders for perches to stand. Her hands went to my belt. I stiffened as she unbuckled me, unbuttoned me, unzipped me. I sucked in tattered gulps of air as her delicate hands went to my boxer briefs and tugged them away. I went lightheaded as she wrapped her small fingers around my throbbing hardness. I made a noise I couldn't contain as she ran her thumb through the bead of pre-cum at the top. She pressed on the slit sending shockwaves down my shaft and into my balls. The noise came again, torn from the bottom of my lungs, tangled with a snarl, a growl, a groan, a beg. I was completely at her fucking mercy as she pumped my length once, twice, then angled herself over me. Without a word, she positioned my cock at her entrance. Our eyes locked as my hands found her hips, holding on as she sank down my length, slow and torturous, hot and wet and tight. Fucking hell. My head fell back as I gave myself permission to feel everything, not just the physical part of what she did to me, but the emotional part, too. I let my heart bleed with affection. I let my lungs fog with devotion. I let my belly coil with so much fucking love for this woman. As she sank the final distance, slotting my body into hers, enveloping everything I was as a man, she fucking owned me. Every part. All of it. Forever. Her arms looped over my shoulders, her fingers linking behind my nape, her forehead pressed against mine so our eyelashes almost touched, blinking in shock and undiluted pleasure. I'd never had sex like this before. I'd never loved someone like this. And when she moved, I was no longer a man but full fucking beast, a beast who wanted to flip her onto her back and drive every inch inside her, 
to rot and mount and plunder and claim. But, thanks to Eleanor, I had a collar on. A collar that didn't feel like imprisonment, but freedom. I belonged to her, and I basked in her ownership. I let her fuck me. I shuddered each time she rose up and grunted each time she sank deep. We found a rhythm together, a rocking, quivering rhythm where each time we joined, we convulsed in absolute bliss. I'd gotten euphoria all wrong. It wasn't about how willing the women were or how wet they could become. It was about this. Love. That was the ultimate drug. The only drug. I was high on it. I was addicted to her. I would die in withdrawal if she ever took it away from me. My collar slipped a little, and my hands skated from her hip bones to her hair. Her hair. The hair I loved and couldn't stop touching. I shivered as the strands cascaded over my wrists and tickled the tops of my thighs. I gasped as Eleanor picked up the pace, riding me with lust as well as love. We lost ourselves in each other on the bare tiles of a virtual reality room. No furs, no fires, no caves in the middle of nowhere. Just bare bones of what hid behind illusions. The harness, the starkness, the emotionlessness of sex without a bond. I cradled her back as she leaned away from me, her breasts on offer for me to kiss and bite her breathy groan when I sucked my way down her cleavage and inserted her nipple into my mouth made me jerk with the warning of an orgasm. I wanted this to last. I wanted to stay inside her forever. But my tongue amplified Eleanor's desire, making her hips rock faster, her mouth parting with a plea. Harder, harder, please, God, harder. And that was it for my threadbare self-control. Pushing up with my legs, I tipped forward, doing my best to protect her back as we tumbled from sitting to lying. She winced as I splayed on top of her, my weight pinning her to the ground, my cock still deep inside. We paused for a second, staring at each other. Shock and suspicion bright in both of us that this was happening. That we'd once been two people with our own lives, spread before us, and now none of that shit mattered. All that mattered was I was hers, and she was mine, and the rest of the noise. It was gone. Insignificant, and totally fucking worthless. I thrust into her, driving her against unrelenting tile. She moaned and wrapped her legs around my ass, spreading wide, giving everything to me. We weren't high on elixir. I wasn't out of my mind with desire, and she wasn't on the cusp of death needing a release. This lust between us was pure and real, and no matter what I conjured in a lab, no matter the properties and pleasures my elixir could combine, it would never match this. Planting both hands by her ears, I drove upward, giving her what she wanted. Harder. Deeper. Fuck. Her fingernails scratched my spine as I fucked her with a violence that might seem primitive and barbaric, but really, I made love to her with every molecule of my body. I couldn't stop the rabid need to completely fill this woman. I couldn't slow down the desperate pumping as I rutted and groaned, pushing her along the floor with each thrust, so fucking thankful that she'd forgiven me. She hadn't said it in words— but I tasted her forgiveness in the very aura around us. I saw love shining in her beautiful eyes as I ducked to kiss her. Our lips met just as Pika and Skittles shot into the VR room, soaring and cawing, circling us from above while my body drove into Eleanor's. From their point of view, they'd see two creatures blind to everything else but their own need— a tangle of body parts and rocking hips of moans and groans and slippery flesh. I fucking loved it. I loved her. My tongue plunged into her mouth and her body bowed beneath mine. Oh God, Sully. She gave in to her orgasm, 
kissing me back with primal possession and greedy tongue, all while her pussy milked my cock with intense waves of release. I went with her. I shuddered each time her climax fisted me. I growled when my own ending rushed from my body in spurts of goddamn rapture. My body jerked with each pulse. I bit her throat as it grew far too intense. I crushed her and worshipped her and relished in the bruises I shadowed her with as they marked her as mine forever. Our hearts thundered to the same erratic beat as desire hammered us into pieces. With a final cry, she went lax beneath me, panting with exertion. I let my weight go, blanketing her, loving the heat of her, the wetness, the knowledge we'd done something that couldn't be undone. Our shared release left us limp and loose. Her hair looked like a million serpents covering the floor around us, and her hands stroked my spine as I returned to earth, giving me gentle after I'd given her rough. I nuzzled into her neck with overwhelming ecstasy. That was what she was. No, not just ecstasy. She was harmony. She brought harmony to my out-of-sync soul. Peace. She was peace. And I was the luckiest fucking bastard alive. Eleanor. Chapter 23. Where are we going? I padded beside Sully, bare feet in warm sand, my cotton dress thrown back over my well-fucked body, the remains of our lovemaking trickling down my leg. My skin begged for the ocean. Afternoon had replaced the morning and the humidity level had exceeded comfortable. The sun managed to sear my skin, even with the canopy of palm trees above us, and the overall brightness of the island promised a scorcher of a day. The only place to survive the intense heat would be to wallow in the sea, occasionally returning to the shore for an ice-cold glass of fresh lychee juice. I tugged Sully's hand that permanently snagged mine, our fingers entwined and palms glued together, neither of us caring that a slick of sweat blended us together. Do you want to swim? I'm hot. He chuckled, bringing my hand to his mouth and kissing my knuckles, never breaking his pace. His thick five o'clock shadow tickled my skin while his lips were so soft. You've read my mind. I frowned, doing my best not to be distracted by how much I still wanted him, how much I danced on air, how crazy all of this was. What he'd done in Euphoria was unforgivable, but what he'd said and done after was unbelievable. Both incidents canceled each other out. Hate plating with love, proving that both had to survive to make a relationship real, to ensure trust could blossom because I'd seen his bad parts. I'd endured his temper, cruelty, and darkness. His flaws were visible to me, and that allowed my heart to make an informed decision. He wasn't perfect, but neither am I. Our beginning was an acutesy story we could share over dinner, because it began in the blackness where Sully had dwelled for so long. However, I wouldn't trade it for the world, because meeting him this way was ten times better than meeting someone at a bar, or on a train, or at a friend's barbecue. Only seeing what they wanted me to see, asking me to base my choice on their rendition of who they are, not the nucleus of their truth. There were many things about Sully I might never accept. I didn't know how I felt, living in paradise, all while he asked traffickers to deliver more women, like me, to his door. I couldn't be selfish and ignore others' plights, just because my own had taken a turn for the better. But I also didn't want to be a martyr and throw away what I'd found. I wanted to keep him and save him, save them, save myself. Because as incredible as this revelation was, as much as my heart had sprouted little parrot wings and hovered with a mass of hummingbirds in my chest, I was still his prisoner. I was still his ward with no freedom to contact my family or go home. Not that I want to go home, yet. Leaving now would be the worst possible thing. This was too new, too fragile. We'd fought against the inevitability of falling in love, but our journey wasn't over. 
I doubted any relationship ever reached a point where either party didn't stop fighting to keep the other. After all, a relationship was inherently selfish. Selfish to continue feeling this way. Selfish to keep your lover close. Selfish not to share the happiness that you'd found with each other. Love could potentially be the best thing that ever happened to Sully and I. Or it could be the worst disaster we had ever had to live through. Sully continued to escort me down a jungle pathway, going further and further away from the beaches ringing his island. I squeezed his fingers gently. If we're going for a swim, the ocean is back that way. He looked down at me, his height another thing I loved about him. I found it intimidating and protecting at the same time. Who said anything about swimming in the ocean? I doubted he wanted to swim at the private pool for his goddesses. We didn't exactly want an audience after we'd stripped away our shields and let each other in. I didn't want to see anyone. I wanted him all to myself so I could stare into his beautiful blue eyes and see what he'd confessed to me. To assure myself I hadn't dreamed it, to convince myself this was real. He loved me. He'd told me without a mask on. He'd removed my sensors and destroyed the illusion until all that existed was us. And he did it for me. I wanted to hug him, to squish him close and never let go. Stop. I pulled on his hand, slowing him to a halt. The sandy laneway protected us from others. A few peals of masculine laughter sounded in the distance, along with the raised, flirty voice of a woman. The island had an uncanny ability at hiding its inhabitants, making it seem as if we were the only ones here, until I listened closely. How many goddesses did he have, exactly? How many guests stayed here at any one time? What's wrong? His eyes tightened, assessing me from head to toe. Are your feet burning? Need me to carry you? His lips twitched with a smug smirk. I don't mind carting you into the jungle. However, I can't promise you won't be fucked at some point along the way. He ducked, nuzzling his nose into my neck and biting me gently. It's almost impossible to walk beside you and not press you against a palm tree to sink inside you. Gathering me against his body, he pressed his erection against my belly. I'm in fucking torture, Jinx. Last time I was this hard, you'd snuck elixir into my drink. This time, it's because you've gifted me your heart. I shivered as he licked his way up my throat, tasting the salt on my skin and drinking up my tattered sigh. Why did you tell me to stop? He murmured, his tongue tracing my collarbone. My core clenched. No underwear meant the wetness he conjured mingled with our already shared pleasure, making the insides of my thighs sticky. I really wanted to swim. I needed to be clean so we could repeat everything all over again. My mind went blank as he squeezed my breast, fingering my nipple and biting hard on the crux of my shoulder and neck. I... I swallowed hard, doing my best to wrangle my sex-scattered thoughts into some sort of orderly fashion. Sully pulled away, his eyebrows tugged low, searching my face as if the reason why I'd pulled him to a halt was a bad one. That I'd woken up from whatever fugue he'd put me in and expected me to admit this was wrong, to announce that he wasn't the man I wanted after all. The mix of fear and fury in his eyes punctured my heart. Swooping up on my toes, I threw my arms around his neck and kissed him. Hard. Our lips bruised and tongues instantly sought each other. Mouths open, DNA exchanged, slippery and sexy with hunger. He groaned, crushing me in his arms as our kiss deepened, until I forgot about the need to swim and begged for him to pluck me from my feet and do what he threatened, to push me against a tree and fuck me. Christ, Eleanor. He growled as I dropped my hand and fisted his straining erection. He quaked in my hold, his hips shooting forward, pressing more of his hardness into my control. He wasn't lying. He felt like a piece of scorching steel. His mouth captured mine again, faster and deeper, determined to kill me with lust. I pumped him, all while his hand skated down my belly and cupped me through my dress. My body instantly reacted my clit swollen and needy, my inner muscles desperate to come again. All it would take was to spread my legs and unzip him. 
but he'd already taken me on the pathway. He'd had me on my knees and on my back and screaming out for mercy. Elixir had been the primary driving force for our first violent sexcapades. But this afternoon, I wanted more. Dropping my hand from his cock, I gently pushed his touch away from my pussy and plastered myself against him. My arms linked tight around his waist while I pressed my cheek over his heart and listened to the rampant chugging of his pulse. He froze. His back stiffened and muscles locked. What do you- I'm hugging you. I squeezed him harder. I stopped you because I wanted to hug you. He remained unyielding in my hold. It took forever. A painful forever that spoke so much of his past that he didn't relax straight away. His body continued to hum with power that could switch to violence at any moment, almost as if a hug always came with consequences he had no strength to face. Finally, a heart-breaking groan slipped from his lips as his spine went lax and his arms wrapped around me, squeezing me so damn tight. He kissed the top of my head, all while squashing me into him. A hug that ought to be soft and sensual vibrated with savage severity. He hugged me as if I'd vanish at any moment. My bones ached as we stayed clinging to each other, hidden by foliage and ferns, feeling things so awfully intense it crippled us from the inside out. I'd never felt this way, ever, about anyone. I'd never been borderline tears just because he was alive, never jealous of fictitious events that would take him away from me, never afraid of losing this priceless treasure of togetherness. The soft flutter of feathers announced we were no longer alone. Pika landed on Sully's head and Skittles took up position on my shoulder. Two winged creatures who seemed unsurprised that we'd morphed into one person. Sully chuckled in my ear as Pika squeaked and fossicked around in Sully's strands. Skittles had more decorum, giving us space to finish our hug in relative peace. Sully was the one to break our brutal connection. With a rough cough, he cleared his throat and pulled away from me. Our hands linked once again, neither of us wanting to cease total contact. Laughing under his breath, Sully went cross-eyed looking at Pika as the green fiend hung upside down from his hair, nipping and chirping at Sully's nose. Fuck, you're a rascal. He laughed again as Pika continued his rumbustious chatter, almost as if he was jealous and scolded his master, demanding equal attention. Sharing Sully with other people made me envious. Sharing him with Pika made me swoon. He's very possessive of you, I said, laughing as Pika pecked Sully's forehead before scrambling his way back on top of his head. He always has been. Sully grinned. But he's worse now that I've fallen for you. I reached to stroke Pika's tiny cheek. The little parrot eyeballed my finger as if contemplating biting me or accepting my olive branch. I won't take him from you, Pika. He squawked. Sully murmured. Don't lie to him, Jinx. He's a fucking lie detector. I'm not lying. I dropped my hand. I would never take you from him. You already did? No. I shook my head. I'm happy to share. I'm not. Sully ducked and kissed me. You're all mine, Eleanor Grace. I think Skittles might have something to say about that. I blushed as my own adoptee twittered like a disgruntled neighbor offended by displays of public affection. I scratched under her chin, still awed by the soft plumage of her outer feathers compared to the stiff quills beneath. Sully's expression darkened a little. She was my downfall. Watching her trust you. Watching her choose you over anyone. He shrugged. I didn't stand a goddamn chance after that. I blushed again as Skittles tweeted softly, scooting her feathered, warm body against my neck and puffing up in contentment. I'm just lucky. No. Sully placed his knuckles under my chin, forcing me to look up. She's just a good judge of character. Electricity crackled. Power ignited. No matter how many times we touched or kissed or fucked, the raw velocity between us never faded. If anything, it grew stronger each time. So strong, my entire body tingled with micro-lightning bolts. Dropping his hand, he pulled me into a walk. 
Come on, let's go for a swim. I fall into step with him, smiling. We're going to Nirvana, aren't we? He nodded. The one place where I can guarantee we'll be alone. Throwing me a sly smirk, he added. We need somewhere no one will hear us. Because if you think I've had my fill of you, Jinx, you are sadly fucking mistaken. Sullivan, Chapter 24 She was put on this planet to fucking torture me to death. Karma's plan to destroy me breath by breath, orgasm by orgasm. Get in the goddamn water, Jinx. I stood on the pebbly bottom of my waterfall. Fresh, cool liquid lapped around my thighs. Every instinct told me to dive under, to rinse away the stress, the sweat, the mix of euphoria oil that had smeared from Eleanor to me while we'd fucked on the floor of the VR room. But I couldn't. Not yet. Not until she obeyed me. The humidity levels were unbearable today. Even while walking the distance here, shirtless with just my suit trousers on, I'd begged for refreshing water to lower my body temperature. I didn't know if I ran hotter because of her. That's a lie. I knew that was why. I mean, fucking look at her. She stood on the shore, absolutely fucking naked. She'd slipped off her dress when I'd yanked off my trousers and walked bare-assed into the crystal blue pool at the bottom of Nirvana. The white noise of water tumbling from the moss-covered rocks drowned out any hint that anyone else lived on my shores. It was just me and her. Alone. Tiny rainbows danced in the pockets of sunlight, catching droplets and waterfall spritz. Jeweled dragonflies darted around my legs, snacking on microscopic bugs disrupted by my waiting. An iridescent purple kingfisher sat on the flax brush, eyeing up the dragonflies. A circle of life where predator and prey lived in paradise. I'd become a predator if Eleanor didn't get into the goddamn water. I was rock-fucking-hard. My balls ached to release. My stomach couldn't stop clenching. My heart thundered in tune to the heavy waterfall. I fisted myself, groaning loudly. You've got two seconds to get your ass here. Otherwise, I'm coming to get you, and I won't be gentle. Her gray eyes flashed as my voice tugged her forward. A leash of words, imprisoning us together with the promise of what would happen the moment she joined me in the pool. I saw a Komodo dragon slip in there when you passed out after Elixir. She shuddered. It was giant, Sully. It also has shark-like teeth with venom that can kill a person within hours of a bite. I pinched the top of my cock, starving off the rampaging lust in my blood. Get in the water, Jinx. She backed up. You expect me to swim after telling me that? Swim with something that can kill me. It won't kill you. How do you know? I rolled my eyes, doing my best not to laugh. I understood her fear. It stemmed from a biological need to manage risk. However, she should know me enough by now to understand that when it came to animals... They weren't what they seemed. I had an agreement with them. A binding contract that they entered into when I welcomed them on my shores. It took a hell of a lot of strength, but I stopped playing with myself and held out my hand. There isn't just one dragon that lives around this waterfall. There's four that I know of. There might be more now if they've paired up and bred. She blanched, scowling at my open hand, waiting for her to take it. That's not helping. I softened my tone. Each one is well-fed. They never go hungry. The two I rescued are disabled. Not that that prevents them from anything. One is missing a leg, the other half a tail. Both hurt by fishing trawlers just off my coast. The other two are wild, but have learned through the other's actions that I am off-limits. That you are off-limits. That it makes no sense to attack the hand that feeds them. I strode through the water wincing as my cock throbbed with each step. The only danger you're in, Eleanor, is from me. I can promise they won't bite and maul you, but I can't say the same for me. Water splashed around my legs as I climbed onto the shore and snatched her around the middle. Not giving her any warning, I scooped her off her feet and into my arms, bridal style. 
Her breasts jiggled as she clung to my shoulders. Her sticky flesh was a fucking aphrodisiac to my already out-of-control desire. Holding her tight, I sought her lips and kissed her. I held nothing back. I bit her bottom lip. I stuck my tongue in her mouth. I plunged inside her, wishing it was my cock and not just my tongue. She moaned, swept away by my urgent need for her, completely oblivious as I waded back into the waterfall and sank beneath the surface. Her mouth opened wide as water crashed over our heads, submerging us mid-kiss. I held her tight as she squirmed for air, keeping her in the quiet serenity of liquid for another swipe of my tongue, sharing oxygen, life, lust. Pushing off from the bottom, I held her head above the water, laughing as she swatted hair from her eyes and spluttered dramatically. You're acting as if I drowned you, she glowered. A little warning would have been nice. I did give you warning. I kissed the tip of her nose. I told you to get your ass in the water. Otherwise... You are a pain in my ass. She slapped my chest, sending water splashing. Her lips twitched, fighting off a smile. I laughed harder, relishing in the freedom such a sound brought. Despite my shock that I was capable of such a thing... I was still uncomfortable with the sickly sweet sensation of happiness gushing through my veins. Instinct told me to run from it, that within the sparkling brightness of joy I would find the worst pain I'd ever been subjected to. But the other part of me, the risk-taker and suicidal idiot just begging for a mate, said, Fuck it. I wanted to laugh. I wanted to be free. I want her, and I'm fucking keeping her. I can be a pain in your ass, I smirked. Or I can give you pleasure, depending on what you deserve. I deserve a vow in writing that a damn Komodo dragon isn't about to nibble on my toes. They're pretty delicious-looking toes. Oh, please don't tell me you have a foot fetish. I have a you fetish. She blushed. I think I broke you. I don't recognize this, Sully. That's because you killed the old one. I nuzzled her wet hair. It's okay, though. He was a cunt anyway. Yet I fell in love with him, despite his cunty behavior. You poor, unfortunate soul. Yep. She nodded sagely. I'm doomed. Doomed for life. Purgatory with a beast. A beast who will nibble on your toes. I laughed, drowning in this newfound sarcasm between us. Sarcasm, not dripping in peril and foreboding, but lighthearted fun. Shit. I'm having fun. My smile fell at the wonder of it. My laughter stopped at the shock of it. I never fucking thought I'd be happy that I could switch from the blackness of my everyday world and somehow find so much light just because of her. All playfulness and teasing bled out of me, leaving the quaking need to fill her, to plunge my body into hers and never fucking let her go. She gasped as I opened my arms, relinquishing her to the water's embrace. Come with me. I struck off into a crawl, slicing through the refreshing coolness, heading directly toward the splashing, crashing waterfall. I didn't look back. She'd follow. She had to. Her refusal would be unthinkable at this point. My hard-on made it difficult to swim, the gush of water taunting me to find a different kind of wetness. A wetness I'd find the moment I fucked Eleanor. Snatching a quick breath, I duck-dived under the heavy pound of water, buffeted by the torrent of currents and eddies, kicking my way to the small cave hidden behind the falls. Breaking the surface, I swam to the small rock ledge about half a meter underwater and waited for her. She didn't disappoint me. Her head popped up a few moments later, the shape of her face highlighted thanks to wet hair plastered to her sun-kissed shoulders. Her eyes seemed bigger, her lashes thicker, her lips redder. I couldn't tell any more if she was the most stunning human alive or a true immortal goddess sent to slay me. 
She already had my heart in her keeping. If anything happened to her, it would kill me through sheer rules of biology. I couldn't survive without a heart. I would die. She can't ever leave. I would do whatever it took to provide her with every wish and desire, so she never asked for her freedom. Because if I granted her her freedom, it would be like locking me in a cage all over again. I can't do it. Not now she'd shown me what was possible between us. I didn't speak as she swam toward me, her small hands landing on my thighs under the water, keeping her in place from the swirling water around us. My eyes snapped shut as her fingers trailed up my legs, wrapping around my cock with no pretense or shyness. Just like I knew she belonged to me, she knew I belonged to her. There were no games, no lies. My cock was hers. She could touch it whenever she goddamn wanted. She could have it any way she wanted. Just like her pussy was mine. Wrapping my fingers over hers on my erection, making her squeeze me painfully tight, I growled. Are you wet? Her eyes flashed. Is that a trick question? I need to know if I'm going to hurt you. Has the swim washed away? I'm wet, Sully. Her cheeks pinked. I'm always wet around you. In that case... Shoving her away from me, I slipped off the edge and pressed her belly against it. The second her fingernails dug into the slippery stone, I spread her legs and slotted myself behind her. I'm going to fuck you now. I speared up, ruthless and true with my aim. She screamed as I filled her in one slick impale. The waterfall swallowed her cry, keeping us hidden, granting us privacy to be whatever we wanted. Gripping her by the nape, I thrust into her. My legs kicked with power, driving her belly up and onto the rock. Her body lay prone on an unmovable surface, holding her firm for my taking. She screamed again as I didn't hold back. I drove every inch into her. My balls pressed against her clit. My weight pressed her flat onto the rock. There'd been time for playfulness, and now this was sobriety to that drunken joy. A grave reminder that I needed both. I needed her light. I needed her dark. I needed to hurt us with the insane amount of need she created in me. I snarled as my pace turned manic. Nothing soft, nothing gentle. I didn't stop the savage noises falling from my lips, just like she didn't. She moaned and screamed. She yelled my name while I fucked her. Then Nirvana swallowed each and every one, hiding our fiery, bone-snapping releases, keeping us hidden while we figured out how to exist in this new, terrifying existence. Eleanor, Chapter 25 How many goddesses do you own? I kept my gaze on the table laden with delicious food. His chef had been busy creating vegetarian fare that rivaled any five-star restaurant, using ingredients I'd never heard of, blending flavors that exploded on my tongue. After Sully had taken me ruthlessly hard in Nirvana, we'd spent the rest of daylight swimming in the cool embrace of fresh water. His villa's deck had been designed to have access to the waterfall, providing steps from the pebbly bottom all the way to the cantilever platform with sun loungers and a table with a large white umbrella. Sully had climbed those steps twice while we swam, his ass clenching in perfect muscular symmetry as water sluiced down his skin. He had returned with freshly squeezed apple and strawberry juice, piled high with ice and a slice of papaya wedged in the side. We drank the much-needed hydration while sitting naked on his deck, our legs jangling in the water. I'd never stayed naked this long, never fully lost my self-consciousness being completely bare. But Sully made it so easy, so right. His cock hung heavy between his thighs as he watched me suck on the paper straw, drinking what he'd made me. Each breath, he'd grown harder until our drinks were abandoned for a different kind of thirst. 
He pulled me onto his lap and speared into me, the same way I'd taken him after he'd told me he was in love with me. We rocked together until we came together, and then he pushed off from the step and tumbled us deep into the water, sluicing our shared releases away, raking his hands through his hair as he popped to the surface. In all honesty, it'd been the best afternoon of my life. I'd never been so content, so cared for, so utterly in love with absolutely everything. From the sunset glowing fire through the palm trees, to the roosting sounds of birds all around us, to the serenade of cicadas, crickets, and frogs as night fell. Pika and Skittles never went far, pruning themselves on branches while we swam, visiting us and stealing morsels of fruit and vegetables while we ate dinner. This truly was paradise. Yet, it wasn't paradise for everyone. Sully stiffened in his chair. His hair had dried into a wild tangle of dark and bronze swept off his forehead. He wore a simple black t-shirt and cargo shorts, loaning me a blue and white striped shirt that I'd fastened with a belt around my waist, fashioning a simple dress. We'd shared a shower in his amazing bathroom, watching the waterfall turn silver in the rising moonlight, taking turns to soap and rinse, sharing a kiss when he passed me a towel. Our interactions were laced with lust, but also so at ease with domestication. I didn't understand how it could be so simple, so peaceful between us. I expected an argument, a ripple, something to disrupt the endless satisfaction I felt in his company. Maybe that was why I'd asked a condemning question after we'd spent the day making small talk on the animals around his villa, Saragala, and a few hush-hush drugs his scientists were working on. Maybe it was my turn not to trust him, trust us, trust that love could be like this. Why do you want to know? Sully asked, his tone carefully guarded. He reached for char-grilled mushrooms stuffed with aubergine and drizzled in coconut cream. I mulled over his question. Did I want to know so I could berate him into freeing them? Did I want to know how many girls I had to share with him with? Did I want to know for good reasons or for selfish ones? I settled on honesty and shrugged. Honestly, I don't know. I don't agree with what you're doing, but it's hypocritical of me to say that as a here I am, eating the food their services provided, willingly turning a blind eye to love you. I guess I sighed and finished. I'm just glad Calico, Jupiter, and Neptune are gone. But that's not enough for you. His chair creaked as he shifted his weight. You want me to free them all? I dared look up, catching his stern stare. Would you? Would you stop? He gritted his teeth, avoiding that question and answering the easier of the two. Seven. There are seven here, currently. Including you. I flinched. And how many guests at any given time? He rolled his shoulders, popping a cherry tomato into his mouth. Not many. Three at the moment. I don't like crowds. I half smiled. Three isn't a crowd. Two is a crowd if I don't like the other person. He pinned me to the spot with his blistering blue gaze. Pushing his plate aside, he leaned forward. Look, Eleanor. I will not apologize for what I am. I've told you before and I'll tell you again. Humans are not above treatment deemed perfectly humane for other creatures. I provide the best care, nutrition, and free-range existence that I can. Their lives are mostly likely a thousand times better than they were when they didn't belong to me. His voice grew testy, sharp. If you can't accept that, then... We have a serious fucking problem. My back locked in my chair. Goosebumps shot over my arms. There's the argument. You brought this upon yourself. I'd done this, but I wasn't prepared to finish it. I wasn't prepared to draw a line in the sand between us. Not yet. Maybe soon there would come a time when his morals would be a breaking point for me. But right now, I was too swept up on hormones and dopamine to put strangers I didn't know before the monster I'd fallen for. Sucking in a breath, I forced myself to say, we don't have a problem, Sully. Not yet, at least. I understand your reasoning, 
and I even agree with it to a certain extent. But I don't believe any creature should live a life of captivity. All I'm requesting is some sign that you're open to a different alternative. Possibly. Maybe. Some time in the future. He scowled, leaning back in his chair. It took the longest few seconds of my life before he nodded once. Possibly. Maybe. His lips twitched, ceasing our fight. Sometime in the future. I exhaled with relief. That's all I'm asking. How old are you? He asked, his head tilting to the side with dark curiosity. You're younger than me, but by how much? I smiled, casting off the tension from before. Twenty-two. You? He swiped a hand over his mouth, groaning a little. Eleven years your senior. You don't look like a senior. I peered at his hair. No grays that I can see. Yet, at least. He chuckled once. Oh, there, there. Stress-related, mainly. How can you be stressed when you live in a place like this? I waved at the perfection of enjoying a candlelit dinner on a deck overlooking a waterfall. His jaw clenched, reliving things I couldn't see. I'm not very good at putting things in the past. What things? He narrowed his gaze. Is this what I get for falling in love with you? Death by a thousand questions? I grinned. Oh, don't worry, Sully. I'll find plenty of ways to murder you slowly. He laughed, the sound deep and gravelly, a sound that echoed through my heart and core, making me tingle and crave at the same time. Thanks for the warning. His eyes danced. I feel like I might have made a grave mistake. Too late now. I scooted my chair closer to his, no longer hungry for dinner. What's your biggest flaw? Tell me now, so I'm not heartbroken. His mirth fell, leaving behind harsh reality. You already know. I procure women and use them for my benefit. I waved that fact away. No, a character trait. That's a choice. Give me the flaw that's ingrained on your very makeup. Something you will never be able to change, no matter how persuasive I am. His lips thinned. Why? What does that prove? I shrugged. I don't know, just making conversation. So this is an inquisition instead of dinner? This is getting to know the person our hearts have chosen. We feel something we can't explain. We are connected in ways I doubt will ever unravel. But I don't know you. I don't know. You know me better than anyone. His hand shot out, cupping my chin. Literally. Anyone. Even Cal? He winced, letting me go as quickly as he'd grabbed me. Calvin. He looked away, staring at Nirvana. Cal has been there since the beginning. He knows more than he should. It could make him a liability if I didn't trust him. Ah, so you do trust someone. He scowled. He earned it before I lost the ability to do such a thing. He was there when I... His lips snapped together, shutters slamming over his eyes. If what he'd done matched the sudden grief and death swimming in his gaze, then I didn't want to know. Not here, under a silver moon with the scents of jasmine and hibiscus nullifying the outside world. He's your friend. I get it. He remained tight and tense. I suppose you could call him that. Just like jealousy is your friend. I paused, keeping a careful eye on his reaction. That was one anomaly I couldn't figure out. Jess, jealousy, seemed to have my back. She'd given me the truth about Sully's actions with the diamond and euphoria. She genuinely seemed to want us to be together. But why? Was she truthful with her simple request to give Sully his freedom so the others could have theirs? And how did she know so much about Sully's mental state? Jealousy is someone I tolerate more than most. Sully murmured. She's transparent and upfront. I've never caught her lying, and believe me, I'm pretty good at sniffing out lies. 
You know she's been spying on you, right? I agree. She is up front. She wasn't afraid to tell me things about you that I'm guessing you probably didn't want her to tell me. He smiled, his teeth sharp in the moonlight. That's the reliable thing about her. She's a great little spy. She tells me things about the other goddesses. She listens and she watches. She's made her loyalties known. She even told me she was going to tell you about the diamond and that I'd made her fuck Grammar and Slater as you. He reached for his tumbler, holding a splash of amber alcohol. She gave me a few days' warning. So, she threatened you? No, she encouraged me. He sipped his drink, his throat working as he swallowed. Would you have told me if she hadn't? A shard of hurt poked my heart. It was stupid to be hurt that Sully had needed encouragement to pursue me. I should be thankful to jealousy, not worry about her motives. Sully jerked my chair into his, crashing us together with a smack of wood. Get that pain out of your eyes, goddess Jinx. He swiveled me around until our knees pressed together. His large hands landed on my thighs, squeezing me with authority. I confessed to you, as there was no other way forward. Grabbing a fistful of his burrowed shirt and casing me, he pulled me onto him and kissed me hard. Our teeth clacked as he fed me the taste of sharp liquor, sweeping his tongue over mine, biting my bottom lip. When he stopped making me lightheaded and wet, he whispered, I'm surprised I didn't fall to my knees the second you arrived and fucking proposed. That's how wrapped up in you I am. A stupid smile spread my lips. I swooned into him, kissing him again, taking my time to tangle my tongue with his, deepening the kiss, making our hearts race to the same chaotic beat. I pulled away, drunk on him and loose-lipped with honesty. I wanted to travel Asia, Malaysia and Singapore, Thailand and Indonesia. When I agreed to travel with Scott, I thought we were on the same page with our itineraries. But instead of flying to Asia, he convinced me to go to Mexico. Sully bared his teeth. I suggest you don't talk about another boy in my company, Eleanor. Not when my cum still fills you. Not when I can't handle. I kissed him, stealing his sudden anger, his fiery possessiveness. Only once his fists unclenched did I pull away and continue. I think I wanted to fly to Asia because you were here. There was something inside me, a tug, an impatience, something I couldn't describe, telling me I needed to explore this part of the world. I couldn't explain it because I'd never been here, so why was I so adamant I needed to travel to exotic places I couldn't name? I traced my thumb over his damp lip, cupping his stubble-covered jaw. Just the wonder of being allowed to touch him like this shot another dose of agonizing love through my bloodstream. I like to think we would have met, in different circumstances, that I would have been on some cruise around your islands and you would have felt me close. We would have met and sparks would have flown and we'd be on equal footing. At least I would have come to you as a free woman and not a slave you bought from a shopping list. I meant for my revelation to be sweet, romantic, Instead, Sully shot to his feet and dragged me into his villa. He didn't stop until he'd carted me through the simple lounge and into his bedroom. The sugar glider leapt from its perch on a floor lamp in shock, its parachute-like body sailing it across the room to the sideboard by the open doors to the deck. It vanished outside, just as Pika and Skittles flew in, swooping to a halt on the rafters and the ceiling. Animals scurried left and right, geckos and moths, even a bat, appeared from the bathroom. All creatures felt so safe in his presence that they made their home in his home. Yet I was absolutely terrified. What have I done? Sully's tight grip let me go as he abandoned me on the woven flax mat at the foot of his bed and marched toward his bedside table. Ripping it open, he fisted a few pages, then stormed back toward me. First, there would be no crews around my islands. No one has the exact coordinates or maritime permission to enter my waters. He shook the papers on my face. Second, you weren't ordered from a shopping list. I told you I dreamed about you. 
You wormed your way into my head, and I couldn't get you out of it. Grabbing my hands, he wrapped my fingers around the paper he held. And third, you fight so hard for the other goddess's freedom, but you don't fight for your own. Here, take it. I hoped you'd never fucking ask for it, but at least this way, it's done. We both know where we stand. Both know the other isn't trapped in this if they don't want to be. Dropping his hold, he let me study what he'd forced me to take. A contract. A simple email between him and the bastards who'd stolen me. A description of me. A reply they'd found me. A receipt of funds exchanged in my honor. Five hundred thousand dollars. I gulped and looked up. I'm worth half a million to you? He laughed once, cold and angry. You're fucking priceless to me. Snatching the paperwork, he tore it down the middle, then again and again until confetti fell from his hands to the floor. Breathing hard, he splayed his fingers and stepped into the pile of paper. You need to be on an even playing field? Fine. You're free. I rescind any ownership I have over you. You are no longer a goddess or a slave. You are just a girl who I happen to fall madly fucking in love with. And if that's not enough for you, then... Once again, we have a serious fucking problem. Because Jinx... He stepped into me and scooped me into his arms. Carrying me to the bed, he placed me in the middle and climbed onto the mattress, crawling over me like a beast ready to mount and maul. You asked me what my greatest flaw is. Well, listen closely, because you do well to heed it. He kissed his way along my jaw, his hand shoving my shirt dress away from my bare pussy, then quickly shoving his shorts down to his thighs. I had no warning as his cock shoved its way deep inside me. My back arched, my mouth opened. I gasped at the dominant intrusion and the lace of delicious pain. He ground his hips into mine, filling me, owning me. My greatest flaw is when I love, I love without end. I am overprotective to those I care about, to the point of obsession. I go out of my way to protect them from everything, real threats and perceived. I've killed those I've tried to keep safe, purely from not being able to stop. I've killed those who have lied to me, double-crossed me, and betrayed those vulnerable in my care. He dug his elbows into the mattress, driving deeper and harder into me. I will do whatever it takes to keep you safe. Any methods required. Any bloodshed needed. I will never allow you to be unsheltered by me. If that scares you, it's meant to. I know my limitations, and I have none when it comes to those I love. Animal or human, I never let go. He read it into me, seeking my mouth and kissing me. His lust blended with apology, almost as if he knew how manic he sounded, how many triggers his disclosure should ignite. And it did. He basically gave me my freedom, but took it away in the same breath. He once used money to own me. Now he used love. And I didn't know which was scarier. What debt was worse. And why didn't I care? Why did I moan under him? Why did I spread my legs wider and dig my fingernails into his ass, jerking him deeper into me? Were we as insane as the other? Have I lost my damn mind? Sully growled as his cock swelled inside, stretching me, hurtling me straight toward a ricocheting release. We rocked together, violent and vicious, chasing the madness that had infected us both. He rocked into me, pressing my clit with each thrust, hurtling me toward the cliff where all good orgasms originate. It siphoned through my toes, legs, hands, and heart. I came alive with it. I moaned with it. I threw my head back and let him shove me headfirst into a milking, clenching climax, all while he drove again and again, taking me, fucking me, loving me. His snarl when he came made my heart hitch with fear. He sounded wild and untamable and totally like a man used to being God with no consequences. It turned me on. It made me feel powerful, so damn powerful to be held by a man so ruthless. He jerked and shuddered, spurting inside me until his entire body jolted, and he tumbled to his side. 
Breathing hard, he manhandled me until he spooned me from behind. His heart hammered against my back, keeping tune with mine. Kissing my hair, he whispered, I'm sorry. Those sorts of things I should keep hidden. It makes me sound like a monster. I stroked his forearm as it wrapped tight around my breast, gluing me to him. You haven't scared me off, even though I should probably run for my life. He nuzzled into me, inhaling my scent and groaning softly. I'm afraid you wouldn't get far, Eleanor. The time for running is well and truly over. I smiled as quietness descended, helping our breathing regulate. If I'm free, it means you have to let me go if I ask. He shuddered, kissing my nape. Will you ask? Are you going to break me all over again? Skittles landed on the pillow beside me. She puffed up and nudged her tiny beak against my nose. With a quiet chirp, she turned in a circle and plopped down as if the pillow was her chosen nest. Her eyes promptly closed, granting serenity to the night, to me. I bent my head and kissed Sully's forearm. If I ask you to free me, it's because something has gone terribly, terribly wrong with us. But I can never see me asking, Sully Sinclair, because you, you are perfect for me. And I'm not afraid to be loved by you, despite your black and white boundaries. Don't make promises you can't keep. Don't say you trust me if you don't. He jerked, but slowly relaxed and snuggled close. You've earned my trust. You've stolen my heart. I guess that will have to be enough for now. I yawned, slipping beneath the physical and mental exhaustion of the day. I love you. If that makes me crazy, reckless, stupid, and naive, so be it. I love you, Sully Sinclair, and... His hand jerked my chin to the side, his lips planting over mine, kissing me from behind. He kissed me with every depth of feeling glowing between us. He made tears squeeze from my eyes. He made my body liquefy in his arms. And when the kiss switched from consuming to calming, and our lips barely grazed each other as we slipped from consciousness to dreamland, I'd never been so contented. I fell asleep with Sully wrapped around me, our hearts thumping as one, our confessions and commitments shining like stars above us. Sullivan, Chapter 26 I love you, Jinx, I smiled, carefree and happy. A decade had slipped from my shoulders, removing sins and secrets, eradicating the heavy blackness from my life. The coffee-haired goddess with her silver eyes didn't turn around at my declaration. My heart skipped a beat as I scowled and moved to stand in front of her. Did you not hear me? She blinked, staring at me with no recognition whatsoever. I'm sorry. What did you say? I said I love you. She stepped backward, her hand going to her chest. But I don't even know you. My temper sparked with dry tinder. What the hell are you talking about? Of course you fucking know me. Her beautiful face blanched. I've never seen you before. Fuck. The pain. I'd never felt such pain. Whatever you're doing, Eleanor, stop it. Right now. True fear smoked in her gray gaze. Please. You're scaring me. I honestly don't know who you are. You're mine. That's who you are. I went to snatch her, to shake some sense into her. But a mirrored wall bounced my reflection with warning. A man I'd never seen before stared back. He matched my movements, mimicked my motions. Every breath I took, he did. Every twitch he copied. Every blink he parroted. What the? My heart bucked as I scratched at my jaw staring at blonde stubble and shaved head instead of my usual dark features. Eleanor continued to back away, fog curled around her feet, steadily obscuring her. No! I rushed toward her. Wait, it's Sully, you know me, you love me, wait! She wrung her hands, desperate to get away from me. I'm sorry, you're confused. 
You need help. I'm not who you think I am. You are. You're mine, goddammit. I'm in love with you with all my fucking soul. The fog continued to hug her, deleting her wisp by wisp. Euphoria. That's why she didn't recognize me. I was in euphoria, hiding within a different character. Rushing to the mirror, I yanked at the blonde stubble. I scratched at the bald head. I stuck my fingers in my eyes to remove the sensors blocking me from the truth. Pinching the slippery suckers, I yanked them from my gaze and threw them to the floor. With a huge exhale, I looked at the mirror again, lightheaded with relief that I'd figured it out. All I had to do was remove Eleanor's sensors, too, so she could see me, recognize me, come home with me. Yet, as I raised my head and stared into my gaze, green stared back, not blue. Red hair loose around my shoulders, burly stance, a Highlander from the Scottish Moors. No! I glanced over my shoulder, searching for Eleanor, ready to get on my fucking knees for help. But the fog had stolen her from me. I was all alone, shedding the skins of impostors, unable to find who I truly was behind so many fucking masks. I punched the mirror. It smashed, but repaired itself, the splinters of glass reforming and changing my reflection from red hair to dreadlocks a man with an ear-piercing and rings on his fingers. I howled and scratched at my face. Another mask fell. A new man stared back, this one bristling with a black mohawk and heavily shadowed eyes. Stop! It didn't stop. The shedding increased in speed. Over and over, masks continued to fall and appear, obscuring me from myself, a never-ending carousel of strangers. Greek, Chinese, African, Swedish, every nationality— every shape and size. Until finally, I slammed to my knees in terror and turmoil, unable to stare into another pair of unknown eyes, so fucking lost, crippling under the defeat of losing Eleanor. My breath caught. The final disguise fell away, leaving a kid standing in the rubble. A kid I did recognize. A kid with bruises and bumps of badly healed broken bones a kid with a one-eyed dog at his side, covered in the wounds that had killed him. Pika appeared, squawking in panic, unable to figure out what had happened to me. He flew around the boy, around and around, until he gave up and catapulted away. The kid stared at the broken man in the mirror and said, You gave that bird his freedom and he stayed. You gave the girl her freedom and she didn't. She left because how can she trust a man who doesn't recognize himself? How can she love a man who doesn't deserve her trust? How can any goodness come from such lies? I wanted to kill the boy, to stop his awful message. But he stepped out of the mirror. He became me. His voice in my skull. His past hopes and dreams crushing me with disappointment. It's better she's gone. She's safer this way. Don't you agree? A single tear rolled down my cheek as Pongo, the dog I'd tried to rescue only to sign his death warrant, disintegrated into dust. The voice of my adolescent self echoed through my bleeding chest. Everything you love dies, Sinclair. Everything you treasure is gone. That's your true curse. The one you can never run from. The bed shook. The villa creaked. The air boomed with explosive thunder. My eyes tore open. My body leapt upright, ready for battle, primed and on high alert. Earthquake? Tsunami? Eleanor. I dropped my fists, no longer ready to fight an imaginary demon, but needing to touch the girl I loved. I held out my palm as she scrambled across the mattress toward me. Sully, what the hell was that noise? I don't know keeping her close, so fucking thankful she was still with me and the nightmare was over. I dragged her to the deck and outside. Dawn had already begun, shoving back the stars, making way for sunshine and another tropical day. No rain, no lightning. The boom hadn't been thunder from the many angry storms we endured. The waterfall continued to cascade, the blue pool serene with its glittering ripples. So what the fuck woke us? 
almost as if the universe heard my question and decided to give me a precise and definite answer. Another crack sounded, followed by the terrifying reverberation of war. Boom. Fucking boom. A plume of smoke rose in the distance, kilometers away but black as cloying death. Fuck. 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 Letting Eleanor go, I bolted back into the villa and snatched my phone from the sideboard. Cal answered before the line properly rang. I heard. Already got pilots yanking on their pants. I'll meet you at the helicopter. My heart smashed against my rib. He's going to fucking pay for this. I have no doubt. Cal crashed into something, probably hauling his own clothes on. I looked down at my naked body. A body that had been inside Eleanor. A body containing a heart that had believed it was worthy of some goddamn happiness after so long. Turned out fate wasn't done tormenting me yet. Or torturing those I loved. I'll see you at the helipad in seven minutes, I hissed. One minute to dress, six minutes to bolt down the sandy path from Nirvana. It was a fucking eternity. If Drake had hurt anything, Christ, he'll pay. I'll make him pay with every droplet of his toxic blood. No mercy this time, no fucking leniency. He's dead. Throwing my phone on the bed, I stormed into my wardrobe and threw on whatever I reached first, slacks and a white T-shirt. I grabbed boots instead of expensive loafers. Eleanor intercepted me as I came back out. She'd pulled the sheet from my bed and wrapped it around her gorgeous body. Her eyes were as wide as I'd ever seen them. Behind her, black smoke thickened up the sky. Shit. Sully, what's going on? Grabbing her by the shoulders, I marched her to the mattress and shoved her down. Stay here, don't go anywhere. Stuffing my phone into my pocket, I swiped a shaky hand through my hair. I split down the middle. I didn't want to leave her. But I cursed every moment she held me back. She popped up from the bed, amplifying my panic, bleeding into rage. Sit down, Eleanor! Her cheeks pinked with matching temper. What the hell is going on? Tell me. Let me help. You can't help. Backing away to the door, I imprinted her to memory. The nasty pain from my dream had ghosted into reality. This felt like a goodbye, not just a short parting. This felt final. She held up her hand, stepping toward me. I bared my teeth. Do not leave my villa. I have to deal with this. Deal with what? My motherfucking brother, I snarled. He's attacked Saragala. Her terrified inhale was the last sound I heard as I turned and charged from my villa. I turned my back on my future to protect my past. I chose animal over human, meek over immortal, creature over soulmate. Eleanor, Chapter 27 I wasn't fast enough. The second Sully vanished, I threw on the borrowed shirt and bolted after him. I ran as fast as I could. My lungs burst. My legs burned. I kept pushing, trying the impossible to catch up with him. But I was too late. Gasping for air, I stood on the shoreline, squinting into the newly risen sun, dying inside as the helicopter holding Sully and Cal flew into the plume of black smoke in the distance. From here, it looked like a volcano had gone off, spewing fire and hatred into the atmosphere, tainting the air with carcinogens and ash. Only, Sully had said his brother had attacked Saragala. He had a brother? And if he did, why on earth would he attack a sanctuary for disabled and diseased animals? What sort of psychopath would do such a thing? Swallowing hard, doing my best to get my breathing under control, I wrapped my arms around myself, drenched with a sudden chill. How could a few short hours separate the best time of my life to the most uncertain? Sully had been wild. Each word that had fallen from his mouth had sounded like a snarling pack of wolves. Yesterday, I'd found him so unbelievably handsome. The more we revealed about ourselves, the more I found him attractive. Each time his shields came down, I spied an equally beautiful soul hidden within its host. 
His laughter. Wow, it had the power to stop my heart, to stop my thoughts, to completely wrap me up in an embarrassing amount of devotion. There had been no laughter this morning. I'd hardly recognized him. His eyes had been feral, his temper on the shortest leash. Not directed at me, but his family. A brother who had done something monstrous. I sighed as the helicopter vanished into the smoky horizon. I hated the distance, not just physical, but emotional. Sully had withdrawn from me. The link between his heart and mine had been severed. You're reading into things. You were both literally woken up by a bomb. Of course he would be short and rushed to attend the wreckage. Common sense was a kind matron, speaking wisdom I really ought to accept. So why was there a noxious little sparrow on my shoulder, whispering of endings and goodbyes and that love wasn't eternal after all? Skittles descended, scattering that little sparrow intent on whispering unpleasant, repellent things. She pecked my cheek gently, worry trembling her feathered body. Pika squeaked as he landed on my other shoulder, his black eyes locked on the sky. He'll be back, guys. I promise. My voice didn't sound nearly as confident as it should. Get a grip, Ellie. What's gotten into you? Nothing had changed between us. Yes, circumstances had ripped us apart this morning, but that was just life. Work and errands and other commitments would always intrude on a new romance. I sighed, slouching into myself. Then why can't I shake this horrible premonition that yesterday is all I'm going to have with him? Hey! A feminine arm slinked around my waist, squeezing me gently. You okay? I turned my head, smiling sadly at jealousy. She wore a pink polka dot singlet and pajama shorts, her blonde hair still messy from sleep. Seemed the noise had woken everyone early this morning. Yeah, I'm okay. You? She eyed up Skittles and Pika commandeering my shoulders before turning her attention to the ominous blackness on the horizon. The faint smell of burning overshadowed the sea breeze. God, please don't let those animals be hurt. Jealousy huffed under her breath, looking as morose as I felt. For once, you know more than me about this current situation. Fill me in? I shrugged. Not much to tell. Sully's brother attacked Saragala. Ah, uh, yes. Drake. He's a fucking asshole. You know him? She shook her head. Heard of him. Falling quiet for a moment, she asked quietly. And what's on Saragala? Is that the island where he sends all that animal feed to? Does he have an army of pets that he keeps hidden? It's a rehab facility for lab animals and other abused cases. Oh, she nod on her bottom lip. And the chances of it being blown to bits? My heart fisted. Hopefully zero. But if it is, she flinched. How many just died? Tears glossed my gaze as the sea lapped around our ankles and two parrots cooed sadly in my ears. Hundreds? Thousands? Enough that it will destroy Sully. Jealousy dropped her arm from around my waist. Oh. I nodded, unable to fight the liquid tracking down my cheeks. Yes, oh. Whatever Sully was about to face, whatever war he was about to reap, he wouldn't be the same man when he returned. Whatever progress I'd made, whatever connection we'd built, it might have been murdered, along with so many other lives lost today. That was why I was so afraid. That was why I couldn't stop the trickle of ice. If Sarah Gala had been attacked, it didn't matter what I felt for Sully or what he felt for me. His loyalties were fierce to those who couldn't speak, to the vulnerable creatures with four legs, wings, and tails. He would fight for them. He would reap vengeance for them, as he should. But where would I be? Would he let me fight beside him, or would he push me away? I didn't have an answer, and as the sun rose higher in the sky and jealousy kept me company while we watched more smoke billow and stronger sense of charred earth and flesh trailed over the sea, I did my best not to be worried. 
But I was worried. So, so worried. Because we might be over before we've even begun. Sullivan, Chapter 28 Wearing white to total carnage was a gruesome wardrobe choice. Blood painted my t-shirt and slacks. Bone fragments and brain pieces. Charred fur and dismembered animal parts. I wore it all as I dug through the smoking wreckage. Thanks to my team of gardeners on Leba and their tanker of fresh water to grow my crops, we'd put out the fire caused by Drake's bomb. We'd salvaged part of the veterinary practice, saved a few holding pens, ceased fire from chewing its way through the dog enclosure and pieced together parts of the rabbit warren. But that was it. Everything else. The barns piled high with feed and medicine. The high-tech surgery for large and small beasts. The hours upon hours of excavating, building, planting, creating, had all been destroyed. Along with so many, many fucking lives. Four hours ago, I'd been ready to jump aboard the helicopter and fly after Drake. To make his body blow apart like Cuthbert the pig and the adorable otters who'd been so close to releasing back into the wild. I wanted to see his brain splattered in the soil. I wanted his blood coagulating beneath the hot sun. I wanted the stench of his decaying body ripe in the air. I wanted him in motherfucking bits. But vengeance would have to come after I'd offered triage to those left behind. The singed monkeys, and charred beagles, and every other critter that had already suffered so much. Cal and I worked side by side with locals and staff. The Indonesian people operated under the law of karma, and they arrived in droves, pulling ashore in their fishing trawlers or hitching a ride on a sea vessel, coming to our aid thanks to the plume of smoke announcing war. Their good deed today would help a good deed for them tomorrow. None of us spoke, too disgusted and deadened by what we shoveled from the layers of toxic ash, recognizing severed tails, paws, and fire-ravaged carcasses. I'd thrown up when I'd come across a cow that had only arrived two days ago. A roof beam had snapped, thanks to the bomb's power, hurtling down to harpoon into the side of the animal. It had been trapped against the wall as fire chewed its way up its legs and along its flanks. Dead while standing, its eyes were still open, a snapshot of blistering agony as it had burned alive. I'd stumbled to the corner and expelled the dinner I'd shared with Eleanor. It had splashed on my boots, coating me in yet more filth, blending with guts and viscera. I hadn't eaten meat in fuck knew how long, and the stench of animal flesh made me violently nauseous. My mind and heart shut down, unable to associate the butchered remains with the creatures I'd tried to give a better life. It was my past all over again. The lab experiments. The domestic violence. The brother who tormented his own sibling. Fuck the guilt. It nibbled its way through my chest until it took a knife and fork to my heart and ate it piece by piece. I bled guilt. I sweated guilt. My head pounded with culpability and utmost shame. I couldn't look anyone in the eye, even as Cal patted me on the back and hissed in my ear that this wasn't my fault. That I couldn't have predicted that my brother would bypass my scouts on the sea and instead of coming after me, go after the most vulnerable. But I should have known. It was fucking obvious. It was his M.O. I'd been such a stupid bastard not to see this coming. And I blamed myself. Not just for this carnage, but for being too goddamn busy falling in love with Jinx to put parameters in place to prevent such a thing. I'd been selfish. I deserved this pain, but the rest of these poor victims did not. Their broken bodies and obliterated hearts were on my hands, no one else's. In this instance, Drake had been smarter than me. He'd never entered my waters. Instead, he'd flown over them in a chartered tomahawk and dropped two unrefined and highly temperamental bombs on Saragala. My pilots had already tracked the aircraft to a private airstrip in Java. I'd sent guards to interrogate, to find where Drake was. Had he flown to Indonesia to do this? 
Or had he sat in his goddamn lazy boy in one of our parents' mansions and pressed a button on a mass animal massacre? Fuck! My anger gave me strength to keep striding over bloody debris and horrendous homicide. My guilt wrapped me tight until any other thought or emotion was deleted. Eleanor was not allowed inside my head or my heart. Any remembrance of our afternoon yesterday just didn't fit with this reminder of how death always found me, how the Grim Reaper used me to find its next chosen, picking those I cared about to exterminate. She's not safe around me. Nothing is. High noon passed in a fugue of humidity and stench. The afternoon faded into twilight as more ships arrived, helping carry animal refuse out to sea to feed the carnivores of the ocean. Better their remains were used to sustain marine life, than bury it in fire-scorched dirt. The piles of mangled buildings were combed over by locals, earning my permission to take whatever they could scrounge. If a window hadn't blown into smithereens, best they could find a good purpose for it instead of me smashing it to pieces in my rage. So many years of my life, so much hope that I was doing a good thing, saving those who'd been brutally treated at the hands of humans. And look at what I'd done. I'd killed them, all over again. As night fell, our group of blood-splattered and dirt-smeared workers managed to set up holding pens for those creatures now homeless. I flew in extra drugs and supplies, acting as an unqualified nurse to provide emergency veterinary care for those beyond a simple salve and bandage. Two out of my four vets had survived. Two lay under a shroud in the rubble. Their families would be notified. Their widows and bereaved offered substantial compensation. Three locals who were in charge of cuddles and feeding had also been killed. The initial blast had torn them apart. I was responsible for this. I would pay every debt required. I would never, ever fucking forget this. Drake is a dead man walking. Burying my hands in another pile of gore, I grabbed the slippery remains and tossed it into the bag that would be carted out to sea. As far as cleanup went, Saragala had been swarmed by helpful people, all carrying out some versions of disinfection and rebuild. This pile was the last of the mess. My body was fucking exhausted. My eyes wept from ash and air particles. My throat scratched from the stubborn fire still smoldering in places. My lungs and belly cramped from pollution, and my heart throbbed with agony for what had happened. But I couldn't go home. Not yet. I didn't deserve to wash away this putridity. The biohazard I worked in made my entire body a contamination warning, just like my soul should be. I should be kept far, far away from everyone and everything. I bent to grab more handfuls of slaughter. A local passed me a spade with a grim half-smile. I took it, digging the rusty blade into the oozing remains and tossing them into the bag. The tool made my work faster, and I threw myself into the task. Cal arrived at some point, his hand landing on my shoulder. I jolted in panic. Pika? For a god-awful second, I thought Pika had flown here and witnessed what I'd caused. I didn't know why, but that almost broke me. The thought of Pika my confidant and friend for fourteen years, seeing just what I was, was the final straw. Don't touch me. I shrugged Cal's touch away, returning to my awful digging. Your phone's been ringing. I gritted my teeth. Who cares? You might. It seems important. Whoever it is hasn't stopped. It ends, waits a few minutes, and starts again. He eyed my grotesque, streaked slacks where the bulge of my phone rested. Surprised you haven't heard it? Eleanor? Fuck, here I was doing cleanup while leaving Eleanor exposed to the same attack. Dropping the spade, I slipped my hand into my pocket and pulled out my phone. Cal wasn't lying. Seven missed calls. All from a blocked number. I knew who it was before it rang again, buzzing in my palm, 
the screen getting covered in ash-blended blood as I swiped except. Drake. I moved away from Cal, climbing the small pile of broken beams and smoking wood. From this vantage point, I witnessed the remains of Saragala. The heartbreak. The shocked animals. The colorful bandages soothing the pain of so many fire-touched sufferers. Ducks and sheep, hedgehogs and lizards, human and beast. They all made peace with one another, sharing their destroyed home, doing their best to heal. Baby bro, I'm assuming the reason why you're not picking up is your elbows deep in intestines, doing a cleanup? You were never one to shirk your responsibilities. He chuckled. Like the remodeling I did? My heart never rose above the numbed pound. I was no longer a man, just hunched up gristle and hate. This was the last time, Drake. I'm done. He sniffed. Where's the rage, Sullivan? Where are the ultimatums? I told you. I shrugged as the first twinkle of a star appeared above me. I'm done with you. Well, that's anticlimactic, I have to say. You always were an attention seeker. And you were the biggest little shit I'd ever laid eyes on. I sighed and pinched the bridge of my nose. My hands fucking stunk. My nails were black with death. I honestly had no energy to spar with him. He was already dead to me. He'd never been a brother, just a tormentor. A fucking psychopath who should never have been birthed. You want the truth, Drake? I looked up, dropping my hand. Fine. I'll give you the goddamn truth. I'm glad our parents are dead because they were worthless two-legged creatures who had the means and the money to do some good in this fucked up world. Instead, they only thought of themselves. They taught you the same righteous belief that you're owed something, that you're special. My voice lowered. No spike of hate or flare of rage, just loathe-filled ice. They're dead. And soon, you will be too. This is our last conversation, Drake. Next time we see each other, I'll be driving a blade through your motherfucking heart. A pause sounded between us. Heavy and potent, slipping into my bloodstream with sick foreboding. Finally he laughed, loud and cocky. Ah, there's the ultimatum. Not an ultimatum. A fact. Okay, then. A fact. A rustle sounded as if he brought the phone closer to his mouth. You've said your fact. Now allow me to do the same. My thumb hovered over the hang-up button. Maybe another time. I have much more important things. Listen to me, you little shithead. If you hang up, then I'm done tormenting you. I'll just go straight to killing you. You already tried that numerous times, I might add, and it didn't work. I'm like the cockroaches you tried to squash but never could. Yeah, but this time, I have a guaranteed way to exterminate you. I'm not even going to give you a choice. I won't ask for Sinclair and Sinclair Group. I won't demand your shares or your bank accounts. There's only one thing you can give me to stop me from doing this. One thing that's far more interesting than science. Give it to me, and I could be persuaded to play nice. My knees locked. The wooden pile I stood on shook with instability. I didn't bow to his taunt. I didn't ask what he knew because I would never show weakness where he was concerned. But I didn't need to ask as Drake had always loved to gloat. You've been a naughty boy, haven't you, Sullivan? Buying women and farming them out as whores? A little birdie told me that you've somehow concocted a drug that makes them beg for it. And they'll take it up the ass or down the throat as many times as a guy wants, and even more besides. He laughed coldly. Here you are spouting bullshit about doing something good in this world, and look at you. Sullivan Sinclair, the goddamn king of skin and sin. I pursed my lips. I would not respond. I would not give my reasoning. The thing is, little Sully... I rather like your new business, more so than I do 
at the thought of geeky scientists and boring lab work. Sure, drugs are lucrative, but if you've bottled lust, then that's fucking unstoppable. He cleared his throat. So, here's my ultimatum. You sitting down? Because you might want to. I rolled my eyes and stayed quiet. Let him think I'd abandoned the call and wasn't listening. It would piss him the fuck off. His temper darkened his tone as he snapped. I've taken away your animal sanctuary, just like I took away the strays you rescued in our past. But that wasn't my end goal. Call that a little warm-up. Because this birdie also told me you finally stopped being an animal lover and turned your eye to someone with two legs instead of four. He laughed. What's better, Sully? Fucking a girl or something with fur? Not waiting for me to reply, he continued. This girl of yours. It's taken you long enough to dabble in the commitment pool that I'm guessing she means quite a lot to you. I might even go as far to say you love her. And if you love her, fuck, I'm going to enjoy this all the more. I clamped my mouth together. He's fishing. He doesn't know. He can't know. If he did, that meant I had a traitor in my midst. Just like always. Just like forever. God damn it, could I trust no one? Not even the people I paid such substantial funds to? Was loyalty so fucking destitute these days? You have four hours, little brother. Four hours to send through the recipe of your elixir, the deed to your islands, and that fucking whore who's keeping your bed warm at night. I will spare your life if you do that, but I won't spare hers. I'm going to kill her. Not right away, of course. I want to taste what you've tasted. I want to see what makes her pussy so much better than all the rest you ignored. I will make you watch. I will set you free from your ideologies that you are better than me. If you show some groveling on your part, we could even run your side enterprise together. Brothers in blood and business. But if you lift one finger against me, if you try to save her from fate, then I will fucking hurt you. I will hurt you until you beg for death, but I will never grant it. I will happily watch you break apart for the rest of your tortured days. Silence fell between us. My heart stopped. My body swayed. I didn't believe he could touch me, but there was a spy in my midst. A spy who'd gone behind my back and ensured the deaths of so many animals I'd tried to save. And Eleanor was currently on my island with that spy. She was at risk. Worse than with traffickers or guests or me. She was the leash around my throat that could ensure I bowed to my heinous brother. A leash that would choke me if I ever had to watch her suffer. Before I hadn't responded to him out of power. Now I stayed silent because I couldn't speak. My mind raced. My heart hammered. What the fuck do I do? It came down to trust again. Did I trust what he said? Did I trust he was lying? Shit. Drake chuckled. I'm taking by your quietness that I finally struck a nerve. I almost feel sorry for you. You finally know what it feels like to love, and now you have to watch me kill her. That's the price you pay for picking a war with me, baby bro. My hand curled around my phone as I leaped from the wooden pile, tripping over destruction to the helicopter in the distance. I'm calling your bluff, Drake. You can just fuck right off. I'm going home to have a shower. You probably have an hour at the most before I fly my ass to wherever you are to shove a bomb down your throat. Oh yeah? Calling my bluff, huh? I wouldn't do that if I were you. Fuck, I hated this cunt. Oh no? Why not? I wouldn't test me, because I'm currently sitting in your sea with a fucking army ready to blow your goddess isles apart. I have my finger on the trigger, Sully. I have the name of your girl. Four hours just became three. Tick-tock. I broke into a run, waving at the pilots to drop their sack of animal parts and climb into the chopper. They leapt into the fuselage, running a pre-flight check as I bolted up the steps. One question, and then I'll believe you. Sure. One question seems fair. I did my best to keep fear from my tone, masking it with hissing rage. Her name. The girl you think I'm... Eleanor Grace! 
of course. The goddess you're in love with? Now, run along, little bro. Three hours, and then it's party time. He hung up. I threw my phone at the expense of upholstery opposite me. Fuck! Cal shot inside the helicopter, just as the pilots added speed to the rotor blades, warping the laws of gravity. I didn't look at him, sinking deep into my thoughts, planning warfare, plotting strategy, mulling over every option from all angles. Only problem was, if what Drake said was true, I had no options, no angles, no strategy. I was in love with Eleanor, and she was my greatest treasure and my biggest weakness. And I just handed over my empire to Drake because I would do fucking anything to keep her safe. I would fight any battle. I would bow to any threat. Promise pain to her, and I was a useless son of a bitch. All I wanted to do was go rogue, to attack and shred, to use everything at my disposal to rip out his entrails. But she could get hurt in the crossfires. She could be raped, mutilated, murdered, because of me. And I would be too fucking weak to stop him. Drake had once again won. He'd used my shortcomings. He'd sniffed out my fragility. He'd trapped me with the very same person I'd found such freedom with. I was fucked. My future was once again unknown. The one girl I would have given everything to now had to get as far away from me as possible. I would not watch her be hurt. I would not be the reason she ended up a charred carcass because of my screw-ups. She was everything to me. Therefore, she had to become nothing. I would happily die if it meant I could protect her. But I'd be damned if I'd let Eleanor die with me. This has been Third A Kiss, Goddess Isles, Book Three, written by Pepper Winners, narrated by Sarah Puckett and Scott Ryder. Copyright 2020 by Pepper Winners. Production copyright by Pepper Winners. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.